Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I have on my clock 834. I, I'm, I'm looking at that clock behind me. Um, so I'm going to remember that that's about seven minutes, seven minutes behind or so. So um, I'd like to call this, excuse me, I'd like to call this meeting to order this morning. Before we begin, Jasmine, can you please take roll? Chair Dombrowski. Here. Regent Buchanan. I'm here, thank you. Regent Lozar. Here. Regent Bow. Here. Regent Southworth. Here. Regent Folkford. Here. Regent Yeager. Here. Commissioner Christian. I'm here. Governor Jean Forte. We usually have uh, Dylan Klapmeyer joining us and he is excused today. And Superintendent Ernstson. I believe uh, she is joining us later this morning. Thank you. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jasmine. I should have said Super Arnson is, uh, will be represented by Christy Mock Stultz and, and she will be joining us later. Thank you. So welcome to the Mo March Board of Regents meeting. It's wonderful to be back on the UM Western campus. When we last met here, the campus was quiet. The students were out on spring break. I know it might have made the logistics more challenging this, this time around, but we certainly appreciate seeing all the student activity. Chancellor Reed, thanks to you and your staff for their already your gracious hospitality that we had this morning, and, and we know it takes a lot of time and effort, and we greatly appreciate it. To all in attendance, welcome to Dillon. I, I just love Dillon. I don't get down here except for the Board of Regents meeting. I hope you all have a chance to explore the campus and this wonderful community uh, that exists here in southwestern Montana. I always watch the weather. Uh, as I drive down here, making sure that, uh, and this morning I scraped my car for one of the very, maybe first or last times. <laughs> it feels like an immersion into Montana history with Montana's first territorial capital just down the road in Bannock and UM Western's own iconic main hall constructed in 1897. Yes, that's 1897. Both the town and the campus are a fascinating blend of old and new, uh, of legacy and innovation. As always, I appreciate our chance to meet with faculty representatives over breakfast this morning. We had an outstanding conversation about well-being. And I'm just going to go off script for a minute and say we, we owe it to ourselves to think about our own well-being as, as we navigate this world for ourselves, certainly for our students in the MUS. Um, and, and I'm really proud of the efforts that are happening within OCHI to really expand the opportunity across the system to talk about not just mental health anymore, but really our own well-being. That in-person open communication is vital. Uh, I can't stress that enough, and I just really appreciate the faculty who attended this morning and their preparation. Representing the faculty at our table this morning is mathematics press professor, Dr. Tyler Sechrist. Welcome. And, and this afternoon, we'll have business professor, Dr. Brian England, joining us. As everyone can see, uh, we have a new face at our table this morning. I want to extend a warm welcome to Regent Dean Folkford. Governor Gianforte recently appointed Regent Folkford this past February. He and his family founded Wheat Montana Farms and Bakery near Three Forks in 1990. The company became a thriving operation, selling high quality grains, flour, and bread nationwide. Regent Folkford and his family now serve several, excuse me, now own several hotel and motel properties in Montana. We are thrilled to have you join the board, and I just give you the mic uh, for some comments. Welcome. Well, thank you for uh, an opportunity to introduce myself and say hello to everyone here. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I spent my entire life in Montana and received all of my formal education in Montana, so I consider it an honor and a privilege to be a part of this organization and look forward to working aside all the other regents and all of you to fulfill the mission of the Montana University system. So thank you. Outstanding, thank you again and welcome. I'd also like to acknowledge our tribal college presidents. Maintaining partnerships with the tribal community and tribal colleges is always top of mind for us. And we sincerely appreciate their consistent uh, attendance and participation at our meetings. And later today, we'll be joined by President Eva Flying of Chief Dull Knife College. Um, again, she's not here right now, but she will. Oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. I should have been looking up or I would have seen you. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome. Absolutely perfect timing. 
Before I preview our agenda for the next day and a half, I want to recognize the Student Wellness Center. It's a project I know that is near and dear to our colleague, Regent Yeager, who in his capacity as a student leader at UM Western was instrumental in getting it off the ground. I still remember you standing at that podium talking about it two years ago. And so, a dream come true, truly. The board has prioritized student wellness, and we are all aware that mental and physical wellness is key to student retention and achievement. Congratulations to all, Garrett and all, involved in continuing to see this project through to completion. Um, did I see? It's out there. It's being dug. What, what's the? Oh, this way. Sorry. I'm looking this way. What, what's the time frame? Hopefully mid-fall, terrific. That's not very far away. Again, thank you, what a, what a great testament to uh, focus and prioritization in our students. Turning to our agenda, after we hear from Chancellor Reed, Commissioner Christian and Ochi staff will provide the commissioners and system report. Then following the remarks, um, we'll get Dylan Klapmeyer's remarks uh, somehow along the way uh, into the meeting and then we'll um, hopefully be joined by Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent Christy Mock Stultz. And then the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee, which we call ARSA, will have the floor for the remainder of the morning and into the afternoon. ARSA's busy agenda includes honorary doctorate nominees for our consideration, new and revised academic program proposals for us to review, proposed amendments to board policy regarding distance education, and a slate of recommendations to the board from the MUS American Indian and Minority Achievement Council. As always, we look forward to lunch with the student representatives this afternoon, and I know Regent Yeager has uh, planned some uh, fine acknowledgments at lunch for us, so I appreciate that, Garrett. After lunch and the conclusion of ARSA's agenda, the Budget, Administration, and Audit Committee will finish out the remainder of the afternoon. We have many uh, facility items for consideration. They range from easements to repairs, planning and design activities, and construction projects. Information items include performance funding, development of the 2027 biennial budget, and discussion of the long-range building project for the 2027 biennium, including a preliminary list of projects. Tomorrow morning, we are fortunate to be meeting over breakfast with local community leaders. A vibrant and supportive community is essential to the success of the institution of higher ed, and I always look forward to discussing matters of mutual interest with the individuals who shape this community and make it thrive. And the uh, previous times we've been here, we've had a wonderful conversation, and Chancellor Reed, again, I would thank you and, and Regent Yeager for looking at that list and really encouraging the community to join us. It's really about the community that we want to hear from, and I, I anticipate it will go very well tomorrow. Uh, also then tomorrow we'll dive into our two-year and community college committee. An important action item that will be brought to us by this committee is the request for approval of the Perkins Five State Plan. Part of that item includes a report on the state plan, the timeline, and next steps. The two-year agenda also includes an update on the public charter schools authorized by the 2023 legislature and the MUS's engagement in that process, as well as a two-year leader panel discussion. And as always, we have time set aside today and tomorrow for a public comment. So with that, Chancellor Reed, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair Dombrowski, uh, members of the board, everybody here um, that's visiting uh, for this meeting, welcome to Montana Western. Uh, it is absolutely a delight to have you all here today. And we hope that you learn a little bit about Montana Western and the community that we serve and that you uh, enjoy it and um, find yourself uh, enjoying it as much as we do. Uh, I, I need to um, take just a minute and uh, give a special appreciation and thanks to everybody that's made this meeting possible. And, and first off, I just want to thank all the faculty, student, and staff, even those that didn't have direct impact with this. They've all been impacted. Uh, the students uh, gave up parking. Um, which is hard for them to do. Um, faculty had to move classes and give up spaces. But I'll tell you, I met with the Student Government Association on Monday, and I told them I appreciated them being so accommodating and helping us with the student parking. And the student body president said, Chancellor Reed, we're excited the Board of Regents meeting is here, and it's not during a block break. We want 
to be able to be able to show off our campus and be able to meet with this group too. So as you see the students, please say hello to them. Um, they're excited that you're here. Um, I do want to specially acknowledge and mention, however, appreciation to my administrative assistant, Hillary um, Lowell, Becky Stewart, and the entire conference and event services team, um, Dean S. D. Aiken, Matt Rafferty, and the entire communications team, as well as our facilities department and our information technologies team. They've done a tremendous amount of work. I felt a little sad because um, our grounds crew, they had just done a tremendous job. There wasn't a pine cone on this campus. They just cleaned it up so beautifully. And the next morning we had three inches of snow. So um, maybe they'll all melt off and you'll see what a beautiful campus. Um, it is beautiful even in the snow. Montana Western is a very unique university. We are the only public university in the United States that operates on a block schedule. We are a comprehensive regional university, and as such, we serve as an educational and cultural anchor. We strive to meet the specific needs of the state and the region we serve, and we do this primarily by providing a quality access to post-secondary education, workforce development, community engagement, cultural enrichment, and student-engaged research. Montana Western finds itself in Dillon, Montana, nestled in beautiful Beaverhead County the largest county by landmass in the state of Montana. Although Patagonia is a place everybody likes to visit, and I, I will say that they are having a 50% off sale on all outdoor <laughs> gear, all outdoor apparel, um, there are many other worthwhile and amazing businesses, um, stores, restaurants to visit, and we hope you have the opportunity to visit and meet with them all. We've picked just a few to stick up here, but there are over 2,000 businesses in Beaverhead County. Some of the companies you may have heard of include Barrett's Minerals, Duckworth, Great Harvest Bread Company, Harrington Pepsi, and Sporadian Technologies. Also, I would mention Beaverhead County is the largest cattle producing county in the state of Montana. The background photo you see, if you can see on that picture, that happens to be our farm and ranch students at the Matador Land and Cattle Selkirk Division Ranch. We partner with numerous ranches and local area businesses to provide students with real world opportunities and we provide business as a pipeline to experienced graduates. We've been very busy this summer and we'll be very busy over the next couple of years making some improvements to our campus. Right now, we're right in the middle of some, or preparing for some academic improvements to include total renovation of a block hall. I'd first like to thank this board, our governor, and the legislature for approving and funding that project. We received $15 million to complete the, to complete the total renovation of block hall. Black hall houses all of our science and math faculty, and it will be completely gutting the building and doing a complete interior. Every single student that attends Montana Western goes through the doors of Block Hall, and this will impact every single one of them. We also received one and a quarter million dollars to construct a storage facility. Why would I put a storage facility up here with Block Hall? This storage facility will allow us to clear out almost 3,500 square feet that have been used by our facilities department in the basement of Block Hall, repurpose that space for academic and research use. So we actually have um, kind of a partner project with that, and we're excited for both of those projects. That was also funded through the LRBP process. Before I move on, I do want to take just a second and recognize and thank the faculty that occupy Block Hall, one of which, Dr. Seacrest. If you think about it, we have approximately 20 faculty offices in that building. We have to move everybody out of that building in order to gut it and renovate it. Most of those faculty, 17 of them, are moving into the chancellor's residence across the street. You'll see this small home uh, as you walk around. All 17 faculty are finding a way to shoehorn themselves in there. That is not going to be a comfortable home for two years. But I so appreciate their patience and their cooperation. And in the end, I hope that they have a home in Block Hall that they can be proud of and it'll be make, it, make it worth the effort. So again, thank you so much to our faculty. We're also working on some renovations directly focused at student life. We have a $5 million new stadium that's currently under construction that will finally bring fall football events to our campus. We have been the only institution in the Frontier Conference that does not have a football stadium on our campus. We have a stadium over by the high school. Everybody thinks it's the high school stadium. 
It is the university stadium, but we'll finally have those events here on this campus, and we're excited for that. Hopefully, we'll be ready for kickoff this fall. Additionally, as Chair Dombrowski mentioned, we are currently under construction for a 5,500 square foot, nearly three and a half million dollar wellness center funded by the students with a self-imposed fee. Again, thank you to this board for approving that project. This will provide sorely needed fitness and wellness services to our students. And again, Regent Garrett truly was instrumental in getting this project advanced. <clears throat> In addition to those, we are also making other student life improvements. We recently started renovation of a new student lounge and rec center in the student union building, which I'll add is next to the cup, the university's coffee shop. For those of you who want a special cup of coffee, it's usually closed during the Board of Regents meeting. It is open this time because our students are here. Um, to accommodate this, we moved the Veterans um, VMX Center uh, the new location for that is actually on the main floor of this. You would have walked past it as you come in. It's a beautiful new center for them. We're also working on some renovations to the entrance of our uh, registrar and financial aid office. This is to make a more welcoming environment and more student-centric focus. And then also some in exciting improvements in our dining facility. I hope you get an opportunity to see those. There's a lot of construction going on. We've also been working on some campus safety improvements. This fall, we renovated our campus heating plant. And I know that you're probably saying, well, why are we learning about a heating plant? This is a big deal for us. Montana Western has historically, over the last decade or more, been heated by a biomass boiler. This biomass boiler required us to bring semi-truck loads of wood chips every single day, many of them coming from as far as Libby, Montana. And then we would gasify those wood chips and use those to provide our heat. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner of that picture, you see two big bay doors. That actually goes about 20 feet below ground, and that's where the wood chips would go every day. Semi-trucks coming right into the heart of campus, dumping those wood chips. With the renovation of this, we now have a natural gas boiler, and we were able to repurpose those bays to be able to be utilized space by our facilities department, making the building much more efficient. And the other benefit, and why I would put this with our safety, is when the biomass boiler went down, and it went down several times every year, it would take weeks to months to be able to get a part for it because they would have to be custom manufactured in order to be able to repairing. In addition to that, <clears throat> we are finalizing the work on our electronic card swipe system, uh, also working on installing um, security, cameras and security cameras and finalizing a policy of that for the safety of the campus and making complete um, exterior interior lighting improvements to be more cost effective and safe. And I would pause here just to give a special call out and appreciation to our facilities director, um, Mr. M.B. Brown, and his entire facilities team. They're managing most of these projects and just doing a tremendous amount uh, of work, and we so appreciate what they're doing. We've been busy in the fundraising category, and we have a uh, dynamic and fantastic development staff. Uh, recently, we launched ex the Experience One campaign the most uh, aggressive and ambitious fundraising campaign to date for the university. The goal was to raise $12 million and was focused completely on our student experience. The campaign was initially comprising of four initiatives, scholarships, the Fund for Experience One, Student Wellness Center, and Bulldog Sports and Activities Complex. To date, I'm happy to announce that we have exceeded our goal with a raising of $13.2 million. We're going to continue fundraising for other initiatives, including finalizing the sports and activities complex. I also want to brag a little bit about Montana Western, not just what we're doing, but also who we are. Recently, bestcolleges.com announced that the University of Montana Western has secured the top spot as number one best colleges in Montana for 2023. UM Western stands out in the state-based institutions on affordability, retention, and graduation rates. Some of the great things that are happening academically here, I want to go over some of those right here. Um, Dr. Spruce Schoenemann, uh, he, in partnership with Western Washington University, the NSIDC and Ceres at the University of Colorado Boulder, received an NSF grant to develop an innovative place-based curriculum focused on undergraduate students <clears throat> that provides a virtual field experience in Greenland, expanding learning opportunities in the polar sciences. Known as Polar Pass, or Polar Places and Spaces, this curriculum uses authentic GIS data and 360-degree interactive environments to allow students to conduct field research of green, on Greenland from anywhere in the world. 
when I, when I look at this, if, if you could imagine Google Earth, those of you who played on Google Earth, this is, this is Google Earth on steroids. You, you can walk um, along a glacier. Uh, you, can, you can stand and see a 3D video of the rivers flowing by and look at and get some spatial awareness of what this area looks like. Plus, you have years worth of GIS research data, so you can actually see the site where the data comes from. And their research has demonstrated that using this research, by using this curriculum that they've developed, students are able to perform almost as well as people that had been there actually in person, but they far outweigh and outperform students that are looking at and just dealing with the textbook. So it's a great resource. And what they've effectively created is two semesters, so two full semester courses um, for polar research that's open source and available for any institution, any university for a three or 400 level college course anywhere in the country. And so we're really proud of Dr. Shonam and his team for the work they're doing. I'd also like to recognize Montana Western's um, professor of business, Dr. Christian Gilkey and also, also um, Dr. Eric Gusick, the Assistant Professor of Management at the University of Montana, and Dr. Christian Berg, Professor of Business Creativity at Vilnius University. They completed a study on the creative capabilities of artificial intelligence. They shared their findings at the University of Southern Oregon's Conference on Creativity, and recently at UM's Artificial Intelligence Innovation Symposium. A special thank you to UM uh, and their IT team and those involved in putting on that uh, symposium they opened that up to everybody in the affiliation, perhaps others, and it was a great opportunity, great learning experience for us. So again, thank you, UM, for doing that. This group's research demonstrated that OpenAI's GPT-4 scored the top 1% on the Torrance test of creativity thinking, basically matching or outperforming humans in the creative abilities of fluency, flexibility, and originality. Their research was the first study to show that AI is capable of generating original responses that match or exceed current thresholds of human creative abilities. I didn't say I liked the research outcomes, but it was good research. It was fascinating. <laughs> it's kind of scary, really. Um, Montana Western, under the direction of Aaron Cashmore and in partnership with the Canvas Early Learning Center and Early Childhood Coalition of Beaverhead County, was awarded half a million dollars from the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. This was a grant to help expand child care availability in Montana families. The Canvas Early, Early Learning Center has now moved their services for children aged two to five to the UM Western campus starting this fall. This will provide exciting opportunities for our early childhood education program at Montana Western. It will provide students with real world, real world opportunities and basically a learning laboratory at the center. Also, Montana Western will be hosting and having its first ever TEDx events sponsored by the Fund for Experience One. The mission of TEDx University of Montana Western is to strengthen the academic culture of our campus, inspire our student body to think more critically about the world, and expand interdepartmental collaboration. Speakers include UM Western faculty members like Regents Professor of Geology, Dr. Rob, Rob Thomas, Professor of Environmental Sciences, Dr. Spruce Schoenemann, Assistant Professor of Health and Human Performances, Dr. Alicia Shirley, Associate Professor of Mathematics, Dr. Dev Seacrest, and Assistant Professor of Art, Nathaniel Freeman. Montana Western's been working closely with its partners to try to help reduce the indigenous teacher shortage at schools on the Blackfeet and Crow reservations. We have a two plus two partnership program that assists indigenous educators in completing their four year education degrees without leaving their communities and needing to leave their current positions of appointment at area schools. This started in 2016 with a partnership um, with Blackfeet Community College and the program expanded to Little Bighorn College in 2019. We also have an effective partnership with Stone Child College for early childhood degrees. We so appreciate the dynamic team that has been working and continuing to grow and strengthen this program. So I thought it would be interesting to talk a little about where do Montana Western students come from? I want to share a little bit about, you, know, you can't have a university without students, and the students certainly shape the university that we are. It's interesting, according to the 2022 census, of the 469 population centers in Montana, only eight of those have populations over 10,000. Nearly 70% of Montana Western students come from communities with populations of less than 10,000. 
to put that in perspective, I just recently had an opportunity. I was up at Elkhorn Hot Springs, and I was visiting with an individual that uh, I got just talking to him. He didn't know I was the chancellor here, and I said, well, what brings you to the area? And he said, well, I'm here dropping my son off at the Montana Western. He's going to be going to school here. I said, well, that's great. You've got to be excited about that. He goes, well, I am, but I'm really uneasy. It's kind of scary dropping your kid off in such a big college town. <laughs> so keep that in perspective. And I can't remember. I should have checked, but I, I believe Dylan is 12th or 13th in the largest communities in Montana. Okay, so we bring, we provide service to students that are from areas that make Dillon look like a large city. Not all, but 70% of our students. Students come to Montana Western because it provides the unique experiences they are seeking. If I can, I'll share another quick story. My wife and I were at a Jeep Jamboree in Idaho, and we had an opportunity to meet with a father who was looking for a school for his son. He was from Seattle, Washington, and we started talking. He says, wow, that sounds like a great school. I'm really interested in that block program. Tell me more. And he goes, well, do you have a rugby team? I said, well, no, we don't have a rugby team. Well, do you have a, rug a rugby club? I said, well, we don't have a rugby club. And he goes, well, my son's from Seattle. With COVID, he has just felt like he hasn't been able to connect, and he's really looking for an institution where he can find a club where he can really belong and, and build some relationships. And uh, I said, well, if you're in the area, by all means, give me a holler and, and check it out. A couple hours later, this son comes up to me and he says, excuse me, are you the, the chancellor from the University of Montana? And I says, well, yes, I am. He goes, I was talking to my dad, and it sounds like you're just a small institution. Weren't you about 1,500 students? I says, well, yeah. And he goes, well, I don't need a club if you're a small enough campus that I can feel like I can make a difference. And those were his words. I want to feel like I can make a difference at that campus. And so I told him, absolutely, come take a tour of this campus. I expect to see him here this fall. But the thing that is all of that is our students choose Montana Western because they're looking for the experience that they're going to get here. It's a different experience that you may get at a flagship, but they choose, our students choose regional universities because this is the experience they're seeking. Montana Western has a very active student life program. We have the Bulldog Ambassador Program, Student Leadership Academy, Performing Arts Series, sponsored by the Bank of Commerce. We have numerous clubs, although not a rugby club. Although I know that they're trying to get one started. We have a strong Polynesian population, and they would like to see a rugby club start. So we might have one. Um, students have the opportunity to be involved, feel needed, and make a difference. And we have a very competitive athletic program. I'd like to share some um, history about some of our students and pay attention when I say our students want to be involved and they want to be feeling like they're making a difference. You'll see a common theme in these students. I'd first like to introduce Bridget Reedy. Bridget is from Whitehall, Montana. She's a natural horsemanship and English major who's been performing since she was very young and is an exceptionally talented singer, fiddle player, and cowboy poet. Montana Western's block program and supportive faculty have allowed her to continue her performance career while working on her degree. Last year, she had the opportunity to perform at numerous venues across the country, including the Grand Old Opry stage. And I'm also excited to share with you that Bridget will, will be performing at Carnegie Hall this week. <clears throat> I have to have an opportunity to talk about Gary Yeager. I told him my goal was to make him turn red. Um, <laughs> Garrett is from Shoto, Montana, where he grew up on his family ranch, homesteaded in 1883, making Garrett an eighth generation Montanan. Garrett is one of four siblings that has attended a Montana University System institution and one of three to attend Montana Western. We're proud of Garrett. Garrett is an edu elementary education major. He was very active at UM Western, including serving as an ASUM Western senator. ASUM Western President, <clears throat> Montana Associated Students Vice President, and did all of this while being a steer wrestler for the Bulldog Rodeo Team. I got to watch Garrett steer wrestle many times, and he's good. He's really good. Currently, Garrett is serving as our student regent, and he was absolutely instrumental in championing the new wellness center and making it become a re reality. I'd like to introduce you to Ellie Fulbright. Ellie is a freshman from Lewistown, Montana. She's a mathematics and mathematics secondary education double major and a 4.0 valedictorian from Fergus High School. 
She's here as a Chancellor's Leader Scholar. <clears throat> Ellie wanted to be a teacher and is passionate about math and looks forward to teaching in her own classroom after graduating from Montana Western. She has especially enjoyed working with Assistant Professor of Developmental Mathematics, Liz Wright, who has been very supportive in helping guide Ellie towards her future goals. Ellie is very active on campus, <clears throat> excuse me, including serving as a student senator for ASUMW, president of the Student Catholic Campus Ministry. She tutors students in grades two through eight as part of the homework help program, is a member of the Student Leadership Academy, serves as a student representative on the Technology Steering Committee. In January, she and five other students from across the state toured the Kennedy Space Center as part of a Montana Space Grant Consortium, and she will be traveling to Iceland in Block 8 as part of this academic year study abroad program at UM Western. Did I mention she's a freshman? Okay. A little dry, excuse me. <clears throat> Quincy Taylor. Of all the students I'm highlighting, Quincy Taylor is the only one that did not come from a community smaller than Dillon, Montana. Quincy comes to us from Sacramento, California. He is majoring in interdisciplinary social sciences and minors in creative writing, professional, commu professional communications. With a passion for every day, with every aspect of life, Quincy Taylor demonstrates his fervor through his active involvement on campus, including being a member of the men's basketball team, hosts a regular online segment called Questions with Quincy for the Bulldog Athletics, and is a game announcer during the offseason. When I talked with Quincy and I asked him why did he pick Montana Western, he basically said, I just want to try something and experience something different than what I can find in California. Well, he found it in Dillon, Montana, and I'm pretty sure we're quite different. Quincy was encur has encouraged others to change the world around him in positive ways. When asked what advice he would give other students looking to fulfill their dreams and make a difference, Quincy responded, if you have a vision of something you'd like to change, then you should not be afraid to step up and be the one who makes a difference. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Kylie Pittman. Kylie Pittman from the nearby town of Glen, Montana, population 56. Kylie chose Montana Western because of its one course at a time approach and the immersive learning, immersive learning experience in the sciences. This year, she received news that her lifelong goal of becoming a, a dentist will become a reality. She is accepted into not only one, but six dental schools across the country. She has chosen to attend dental school at the University of Utah this fall with an eventual goal to specialize in maxillofacial surgery and reconstruction. She is the president of UM Western's Biology Club, head coordinator for the Dillon Youth Connections Program, a volunteer softball coach for the Beaverhead County High School JV softball team, and coaches Little League each summer. I hope you can see a common theme in these students. They want to be involved, they want to be engaged, they want to make a difference. And I'm so appreciative of the student body that I get to work with, and I feel it a pleasure to be able to, to interact and engage with them and help them accomplish their career goals. Um, so again, I so appreciate our students. So Montana Western is approaching the end of our current strategic plan, ending in 2026. This creates an ideal opportunity for us to initiate the groundwork for our next strategic plan. Dr. Esty Aiken, Dean of Strategic Initiatives, and Dr. Bradley Wood, Assistant Professor of Biology, will serve as co-chairs of the steering committee that will guide us through this work. Their charge is to create a comprehensive yet flexible strategic plan that will enable Montana Western to adapt and thrive amidst the changing demographics, evolving student needs, and emerging workforce demands that impact the landscape of higher education today. This effort will also involve a thorough review of the current mission and vision of Montana Western that reflects our aspiration to prepare UM Western graduates for their future by providing the best educational experience we can offer. And we look forward to sharing the results of this work the next time you're here at Montana Western. Again, Chair Dombrowski, members of the board, thank you for this opportunity to talk a little bit about Montana Western. Thank you, Chancellor Reed. I just have to say, because we speak so much about students, I really appreciated the opportunity you took to highlight some of the outstanding students. And I know there's many more, many more that you could have um, acknowledged. So th thank you for bringing that to our attention. We'll now turn to the approval of the January 11th, 2024 meeting minutes. The minutes have been distributed to the board. Are there any corrections? 
If there are no corrections, the minutes are approved as distributed. I will now turn it over to Commissioner Christian for his report. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Uh, <coughs> pleasure to be here. Thanks to all our board members for taking time out of your schedule to be here. Chancellor uh, Reed, thank you for uh, the, the warm welcome. We certainly know what it takes a campus to put all of this together and, and uh, it, it, appreciate you hosting this event. It, it is wonderful to be able to get to all of our campuses over the course of a cycle and, and see what's going on in your local communities. Um, like to echo uh, Chair Dombrowski's uh, welcome to uh, our, our newest regent, Regent Folkford. Um, the, the benefits that are, are awaiting us are, are many. We appreciate your business acumen and your uh, rich knowledge and history in agriculture in particular in Montana. And I, I think that's a new perspective for this board and one that will be uh, very welcomed and, and appreciate you uh, taking the time and your willingness to serve in this capacity. Welcome. Uh, also, uh, like to welcome the provost to the table this morning, Provost Makwa, Provost Lawrence. Um, many of you know, some don't. The, during the Big Sky Conference, the all of the Big Sky uh, Conference teams, presidents are there to talk about athletics and what's happening and uh, the future and, and where we're going as a, as a conference. And uh, so our presidents were there. They intended to be back. There was a little game last night, I'm told. Uh, Brawl of the Wild Part 3, I, I think, the, uh, I think a, a Go Cats Go is appropriate from what I understand. Uh, by the outcome, but they'll be joining us very soon. They they stayed behind to uh, participate in all that, but welcome and uh, look forward to, to hearing from you guys. Always uh, such a unique pleasure to visit communities like Dillon and uh, the Western Campus, and we're reminded of its compelling history, uh, beginning as a very humble, normal school uh, back in, what, 1889, 86? 1890, all right, we'll go with that. Uh, and its contributions to what it's become today, as, as the chancellor described, just a thriving institution with creative programs and innovative experiential learning opportunities for students. Uh, it's just such an inspiration to see what's happening across our system and, and to meet the students that you introduced us today. I don't often do this, but I would introduce you to one more student that attended uh, the University of Montana Western a uh, hundred years ago and that was my grandmother uh, oh. Bertha Ainley at the time then Bertha Christian uh, graduated with uh, a degree from the normal school uh, 1926 best we can tell went on to a long teaching career 30 plus years started on the High Line in Shelby and Chester and then ultimately Kalispell Big Fork area um, where she rounded out her teaching career. Now, in case you're wondering, we, we don't always just go around wearing crowns on our head in the, <laughs> in the Christian family. We don't have many photos. This is a photo of a photo that was, uh, uh, she was also 1927 Miss Montana. Uh, and it's a picture from her uh, coronation. If those of you that keep uh, track of, of historical events, the keynote speaker at that coronation was Charles Lindbergh, who was doing his every state tour following the Atlantic crossing. Um, she got to sit with him at dinner. Cool. So yeah, there's the history. But all began right here uh, at the normal school and honestly was the first of any of my grandparents to receive any college education and uh, sort of changed the, the path. Her uh, kids all went on to become educated and changed, changed lives for us. And I, I just think it's unique how one individual at one school can can change the course of families of, of the state of, of all kinds of things. So thank you for letting me share that. Um, with that, I think we'll just dive into some staff reports. We have quite a bit going on today. We, as, as promised, uh, want to continue to update you on the system-wide implementation of the central application. We've been having regular meetings, as we talked about, and uh, trying to get campuses and, and all stakeholders involved uh, as we look toward rolling this out at a statewide level. We have uh, Director Lemon here, and, and I think he has a few team members that he'll introduce, uh, but would get us up to speed on uh, what's happening around the central application. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Madam Chair, members of the board, um, two sort of categories today. One, I, I certainly want to spend the majority of our time talking about the central application updates and make sure that, as the commissioner said, we are reporting back to the board on this next phase for us, and particularly today for the timeline of how we plan to roll out the integration for the Montana University System utilizing a single application uh, in our state through Apply Montana. Uh, so we'll have some updates there. I'll introduce the folks at the table here in just one second. I, I did want to get to a couple updates on the resident student college and career readiness portal. And uh, I just wanted to provide a, a brief update there. If you have not been to applymontana.mus.edu, we have a new interactive map that has been launched uh, on the portal itself to do a few things. Better highlight uh, the breadth of campuses, provide more personalized information for the amount of options for students that are looking to stay in Montana uh, and engage in one of our wonderful campuses there overall. And that work will uh, continue to go as we are now on the portal 3.0. And so really as we continue to update the board and, and come back here with some great uh, new features for the portal, uh, overall wanted to make sure that we're making everyone aware of, you know, that same question we get and that's what's next. We've got a tremendous resource uh, here for the state of Montana in, in the resident student college and career readiness portal, but that work's not going to stop. Uh, the next phase for us, and I think the, the focus we're going to have is going to be on financial aid, uh, FAFSA completion, financial aid awareness, uh, making sure that we're providing as much information uh, as we can to Montanans for, uh, again, the access and affordability for keeping that front and center. So just wanted to notice the board that that work is uh, getting ready to begin here shortly. We'll have some updates and some new revisions for the portal to lead with that uh, from a financial aid perspective, uh, just like we did last year with uh, career outcomes, workforce development, uh, continue that work and, and moving that needle uh, overall. So we're very excited for that. Uh, we've got some great uh, uh, partners across the state that are going to be helping to provide that feedback and continue uh, to do that overall. So I wanted to mention that um, first and foremost. Uh, and the central application, as we talk about the portal itself, uh, this is what we want to be the primary front door uh, for Montanans to get their information, to explore the opportunities. Uh, love Chancellor Reed's uh, student bios that we got a chance to hear about there because for us to, to reconnect and to continue to hear that, uh, these great stories of our students in the MUS is, is, uh, is really a treat for us uh, at Ochi and, and across the system to be able to uh, hear these stories and really see this work uh, being amplified across students getting to campus and, and having these increased opportunities uh, through the MUS. I've got a couple colleagues up here um, that are going to share some updates primarily about the timeline, the process to date. If you recall, uh, back in November, we talked uh, about the next step for us to engage in this single application across the system. Uh, we wanted to continue to provide those updates. I've got Shannon Marr up here, who's the Director of Recruitment and Enrollment for Great Falls College, and Ed Brown, who is the Director of Admissions and Assistant for Strategic Initiatives. Ed, that's a really long title there. I'm just going <laughs> to point that out for Montana State University uh, in Billings. And two of my great colleagues, we work with uh, the enrollment leaders across the state, across the MUS, in, in, a, in a variety of forms uh, as far as the implementation group. Uh, we've got some, some really specific updates here for the board. Brief background, if you recall in November, uh, when we decided to engage and move forward in a single application uh, and utilizing Apply Montana across the MUS, uh, we had a lot of uh, really large questions to answer. Number one is timeline. How do we get to an opportunity where we're spending time to listen to campus feedback, listen to campus concerns. One of the first things that we had mentioned in that meeting was that we were going to launch an implementation group immediately. We were going to have a cross-functional team across campuses to have an opportunity to you know, highlight any concerns they may have, uh, long-term, short-term, um, to do this work and to make sure that we're doing it right uh, for the system, but also for the students and the families that we serve here in Montana. And so we want that uh, single application across the MUS to further highlight, again, the work on the portal and open that front door, as we like to say, a little bit wider for folks to walk through and get, uh, get more information. The number one um, concern that we had, honestly, uh, from the get-go has been timeline. Uh, I think we had a pretty aggressive initial timeline to uh, try to get everybody uh, on a single application system here uh, within one year. And we heard loud and clear from the campuses that there was um, you know, some challenges, some really big challenges with doing just that in, in the one year time frame. So we've been flexible and we are going to work on a three year adjusted, actually two and a half year uh, adjusted plan to fully implement um, uh, the timeline to get everyone on board in, in different stages overall. We gathered campus feedback. This work is ongoing uh, as well to outline concerns and, and work on these uh, solutions based approaches overall. 
So the brief, uh, you know, who and what on, on who's a part of this team and where is the work going in this implementation team? We've got Ochi staff represented there, myself, John Thunstrom, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, and we've got our partners from liaison to answer specific questions, provide customized solutions for campuses specifically. We know that the challenges, uh, some there's a common theme and some there's obviously some, some customization and uh, concerns based on what campus um, we're, we're speaking with. So we've got some liaison partners there to help. Uh, overall, within our campuses, we've got Mike Oward at Montana State University, Kelly Nolan at the University of Montana, Ed Brown right up here at the table from MSU Billings, Angela Hoffman Cooper from Montana Tech, and uh, Shannon right here from uh, Great Falls College. We've met every two weeks with the implementation group since just about after the November meeting. Uh, that work will continue. We've moved that back just a little bit as we've addressed, I think, uh, the majority of the larger concerns that campuses have had. And, we're able to work through some solutions there. Uh, we shared a spreadsheet with every uh, representative from the implementation team, but across campuses from uh, the IT teams, the larger admissions teams, everybody's had an opportunity uh, to submit that feedback on the spreadsheet on through our work or also with the representatives uh, on the implementation team that speak for, for their campuses um, overall. And then these uh, monthly meetings will continue as we uh, continue to hit our milestones and, and make sure that we're moving forward in this, in this great work to get uh, the entire Montana University system onto one application uh, platform overall. And with that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the timeline. I'm going to hand it over to Shannon Marr, uh, and she's going to take you through year one. Thank you, Director Lemon. Madam Chair, members of the board, Commissioner Christian, very pleased to be here on behalf of the implementation team and as a representative of two-year campuses across the state. Um, as you've heard, I'm Shannon Marr. I'm the Director of Recruitment and Enrollment at Great Falls College. And as Scott just reminded you, we began this team after the November meeting and have been diligent to meet to provide feedback. Um, as I tuned into the November meeting and listened, uh, I was very grateful for the line of questioning coming from all of you members here, especially appreciative of um, Regent Lozar's comment about the importance of campus voice. And I'm pretty sure that Scott would concur that uh, campus voice is not lacking in this group. We are, none of us, shy about offering feedback. Um, I think Ochi staff might wish sometimes there might be a little less campus voice as a part of this cycle. Um, but honestly, in all seriousness, we are taking very seriously the charge to complete this initiative and we wanna get it right. And so we're trying to be very mindful about providing feedback that is important uh, to examine and all of the possible problems and then solutions that will come down the line. And so um, Ed Brown is joining me today. I'm sure he'll say a little bit more um, on his introduction, but we are tasked today to just kind of walk you through the plan and the timeline. And that will begin, um, as we've talked about, July 1 of this year. This uh, cycle for each year of the three-year plan coincides with the cycle that's already been present with the Apply Montana solution. So three years ago when we started this, uh, we always work on a July 1 to June 30th cycle. So this is not you, not different for us. And the goal in the first year is that we will be requiring um, all campuses to at least feature the Apply Montana as an application option on their website. Preferably also in printed publications, social media, really anywhere that an application link might live, there would be an option for Apply Montana. And so the outcome, the expected outcome for that would be that we'll have some statewide consistency in Apply Montana as an option, right? Everyone will be um, represented as Apply Montana for a choice for applying to their campus. And additionally, it will provide time for campuses in this first year to do the internal work for that transition while we are advertising Apply Montana. Uh, of particular importance is this year will provide an opportunity for campuses to adjust those contracts that many of them have for other applications, internal applications and software that they're already working with, they'll have time to phase out of that. Um, at this point, it's probably important to mention that you might recall the slide from November that Director Lemon showed where all of the campuses were shown and all of the applications that 
existed for campuses. And you might not have noticed that there's just a handful of us that have been using Apply Montana exclusively since it, the beginning of this product three years ago. Great Falls College is one of those campuses, as well as two of the other MSU family campuses, so MSU Billings with City College and MSU Northern uh, for the MSU side of the house, and then Helena College for the UM side of the house were the handful of campuses that decided at that time to transition exclusively to Apply Montana. We did that for a variety of reasons. Um, many for us was a capacity issue, right? We couldn't maintain additional applications. And so we just decided to kind of rip the Band-Aid off at once and, and move to Apply Montana. And that's been important for Ed and I to provide that voice on this group because we can assure other campuses that it can be done and that it will be okay, right? And so um, we do still have a couple of internal applications for example, on my campus, uh, abbreviated DocuSign forms for, say, a readmit student, somebody returning to Great Falls College. But by and large, the undergraduates are using uh, Apply Montana. And so that speaks to the final outcome, which is campus input, because as more campuses are going to be required to use the application, they're gonna have skin in the game like they haven't had before and probably will be paying more attention to how that application is working. Um, and so we really wanna to get to a place where we're getting the best product that we can put forward. So paying attention to all of the questions and how streamlined that application is working. So um, we then move on to year two, which begins obviously the following July of 2025, and we'll go through the, the next June. And the goal at that point for year two is that all campuses at this point will only be utilizing Apply Montana for all resident undergraduate applications. So that means at this point, the outcome would be that there is a single entry point for all resident applicants. It will be a streamlined process. Everyone will be using that exclusively. And the outcome is that we would have unified messaging and marketing about that application access. As you can imagine, this is where campuses begin to have more concerns, right? And that's what we've really been focusing on in terms of concerns and solutions to those concerns. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Ed, who will come up to talk about that for year two and then the plan for the final year of three. Thanks, Shannon. She left me the hard part here. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, Commissioner Christensen, I'm Ed Brown, the Director of Admissions for MSUB. And Shannon highlighted one thing that's key for us is that we've been utilizing this as our only application for admission for three years. MSUB being the third largest university in the state has utilized this application. What that means is we purchase names as all the other schools do. Those purchase names go to this Apply Montana. And I'm highlighting that because you'll see in just a minute that there are some points of contention on the utilization of the Apply Montana. So a couple concerns. Let's talk about the application software. So campuses currently use, as I mentioned, purchase names as well as other application software they might have contracts in. So we're giving a year grace period or a year time to really look at those contracts, see if there's an out, and put those resources to Apply Montana. Uh, one concern that came up also is decreased different, differentiation. So customized application solutions provided by Liaison. Liaison's been a great partner, and pretty much everything we've asked of them, they've been able to come back with an answer. And we're asking some pretty interesting and crazy things. They haven't given us an answer yet, but they haven't told us no, so I guess that's, I don't know, right? So we're good there. But some things that we're talking about here is uh, something called the deep link. And this is important, especially for MSU Billings and the larger schools, is when a student applies to MSU Billings currently, they have to go and select what school they want, even though they're on the MSU Billings website and they're hitting apply. They're hitting apply now, then they still have to go back and select a school. Well, Liaison has instructed us they have a way that we can share a different link where they hit apply now and the MSU Billings is automatically selected they can still select other institutions. So if that student is interested in U of M, MSU, coming to Dillon, wherever they wanna go, they can still select those institutions, 
but they don't have to do that extra step. And for right now, as we know, with our FAFSA completion, any extra steps, right, it's, it's difficult for our students, especially when you're on that website clicking apply now. So procedural changes. This is another reason we expanded that timeline. Shifting all your resources, if you think you think uh, all the marketing that we put out, all of the documentation, text messaging through various departments and CRMs, we have to change all those things and that's gonna take time to direct students on where to go for, to apply for school. There's, an in, there's a concern about increased soft applications and we have experienced the increased soft applications at MSUB in Great Falls College. We get a lot of these applications that I'm going to be honest, I think the counselors tell them, just apply to three schools. So we get it. And when we're out recruiting, we hear, oh, I just clicked you guys. I got accepted. But there's no interest there. Well, we spend money, time, travel, marketing to try to gather those students. So liaison, liaison can help us a little bit with those, like I said, the deep links is one. Some other data solutions, such as maybe the student ranking their top colleges as they're applying to many of them. Or is the more applications better for us anyways? And that's where I'll take it. I, uh, I, I can't quantify it and share with you at MSUB, but our enrollment has gone up a little bit, and I can't say Apply Montana has helped or hurt. Okay, Scott says I have to say it's helped us. It's all because of Apply Montana. But more applications is not a bad thing. It's our job to get those students to come to MSUB. It's Shannon's job to get those students to come, just Shannon alone, Great Falls College. Limited capabilities for campus to troubleshoot application problems. So this one's a little bit more difficult. So liaison, when a student fills out the application, they're gonna go to liaison if they have issues. They do call our campuses currently, and we do guide them and direct them, but we have less opportunity if we had our own application, we'd be able to you know, dive into the application. But liaison has been very supportive, and their, their support has uh, been about what you'd expect from what we would give on campus. So we really haven't had any issues there. It's just gonna be a change. So then we go to, goal, to year three, and what's our goal for year three? So year three would be all undergrad, including non-resident and international. I will state that schools are gonna have their own timeline for this. As you know, the three schools, four schools with Helena College, right, that are currently using Apply Montana only are on an accelerated timeline because we're already there. We plan to bring international applicants for MSUB in this current cycle that's coming up in July. But for year three, that's when we'd want all non-resident, domestic, and international to apply through Montana, apply Montana. The, the outcome is there's no other application for undergraduate students for MSU institutions, MUS institutions, excuse me. Okay, so big, big concern here is the loss of competitive positioning. And this really goes into those name buys, and this goes into uh, other applicant applications that are pushing students that we might not get because we don't have the dollars in certain in certain institutions to purchase those names, or we don't have the capabilities, hence why we went to Apply Montana so soon. So Liaison has promised to work with us on some customized solutions to really overcome that. Once again, I'll mention that deep link. Volume for other applicants, i.e. Common App. So this will give us greater access to our students and to our out-of-state students, so one application for students to come to Montana. And then ease of uniform, uniformity in the system. The application fees, this, was an, this is an ongoing discussion. There's certain institutions that want application fees for certain groups of populations versus non. I do want to remind everyone that non-resident, or sorry, excuse me, resident students do not have an application fee but our international students typically do and our non-resident students typically do. And so there is some opportunities to restructure this, especially with liaison helping us on how to identify which application fee to apply to which student via what, what school they apply to. And then, like I talked about a little bit earlier, proprietary data from name purchases. So once again, working with liaison to help us with that. And then there's no real system level sharing of non-resident strategy or data amongst campuses. So that's a common misconception. As much as I'd like Scott to t let me look at a student and see who else they apply to, he won't let me. So I can't really try to convince that student to come to us. But um, that's good in this instance because if you are guiding students via name purchase to a school via that deep link, such as MSU Billings, 
then we know that student, that name purchase is resulting in the student applying to us. They can go find another school, but we want to come to MSU Billings in this situation. So, discussion, questions? Mr. Commissioner, if I may too, I just want to take a brief moment um, to recognize not just Shannon and Ed, but the entire, I think, enrollment teams across the MUS. It's often an overlooked uh, or underlooked group, if, if depending on how you look at it. The work that goes into, I think, providing, uh, as Chancellor Rita pointed out, highlighting a lot of these unique opportunities across the system, uh, but it, it, it oftentimes is a, is a thankless job, uh, and the work that goes into a lot of the departments in, in, in across the MUS, particularly with enrollment folks and having to do more with less uh, over the years, I think, uh, for Shannon and Ed, but also the colleagues that we work with on our on enrollment leadership teams uh, across the system, and they're just putting in a ton of work to not only move this forward uh, overall, this initiative, but I think just the day, the day in and day out um, you know, work that's going into trying to get more students uh, to engage in post-secondary education. It starts with our campuses, and we've got some large initiatives, but uh, you know, I've got two of the, the best ones up here across the system and helping with that. Uh, I just want to highlight the work that's going on with, with all the crews that we get to work with across the MUS on the enrollment side. Happy to stand for questions, Madam Chair. Questions? Regent Bell. Uh, yeah, Commissioners, thank you. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, what I've learned so far in our region is that the, the, the acquiring students is a very complicated process, right? And that every school feels they have their own special sauce. But I think what, what, what the system cares about, what we care about, is making sure that it, it's as, it, you know, for what we're trying to do is broaden the pool of applicants. We're trying to make it easy for the kids who aren't currently applying. And so all these, you know, delays and changes are interesting, but I think the big picture here is to get more students applying you know, the same way they use an app. And so uh, I'm going to trust that the process is working, you know, to protect everyone's interests on the different college levels. But the big picture for OG, I mean, I think for the regions, is that <clears throat> we have, we, we increase the number of applicants by making it really easy for the kids who are not currently applying. And so my point would be let's not lose sight of that as we address all the campus concerns. The campus benefits are more students applying. Right, and th and that's the primary objective, um, and I just get concerned that with the uh, with too many uh, unnecessary obstacles being put in that in that process. I can touch on that too. So we one of the goals of that one year break for the requirement is really to look at to take a hard look at that application and say, are we asking questions that are unnecessary that no campuses use, and that really stop a student from applying. And so there's a lot of questions on the application that, I'll just be frank, MSU Billings doesn't care what their answer is. We don't bring that into our student information system. It doesn't affect their, their decision, either in residency, either in status. We, we don't need that question. So this next year, we're gonna take a hard look at that application and every single question and say, is this something that we have to ask the student? How can we make this easier for the student to complete the application? Because to your point, we wanna make it easier for them we, we look at it at all our forms. We want to make it as easy as possible. And so we really have to take a hard look at that. And certain schools might need some of that data. And if they need that data, maybe that's, they put that in their section. There's four quadrants. We put that in their four, fourth quadrant. Thank you. Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate uh, Regent Bow's sort of high level. So these are the goals. This is what we're striving for, striving to um, as a body. Um, and I certainly appreciate jumping in so quickly on the, this implementation team and g getting, you know, really tackling some of these big concerns that we sort of heard over the past couple of years. So uh, really appreciate that. I, I think that maybe on the marketing of this, the promotion of this, I think there's a lot of lessons learned. Um, I think there's ways we should be tracking sort of how, how each of the campuses are promoting this and what their outcomes are. Um, thinking about the purchasing of names in particular, um, I just, I just want to make sure that we've got the systems in place at the system level to be able to market to our, our adult learners, uh, those over 25 or those that have some credit but no degree, which is a huge chunk. I, years ago, it was 150,000 uh, Montanans that were in that category, that this doesn't you know, continue to be looking at just at the high school students or just at the students in our sort of geographic areas outside of the state that we're focused on, to really use this as the opportunity to fine tune how we meet those 
adult learners and those that have tried the system but but did not get a degree. So I think we need to like figure out a way that we do that very, very thoughtfully, um, knowing this is look, you know, becoming more of a system level effort. Excellent feedback from you both. I, I really appreciate that. Any comment to either of those other? I appreciate also that the Apply Montana application wasn't perfect, and so this year is gonna allow us to make it maybe perhaps better or more perfect or more streamlined as part of this. I mean, I, I think that's an important point. I just recall, though, our really our, our request to, to make this happen for the really the two comments that my fellow regents have already indicated. Yes, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for Region Bow and, and Region Lozar. Those comments are, are, are well taken, and I think that's the, the work that we'll uh, follow here. And uh, Region Bow, to your point, with, with the increase in application and making it as easy as possible, it's, it's uh, sort of a double-edged sword because without the, the proper processes in place for the campuses to receive and be able to utilize these applications, we continue to make it easier. We're seeing the application growth. We'll have more information on that uh, in upcoming meetings as well. And that's what's really exciting is are more folks uh, walking through that door you know, starting and submitting an application. And I think for us at the, the system office and, and, and working with our campuses much more closely, this has never been done. You know, we've never had the enrollment uh, coupling that is occurring now, I think, from the system office to the campuses. And I, you know, I got to say that we're, we're certainly proud of this work, but that's, that's where we're making, I think, the most progress is continuing to knock down some of these barriers from a campus level to the system office. And, and, and Regent Lowe's are to your point, that just continues to provide more opportunities for us to measure it um, and make sure we're making best use of state resources to do this, but also that our students and families are benefiting uh, in the long run. And we are you know, issuing and awarding more degrees. We are sharing more of these stories uh, across the, the MUS uh, overall. And so that work is ongoing and, and certainly we look forward to it. Thank you, guys. I, I, I think, um, you know, you heard loud and clear in November from campuses that they want to be part of this process. They're also willing to participate, and I think that's where we're at. And we, we won't lose sight of the big picture, that easier to apply, easier to advise for school districts, the data that comes out of it, uh, central ID, unique number. Those are, those are the goals, and, and we're going to get there. Um, I, I think maybe more detail than we sometimes would share, but I think we want this board to know that we're certainly listening to the campuses. They do have a strong voice in this, and in the end, we're gonna come out with a product that I think is gonna serve students across Montana. Um, it's also interesting that it, it's, it's being watched. It's getting a fair amount of attention. Um, National Association of System Heads it will feature some of what we're doing at the super convening in April in DC. Um, on a panel there, and uh, I, I think it is what's best for students, and I, I think uh, this will highlight that, and, and certainly systems across the country have felt the same. It's just there's a lot of steps to getting it done, and I appreciate the day-to-day -day grind that it is for you, uh, Scott, your team, and, and all those that are participating to make this a product in the end that works the way we, we envision it to work, and, and, it, and we'll get it done. Thank you. Back to you. Yeah, Madam Chair, I think uh, next stop on our, our update tour here. Um, the uh, federal government has taken on the task of simplifying the free application for federal student aid program, FAFSA. And uh, there's no cynicism there. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone's, yeah. Uh, I, I, it, it's going to work. And, and they're making progress, but if you've read the papers lately, uh, there's certainly some consternation welling up around delays and challenges that they've faced. And in the end, it is the key to unlocking federal funds for more than six, 17 million students nationwide. So it's an important lift. I think in the end, uh, it will be more simple. Um, and I think ultimately it'll award more dollars to more students. But I've asked uh, Deputy Commissioner Hollenbaugh to give us kind of an update as to what's going on in this space. It's certainly making the news and uh, want to, to reassure everyone where we're at on it. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Board of Regents, uh, as the Commissioner uh, briefly indicated, we do have some uh, uh, updates with what has been going on with the FAFSA simplification process. The fact sheet in your packet is designed to give you that historical background to sort of run you through over the last four years in terms of what Congress and the administration 
have been doing to bring us to this point. And it's not my intention to actually go through this fact sheet, but more to give it to you as background uh, for your review later on, sort of keep track of what's been going on. But instead, what I wanted to focus on today is actually what the FAFSA simplification goals really are and what they're trying to achieve. And well, the, the goals are pretty simple. If you look at it, it's to design a simpler and shorter application form to increase aid amounts and in eligibility. So looking at how the administration has come to this, Department of Education has addressed these goals. Looking at the simpler and shorter application form, what they have done with this process is to link your current form to your, to your federal tax application. What this has done, in essence, is to remove a whole bunch of questions and a whole bunch of data that is required from both students and parents. It has taken the number of questions and, and fiscal data from about 100 down to about 40, which is, pr is pretty simple. Anecdotally, I can tell you of the parents that I've talked to uh, in and around Helena, they have seen this form be very, very effective in that and allowed them to complete the form in about five to 10 minutes. So that is indeed uh, showing some, some of the folks are enjoying a much simpler and shorter application form. But the biggest rub in terms of what we're coming to in terms of increased aid award amounts and eligibility comes with the new formula that uh, the department has come up with. It's a slightly more generous formula and rather than try and walk you through what the formula means, our partners at SHIO uh, have, are pretty good at crunching the numbers. And what they've done is put together, they have about a 20-page uh, booklet that walks you through the entire simplification process. But I found this table to be particularly instructive when you look at what the formula will do, in particular to Pell eligibility. Now, Pell grants are the bulk of the need-based aid in Montana. And if you, now, uh, some, some warning here on this data. This is a sampling of about 100,000 students that are both full-time, part-time, and half-time, and, and, sort of, and it's just from the 21-22 academic year. It's designed to be pretty instructive, so please don't do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison from this national sort of mush together of, of some data to what might be uh, impacts in Montana, but it is instructive to show you what happened from the old EFC formula, that's your expected family contribution formula, that's the old formula, to the new SAI formula, the student, uh, acad uh, student aid index formula. Pretty clearly through this, you look at it, uh, there will be an increase. There's about a 6% increase in eligibility, or an 8%, excuse me, on, on the new, they, they've been updating this goal, about an 8% increase in eligibility, and you can see, as you can see, the average award amounts are clearly going up uh, with, with this sample. So with that, that I mean, there you see as we look at the three goals in terms of how they got there. In a nutshell, they've shortened the form by linking to federal tax data. You don't have to answer as many questions. In fact, uh, if your adjusted gross income on a federal tax form is $60,000 or less, that effectively will reduce the number of questions and financial data that a family has to answer after that. So that 40 question form uh, gets even shorter after that. So if you consider that uh, the, the median family income in Montana is, is somewhere in that 65 to $70,000 range, we're gonna have a pretty, pretty easy form and pretty easy access for, for Montana residents, for Montana students. But why is, it, why is this so important in Montana? Well, as I mentioned, Pell Grants are by far and away, the single biggest need-based aid for our students. Last year, it represented $40 million uh, for students enrolled and an average award amount of about 5,200 bucks. So it means a lot. So any form of increase uh, in that aid is going to be helpful and supportive of our students as we talk about access and affordability. That's something that we should be very, very supportive of and are happy to see, see this, this simplification uh, proceed. So, so what's the rub with our institutions? This process takes time. The rollout has been delayed for a lot of the reasons you'll see in that fact sheet. In fact, I'm willing to address some of those questions, if, questions you might have on that fact sheet. But the whole process this year is delayed. So the FAFSA form was not available uh, until December 30th of this year. Typically, it comes out on October 1st, about a three-month delay. 
Uh, the, when it went live, it was less than stable. Um, some folks had difficulty logging in, but I can t tell you now, uh, updates from SHEO, that form is active now. And we would continue to encourage everybody, fill out the FAFSA form. The, the process is easy, get it in, find out what you're eligible for. Uh, along with that delay, though, comes the, the department has also withheld this, 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 the application data. They're not releasing that data back to our campuses, which is going to provide a tremendous amount of stress for our financial aid offices. Uh, the department has just this week, we heard yesterday in a SHIO call, that they are just this week starting to release that data. Uh, it, they are, the campuses in that first test batch are reporting no problems with, with the data that's coming in, so they're able to process that data. So we're anticipating starting about this week and moving in next week that we're gonna see a bigger and bigger rollout of that application data returning to the, the financial aid offices. So what have we been doing in Montana to help address the delays and ease some of the pressures? Uh, our OG staff have remained in contact with high school counselors and financial aid offices to keep the communication flowing as this process has been moving along, keep the updates uh, uh, flowing to, so everybody knows what's, what's happening. Uh, we've also confirmed that all of our campuses have set up the necessary uh, tech, uh, inboxes to receive this data. So we know that we're ready and able to receive the data as soon as Ed starts releasing that. Uh, Scott, thank you. We, are, we have been in contact with the roughly 12,000 students who have completed an application or in the central application. We've been sending out emails to those students as well, encouraging them to, to complete the financial aid uh, form as well as encouraging them to be patient with the process it's coming as the data comes. So it's, it's a bit of patience that's, that's required from our students as well. Uh, but we also are aware that there are no applications across the campuses that we have that are being impacted by the delayed data. So no campus is going to be pressing up against application data uh, deadlines for students to apply to our campuses who are just waiting for this process to get to us. I, I don't think we can overstate the, the amount of pressure that our financial aid offices are about to receive when these, this big data dump starts to happen. Uh, so kudos and lots of thanks and gratitude to our financial aid officers who are about to receive a whole lot of work. But in the end, I think if you look at this entire process of what the FAFSA simplification is trying to achieve, and as we look at uh, the access and affordability issues, this process is going to be beneficial to Montana residents, Montana parents, and Montana students uh, coming to, to our campuses. That in a nutshell is, is the highest level uh, overview I can give of the process, and uh, I, Mr. Commissioner, Madam Chair, would be stand for questions. Okay, good. Thank you. I think we'll get through this. Um, so moving on, uh, 19, uh, 19, in 2022, uh, the OG staff did a, a survey of Montanans to sort of gauge how per prospective students uh, looked at education, higher education, how they valued it, uh, what they're looking for in it. Um, and I think the work was very informative and, and helpful and uh, with uh, thanks to uh, a grant that we've received uh, from the Lumina Foundation, we've recently being able to repeat that survey. We have uh, uh, Director Miller here and with some team members that are gonna share some results of that survey and some thoughts and insights toward higher ed moving forward. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Christian. Um, hello, Regents, nice to see you this morning. Um, Jasmine, do we wanna pull up just the perceptions of higher ed slides? Yeah, thank you so much. So um, Sierra and I are here today to talk a little bit about uh, what Clay prefaced there. Um, we started this project, it was, I think uh, we got notification of uh, the award for this project in February of 2020. So our plans changed just a little bit throughout the time of this, of this work. Um, but the goal of this project has really been to build a framework um, and data infrastructure to better understand 
the and drive the value of higher education for Montana. What we're going to share with you today is a small part of that work. Um, as Commissioner Christian mentioned, we uh, did a survey of Montanans, the largest survey that we know of that's ever been conducted of Montanans on their perceptions of higher education. We fielded that in the summer of 2021, and then again in uh, September of 2023 to get some kind of longitudinal data. Um, during that time, we saw national trends change pretty dramatically in terms of uh, people's perceptions of higher education. Uh, we really wanted to be able to track what was happening in Montana along, along those trend lines. Um, so that's going to be a little bit the focus of our presentation today is just to share with you the results from that second fielding of the survey. I want to before I turn it over to Sierra to kind of give a high level gloss of that, I wanna explain why we think that this is important. We have a lot of data on stu who students are, who Montanans are, what their experiences while they're with us, what their outcomes are when they go out into the workforce. Um, what we don't often have is understanding uh, what they think about that experience, that potential, those outcomes. Um, and this, information, these findings are really useful to kind of identify that delta. What is the value of higher education? How can we measure that? What do we know based on wage outcomes, workforce development, all of those metrics? Um, what's the delta between that and how Montanans actually perceive being able to realize that value? So when we kind of conclude here after we go through these findings, we'll share some insights on what our kind of key focus areas are or what our recommendations are to continue to drive the value of higher education. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sierra franks Angoy, who has been working really hard on this project and has just been such an asset to this work. She typically works as part of the Perkins team, um, but in recognition of um, both through the support of the Lumina Foundation, for this project, but also in recognition of this board's commitment to student success, we've been working a little bit more um, together and I'm happy to turn it over to Sierra to talk about some of our findings from this project. Um, so, as Christine mentioned, the survey was administered in both 2021 and 2023, um, and that was done by Corona Insights, which is a non-partisan uh, marketing firm. Um, and so they administered that survey to 10,000 Montana households, and we had a really strong response rate in both years, with around 10% of completed surveys returned. Um, and then those responses were statistically weighted to represent the adult population across the state. And so those uh, areas include um, region, town size, income levels, education levels, age, race, and gender. Uh, and as Christine mentioned, uh, part of the impetus to do a repeat of the survey was to see how trends may or may not have changed over time, like we have seen on the national level. And I'll point out now um, that between the survey years, those findings didn't really change. Those have held, opinions have held pretty consistent. Um, so what did we learn in 2023? Uh, one of the sort of highlights of the, the findings from the survey is that Montanans have a really positive perception on the value of higher education and a college degree. And Montanans have a shared commitment to um, college access. And we see that with 88% of Montanans um, believing that, or respondents believing that all Montanans should have the opportunity to access a higher education. Um, which is a really, really incredible uh, statistic, that we, statistic that we've been able to find um, from the survey. Furthermore, um, Montanans are able to recognize and identify the value a college degree has for themselves as individuals, um, for their communities in the workforce, in the state, um, with most Montanans agreeing that education beyond a high school diploma offers pathways for upward economic mobility, um, offers better career paths, and that their communities benefit when people from those communities earn a college degree. And uh, this is important because it does differ from what we hear in the national conversation. Um, you know, there is good uh, national research that shows that college degrees do lead to improved wage outcomes and job placement, um, but we also see in the media and public perception that there's increased skepticism around 
uh, what a college degree is worth, and we don't see that in Montana. In fact, when we look at all our different cross tabs for different subpopulations who have responded to the survey, they're pretty much in consensus around um, th these agreement points. The higher education leads to these better wage outcomes um, and has the potential to have realized value for themselves and their communities. <coughs> So I just want to reiterate Sierra's point that we do see some differences in Montana, and those differences are important. Uh, we do see at large our representative sample of Montanans believing in higher education and believing in the value. We also see that Montanans have perceived and experienced real barriers to realizing that value. So some of the other findings from the survey are around those barriers. There are barriers to access and there are barriers to affordability. Um, one of the barriers that we see that is really important for this board to attend to is uh, barriers to rural access. While um, most Montanans, as Sierra pointed out, believe that uh, residents should, ha should have the opportunity to access higher education, most also believe that rural Montanans uh, uh, access is limited and they don't have access to higher education. Um, Montanans also are very concerned about the cost of higher education um, and that cost barrier becomes really significant when thinking about return on investment. And you see here on the, the right that uh, that is the main reason that Montanans are sort of split on the ability to realize that value or what we would say is worth the cost of attending. Um, we see that uh, that's a perception that Montanans hold, and we also see this in our data and, our, and looking at kind of Montana income, Montana income levels relative to cost of attendance. Um, you've seen this chart before. This shows the percentage of uh, average family income for different quintiles of Montanans that, uh, that's the cost of, of our uh, education at our different institution types. So just for example, if we look at a uh, public two-year education in Montana for kind of middle income Montanans, the cost of that is 20% of, of household income in that average quintile. So I'm gonna just pause for a minute to let, let people absorb, absorb this sort of complicated chart. This is important because in Montana, we have uh, had a low sticker price. We've really focused on uh, low tuition, which has been, I think, a really positive strategy. Um, however, as we are moving forward and thinking about affordability, as we understand that for most Montanans, cost is the prohibitive barrier to realizing the value of education and that that has very significant implications for our state. I think that points us to thinking about what other policy tools we have available to us to increase affordability and enhance resources to be able to attend our really high quality public institutions. Galen mentioned one of those resources as PAL. Uh, we again see the changes in FAFSA as really positive with the expansion of eligibility. Largely, we will see increases in award amounts. And in Montana, we also see fairly low completion rates of the FAFSA. Um, so I think that it's really important to think about given um, these what we see in terms of affordability here and what we see in terms of Montana's perception, perceptions, it's really important to think about other policy tools like FAFSA completion, um, like uh, you know programs like Montana 10 that offer some aid, um, other different kinds of efforts that can address affordability. Um, the kind of third barrier that I wanna point out is completion. Once students get to us, we know that it is very difficult, if not impossible, for them to realize a return on investment and realize the value of higher education unless they complete. This chart shows um, average wage outcomes for students in the MUS who have completed, that's the column on the left, and those who have not completed um, on the right for one year out of, of graduation, three years out, and five years out. If you follow this trend line, you see even uh, greater disparities in terms of wage outcomes between those who have completed a degree and those who have not completed a degree. So when we talk about um, 
uh, ability to realize the value of higher education and that return on investment, we also know that completion really matters. So a couple of findings that I want to return to and point out is that all of these things that we're talking about in terms of barriers, uh, rural access, uh, affordability, completion, those barriers are particularly, particularly pronounced for those Montanans who are considering uh, co attending college in the next five years. That was a new question that we asked as part of this survey in 2023, so we don't have any change comparison, but I think that uh, you will be as concerned about these numbers as, as I am. Um, I'm gonna go through them. 69% of those who are considering college in the next five years disagree that people living in rural Montana have access to quality higher education, um, which again is a greater proportion than those not considering college. Um, eight in 10 of those considering college agree that there isn't a lot of help to pay for college. One in five would categorize those who uh, they know who have gone to college as having a negative experience. So 20% of people who are thinking about going to college uh, believe that, that those that they know had a negative experience. Um, and this last point is just to demonstrate that 51% uh, of those going to college in the next five years have a household income or $50,000 uh, or less. Um, so those affordability barriers are even more significant for the biggest uh, group of, of survey respondents uh, that are considering going to college in the next five years. So I wanna return to the point that Sierra made earlier that this matters not just for individual individuals, right? We know um, our data tells us, national data tells us this, that uh, those earning a college degree have better wage outcomes. This is from uh, the 2020 census quarterly wage outcomes, 2022 census data on quarterly wage outcomes. You can see uh, on the, the chart in the middle, on the right there in the red, um, those with a bachelor's degree or higher have uh, far, far higher wage outcomes than those with some college or associate's degree, high school diploma, or less than a high school diploma. I want to point out a caveat here. Um, I really don't like that the census puts together some college no degree and associate's degree into one bucket, but... Um, that is how the census does it, and uh, we, we don't have any control over that. We can get down and refine some of our data here through the post-secondary, uh, the PSEO census, um, some new census data, but I think the, the point is clear, right? Those with a college degree fare better in terms of wage outcomes. It doesn't just matter to individuals, of course. It matters to our state's workforce development. That pie chart that you see on the left is the sh shows the share of jobs uh, by education level. This is from the recent uh, Georgetown uh, University Center on Education and Workforce that was uh, put out last fall. Um, about 69% of jobs in Montana in 2031 will go to those who have some kind of post-secondary credential. Given that Montana is a net importer of folks with credentials, it, this is even more important for us to make sure that our residents not only have access to high quality education, but that that translates to uh, good jobs for them. So when we look at this data, when we look at our survey findings, there are three pretty clear drivers of value and recommendations. We have to continue to focus on completion. We have to continue to address affordability. And I would say given some of that uh, perceptions of those uh, wanting to go in the next five years, this will become increasingly important and we need to consider additional strategies. And finally, um, barriers to access are real. They're real for rural education. We see this uh, at what is called education deserts. Um, there's a lot of new research and recognition. There's some really interesting work happening in Colorado right now uh, where uh, policymakers are trying to think about um, does it require additional kinds of funding or does it require additional um, understanding of barriers to rural students and being able to uh, resource institutions to meet those needs. So that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, some of these challenges are also perceived, right? There are perceptions that it isn't worth the cost. As Sierra mentioned, Montana's kind of an outlier in the national conversation around this, but I think we would do well to, to keep sending our message, to keep 
communicating that a college degree is worth it, that it has value in Montana, and that we are working hard to help uh, Montanans overcome those barriers to access to help them realize that value. Um, so happy to stand for any questions or comments. Thank you both for that update and uh, some, some encouraging pieces of it and some challenges that we uh, will work toward to more meeting, Madam Chair. Any questions or no? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, oh. Uh, Regent Lazar. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can't underscore how important the survey is. Uh, and very much appreciate us taking the time to be able to do it. It's a huge undertaking. Uh, 100,000 Montanans received it, or 10,000 Montanans 10, 000, received it. That's 10, 000, yeah. And 1,000 responses is particularly high. So we should all be very proud of sort of the, the backside of this survey. Um, and I also appreciate sort of how you sort of pared out some of the takeaways. So there are some really, really important things in here. And I've been talking about you know, the value of the perception of higher education in Montana. I know we're swimming against the current um, nationally on higher education, and it's great to see that we have data that showcases that Montanans truly care. Uh, so this is, this is really important for us. Um, reflecting on a number of these different categories and reflecting on my time on the board, like one thing that makes me proud to be a board member um, is that when we make something a priority, we accomplish it. I think about the college completion work that we did through CCA and saw some of those completion rates increase dramatically uh, three, four years ago. We started really talking about retention rates at the board level and you see the retention rates go up. So there's, those are still some of the barriers that we're facing in here, but I did wanna underscore one barrier and that is this perception that um, there isn't help for paying for college. And um, certainly FAFSA will be helpful, and I think that's a good resource, but this board has been working and trying to figure out innovative solutions to partner with our legislative uh, partners um, on student financial aid. And uh, I think we have an opportunity kind of going into the, the next legislative session to really lean into this survey to help tell the story to our legislative partners that this is an issue and this should be a priority for not only the Board of Regents, but um, the, the legislature. So I think as we're starting the process, we're even starting the process today with looking at LRBP and, and you know the short list of like getting ready for the next session, I think we need to be as a body really, really digging in on, on student financial aid. So it's just a call out to our board, I, I, certainly something that we should be uh, sort of underscoring and prioritizing for our um, next few months, but certainly our, our summer retreat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other comments? Thank you. Uh, maybe just, maybe just one, just to, um, I, it, it's kind of just a, uh, you know, shout out to Ochi. It's kind of brilliant how you stack this up and how it kind of interconnects. So we have the, the you know, perceptions of higher ed, the, the lowest income earners in the state deem, you know, it's like 89% agree that um, college is, is unaffordable. And then we had the gentleman present on FAFSA, and I last number, last time I talked to uh, Deputy Commissioner Teal, us as a state left $9 million of FAFSA on the table, then you got plus state match. So that's a, you know, that's a lot of, of kids that get the opportunity, are missing the opportunity to, to be able to get higher ed. Casey had mentioned the, you know, the, the, the hard work that's been done with legislative partners. Um, big, big thing is, um, you know, it's just, uh, I don't want everybody in the room to get sick of be me beating the drum, but it's the data sharing component with, you know, uh, our big part of it is data sharing component between us and OPI to help identify, you know, youth in need um, that we can, you know, we can simplify the FAFSA process, identify youth in need, assign the, you know, the dollars, and then simplification of, of um, you know, ease of application through Apply Montana. So. I just kind of appreciate the brilliance on how you have set this up this morning because it's it all interconnects. It's it's these aren't three different things. This is one walk in a straight line that just wants to, you know, continue to pass the baton to its uh, to its counterpart. So thank you. Yeah, thanks.
Appreciate that very much. Out outstanding. Thank you. Again, thank you for the work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. Um, next on our list, and, and we are kind of winding down, but uh, and the other area of great interest and concentration throughout our university system, that's around research. As you guys know, uh, the uh, Montana was designated as a tech hub. Um, and we had uh, the opportunity to submit a grant by February 29th. Uh, it's with great pride that I say we, we were able to meet that deadline. We've submitted a grant, and I've asked Joe to give you guys a little bit of an update on what that sort of looks like at, at a very high level and uh, where we're headed next. Joe, please. Mr. Commissioner, Madam Chair, uh, glad to. And I, I will say, uh, submit a grant is maybe an understatement here. Actually, what happened is eight separate organizations submitted a grant, separate grants that had to speak to each other as to how potentially a $75 million federal investment would help Montana lead the country, potentially develop global companies focused in the space of optics and photonics and their application to some of kind of our key expertise and in industries in the state of Montana. So incredibly grateful to a gigantic team that took part in that. You can imagine eight separate applications in about a two-month time period uh, trying to present our best foot forward on how we'd spend tens of millions of dollars to take what is going well in Montana to the next level. Those included applications focused around workforce development led by Salish Kootenai College, led by the Department of Labor and Industry, led by Montana State University, thinking about the workforce in manufacturing and photonics and STEM workforce, uh, proposing uh, what would be one of the first in the nation's uh, optics and photonics engineering degrees and some of the steps that might be necessary to stand that up, include topics related to business development, venture development, technology transfer, and it included invest, proposed investments in some first in the nation type technology test beds, test beds related to putting photonics and optic sensors embedded into small chips so they can be uh, included in a greater variety of technologies, and then test beds related to the use of those sensors on autonomous vehicles and drones in their application to agriculture, to forestry, to environmental management. So just an incredible amount of work. Um, one final statistic that I'll share with you is that uh, in the end, 170 plus organizations that are around the state made specific commitments, whether that's hiring commitments, whether that's investment commitments in the state, whether that is investment commitments in particular parts of this Headwaters Technology Hub. So this was a massive, massive team effort. Um, I want to particularly thank our federal delegation, who I think has done an inc incredible job giving us this opportunity, and then uh, a team that really helped to carry it over the finish line, Dr. Joe Shaw, professor at Montana State University, uh, Paul Gladen, who's the executive, executive director of Accelerate Montana at the University of Montana, um, helpful consultants from a group called America Achieves, uh, Mary Craigle and Dustin DeYoung uh, from the Montana Department of Commerce, Matt Olson from the Montana Chamber of Commerce, and all led by a very capable uh, new partner, Tim Van Rieken, uh, who was hired on as an interim uh, innovation officer to lead this overall effort. Uh, we have our first site visit with EDA early in April, and we're hopeful that we will be one of the first five to seven selected for investment in the country sometime over the course of this summer. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Teal, and uh, the, the one you left out for obvious reasons, but yourself, which uh, carried the ball on this thing, and that's not lost on any of us, uh, your leadership uh, has, has been incredible and um, it, it, you talk about all the partners in that and, and that's fantastic and that's what we need to do to be successful but trying to get all of those partners on the same page to submit a document to the federal government is not an easy task and we just appreciate the leadership there very much. Thank you. Any questions? You. Appreciate the update. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll leave uh, the deputy right there. Uh, Little, little known fact to some, but certainly uh, should be February was CTE month nationwide. Uh, we're doing a lot around CTE. I, I think it's worth giving you just a few bars because of the questions you get as board members often is 
what have you done for CTE lately? <laughs> and how's it going to help Montana and our economy? And I just wanted to give you a few highlights. Uh, Joe, if you do that, please. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. And th there will be a few highlights because we'll have, I think, some good CT discussion tomorrow. Um, but you should all know uh, your campuses, particularly some of your two-year deans, uh, participated in CT-related events across the state. The governor made it a particular focus of his. I want to provide thanks to Jackie Treister and her team. Uh, the CTE team at OCHI does a lot of work to coordinate both with the Office of Public Instruction, with all of our institutions, and to develop some shared resources on Montana's career pathways, apprenticeship opportunities, trying to spread the message of the variety of ways that now exist in our state for students to pursue CTE. And coming out of some of that work, uh, we were particularly proud that the governor highlighted some of our good news on the dual enrollment front. So, uh, so that you know, CTE and dual enrollment in Montana is at an all time high. More than 3,300 students this past year participated, and that was up over 600 students from the year before. Um, and we had great opportunities to meet with the dual enrollment coordinators around the state. These are often one or two individual teams that help to coordinate with dual enrollment faculty, help students with registration processes, help student advising really take on this role for a group that has gone up by seven times over the last decade. And so a shout out to that team for all the incredible work that they do. Uh, dual enrollment, CT dual enrollment in Montana is at an all time high in large part because of their work. Any questions? Perfect, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, it sort of wraps up our uh, updates. I, I guess I'd call your attention to the campus reports that are always attached to uh, the agenda. Those have lots of good information as to what's happening on campus. Uh, usually don't speak to those. I, I would just briefly mention uh, we have a more extensive update from Dawson Community College, our partner uh, there who's going through leadership transition. I would tell you that uh, Joe has been a number of times. I have been in, in contact with uh, the, the president. We're offering our services any way we can to help them through that transition. It will be a smooth transition. President Vilmer has done a, a great job and uh, he's anxious to see uh, a smooth transition for the institution and for the students that they're serving there. Very committed to staying on board through that and, and making sure that uh, that's as easy on us as possible. Uh, transitions bring great opportunities and, and some interesting challenges as you work through them. But uh, they're in contact, and, and we hope maybe to get the, uh, the chair and if happens to be a new president by then to May meeting and give us some updates on what's happening on their campus. But a um, much more extensive report that uh, President Vilmer submitted that's uh, included in that. Madam Chair, next we have just a few introductions. Uh, we'll move through them fairly quickly. Uh, call on uh, Deputy Commissioner Hollenbaugh with uh, my office to uh, introduce a, a new staff member, team member there, or maybe introduce an old team member to a new spot or something along those lines. Very good, thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I do get to introduce uh, Leanne Kurtz, who will be joining us in a full-time uh, permanent status uh, to assist with, um, the, I know she was very uh, uh, helpful to my predecessor in terms of the legislative session. I'm looking very much forward to that assistance as we move forward with the, the next legislative session. I enjoy uh, having her, her assistant, though, as we move forward with uh, improving our communication and marketing around the central application and talking about the value proposition for higher education. Leanne and I actually started our uh, government careers as legislative staffers a few legislative sessions ago, and it's nice to, to have a the team back together again. So welcome, Leanne Kurtz as Communications Director. Thanks for that, and welcome, Leanne, uh, to the new role. Uh, Chancellor Reed. Thank you, Commissioner Christian. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Tia Brown as our new Vice Chancellor for Administration and Finance. Tia joins us uh, from Montana State University where she was serving as the Assistant Dean at the Jake Jabs College of Business and Entrepreneurship. 
And prior to that, she was also the Director of Operations. And she also served as a faculty member and Division Chair of General Education and Technology at Helena, at Helena College. She holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Northwest Missouri State University and earned her MBA from Southeastern Oklahoma State University. She arrived here in February and she's already making a tremendous impact on the campus and we're just delighted to have her here. So again, welcome to you. Welcome to you. Provost Lawrence. Thank you. Um, I am very excited to uh, introduce Jay Stevens, who will be, yeah, <laughs> go Jay. <laughs> um, he will be our new vice president for uh, a newly formed sector called People in Culture. Um, Jay comes to us uh, after 18 years of leading similar sectors at four other universities. Most recently, he has served the last six years as Vice President for Human Capital Services at Kansas State University. Prior to K-State, his positions included Associate Vice President for Human Resources at Boise State University, Director of Human Resources, Affirmative Action Officer and Title IX Coordinator at Southern Oregon University, and then Director of Human Resources at Utah State University Eastern. Jay also currently serves his professional association, Coupa HR, as past chair to the National Board of Directors. So we are very thrilled to welcome Jay to the new people and culture sector, which brings together several existing functions at UM that support people um, and is really oriented toward our mission first, people always um, priority for action. So the sector now includes Human Resource Services, the Office of Organizational Learning and Development, and the Office for Conflict Resolution and Policy. So welcome, Jay. Welcome, Jay. Thank you. Provost Makwa. Thank you, Commissioner. On behalf of Montana State University, we share our gratitude to Dr. Chris Fastnow, Director of MSU's Office of Planning and Analysis as she steps down at the end of March after more than 20 years serving MSU with enthusiasm and expertise. She's one, Chris is one of the university's most ardent supporters of MSU's strategic plan and with its laser focus on student success. During her time at MSU, Dr. Fastnow shepherded two strategic plans through the entire process, which as many of you in, in the audience know, it's. A, it's, it's a very lengthy process, includes pre-planning, planning, designing, approval, and implementation. This work involves heavy lifting, and Chris did this skillfully and enthusiastically twice. Chris's dedication to our mission is paired with her expertise in data stewardship and her skills at working with and organizing the university's enormous amounts of data. In summary, Dr. Fastnow will be missed. She has been an important part of MSU decision-making processes. Thank you, Chris, for your unwavering service to Montana State University. And with that, I'm pleased to share that Dr. Jason Browning has been appointed Montana State University's first chief data officer. Dr. Browning previously served as senior director of partner technology with the higher education consulting firm EAB. He's a business intelligence and analytics expert with experience helping universities use data in making strategic decisions. Dr. Browning begins his role at MSU on April 15th. His experience in examining and effectively presenting data will help MSU make data-informed decisions that ultimately further our goals and help our students succeed. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Jason Browning to his new role at Montana State University. Now after a national search, I'm pleased to announce that Dr. Steve Swinford has been appointed Montana State University's Vice President for Student Success. I think Steve is back here. Dr. Swinford will provide leadership management and strategic planning for student successes, many services, including admissions, ASMSU, campus recreation, dean of students, disability services, financial aid services, 
Leadership Institute, Registrar, Student Engagement, Student Wellness, and Veterans Services. Steve, are you sure you want to leave the provost's office? <laughs> Dr. Swinford has been at MSU since 1996 when he arrived as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. In 2021, Steve was named Vice Provost for Curriculum Assessment and Accreditation. Since July 2023, Dr. Swinford has been serving as Interim Vice President for Student Success. Steve has an unwavering commitment to our students, and we know they are in good hands with him as he leads this important part of our university. Please join me again in welcoming Steve Swinford to his new role. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. And lastly, uh, now that Steve has officially crossed the Rubicon from academic affairs to student success, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tracy Dewar, who is our new Vice President of Student Success. And uh, I just want to mention, thank you, Tracy. I want to mention that we are, we are exceptionally grateful for Tracy at stepping in and preparing our campus for our upcoming seven-year accreditation visit, which will occur next fall. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Madam Chair, that uh, gets us to the end of our Commissioner's agenda. I would, I would leave you with these parting thoughts. Um, as we find ourselves on the cusp of springtime in Montana, a, a glorious event by anyone's uh, lens. Uh, January 6, 2025 is barely a speck on the horizon, but that is the day the 69th legislative session will be sworn into action in Montana. And so we are well in the works of planning and, and readying ourselves for that. Um, the, MUS is, is building our initiatives, our capital projects. As you know, the board's infrastructure committee has already met. We'll continue that work. Uh, we're reviewing initiatives and crafting budget proposals that will be uh, included, hopefully, in the executive planning package. That's something that we deliver to them in June, following, hopefully, uh, the support of this board in, in the May meeting. Um, once that's delivered, then it'll work its way into the governor's budget and... Uh, ultimately into a legislative proposal. Uh, and to kick us into kind of full spirit this afternoon, uh, Shauna Lyons will be here and, and prevent, pr present, maybe prevent, <laughs> <laughs> present the uh, 2027 uh, biennial budget for, for your review as we work our way uh, down this proce process. So Madam Chair, with that wonderful, happy parting note, I turn it back to you. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Commissioner Christian. Um, wonderful report from any of the staff. And um, you know, January 6, 25 is, is closer than we think. And I always appreciate this office's work and, and really foresight to think through what the university system needs and, and the board's support. Thank you. Uh, as in Plattmeyer is unable to join us, so we'll accept his comments as appropriate. And I'd like to turn it now. I think joining us via Zoom today, is that correct, is Assistant Superintendent Christy Mock Stutz, or Stutz, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. And it's Stutz, you, you pronounced it correctly. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say a first connection, uh, Deputy Commissioner Teal. Um, I have my picture right here from uh, the Family Consumer Science uh, Proclamation Day signing um, with the governor and some students. Uh, so you mentioned that um, uh, the CTE month of February, and I was able to participate in that event, and I've got the picture here, so that was a nice connection uh, this morning. So thank you for that. Um, I hope you have the superintendent, I know, sent along a packet for you all. I, I believe you should have that. And I am just going to highlight a few things. I know we're sort of approaching your break time, so I'll be brief with my comments. Um, but first, the superintendent wanted me to highlight uh, some events that have been happening for student leaders across Montana. Um, it's called the Figure It Out event, and this is with Karen Gross and her team. And they have worked with um, five schools, Arden High School, 
Three Forks High School, Billings Public Schools and all the high schools there. Um, they went to Fort Benton and today they kicked off the event um, up in uh, Wolf Point High School. And this is the last event. And this event brings 16 student leaders together in the high schools to start and kick off the event. And those student leaders get together to talk about um, issues that they see in their high school, ways that they want their voices to be heard. And then the event continues for two to three days, depending on student, student schedule. They broaden out their leadership to the, the whole student body. And then uh, the team will follow up with the schools after to make sure that those leadership initiatives that the students have developed are, are ongoing and to provide that support for those schools. Those have been very successful and there are some videos and pictures um, on our website. Uh, Kira Moog is our family engagement specialist here at the OPI and she's been populating those pictures and videos. Um, so it's really worth checking out um, that great work that's happening there. Um, another uh, shout out for the agency and some hard work happening here at the, is the Montana Aligned to Standards Through Year Assessment. That's our MAST assessment. And we received a waiver, the OPI received a waiver from the US Department of Education um, for students in third through eighth grade, those schools that are in the pilot program for this MAST summative assessment this year do not need to take the smarter balanced assessment this year. And um, the MAST three-year assessment breaks up that summative assessment, which typically third through eighth graders take at the end of the year and brings it into smaller testing windows throughout the year. And this provides um, immediate feedback for teachers uh, to look at their instruction. They can align the testlets to what they're actually teaching, the standards that they're covering in that moment, um, and get some real you know, quick data back on how their students are doing on those standards for math and reading. And this test will also meet their federal reporting requirements for these summative test, um, assessments for the OPI and for um, the state of Montana. And it's really, an exciting opportunity. We're really leading the nation um, in this. Um, and so a lot of other states are looking to Montana right now. How are, how are we doing this through year assessment and, and how is that going? Um, and so that's an exciting project that is underway here at the OPI. Uh, another connection I heard to um, some of the presentations I think this morning was uh, the, the idea of uh, data and um, systems and bringing systems together. And we are also in a data modernization um, project and uh, we're working on that. Ashley Perez is our project manager on that here at the OPI. We're making good headway on that, consolidating systems, um, simplifying, and then being able to provide data um, to other partners um, as the data governing board decides as it goes forward. Another exciting opportunity that we're working hard on here at the agency is the teacher residency program. It's in its second year right now. Um, and this is where students who are, who are in an educator preparation program can apply to be a teacher resident and basically a student teacher for a year. They get a stipend, there's some tuition assistance and they um, work with a teacher leader in a school district for an entire year as part of their educator preparation. Um, and the um, recruitment is open right now for next year. We've already received um, quite a number of uh, interested people in that recruitment form. And um, we have space for up to 60 residents for next year. So that's a great opportunity um, for um, our you know, student teachers, um, for our, all of our educator preparation programs. Um, one connection to, I think you're all in Dillon this morning, is that the hub of that program is centered at the University of Montana Western. Um, and uh, that is sort of the, the hub part of this program. They help to uh, facilitate um, the uh, teacher residents and mentor teachers. In addition to um, having the placements of these residents in districts, um, the OPI provides learning labs throughout the year to support, give professional development and support to those teacher leaders and those teacher residents. The U.S. Department of Education has also highlighted this program. They are going to be posting a video about this program where they interviewed teacher residents and uh, mentor teachers. Uh, and recently, they made a video and that is going to be posted in their best practices clearinghouse very soon. So we're really excited about that. 
um, highlight and that spotlight on this great program here from Montana. Um, just a last couple of points that I wanted to highlight for you all this morning. Um, again, another Dillon connection. Uh, the superintendent was able to attend a couple of weeks ago the um, installation ceremony for the cadets in the 50th class of the Montana Youth Challenge Academy, um, and that happened in Dillon. And then the last uh, point for you today is that we had our Indian Education for All Best Practices Conference hosted in Billings just a couple of, it was actually on uh, March 8th and 9th. We had over 200 educators attending that conference, um, and it's always well received. Um, and um, and that is the end of my presentation and my remarks this morning. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. With that, uh, we are ready for our morning break. Uh, it is about 1040, so I'd like to call us back at 1055, give us the full 15 minutes, and then we'll go into our, our, our subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been I've been remiss. I gave you 20 minutes, so um, I'm going to use Shauna Lyons to prevent us from getting that extra five minutes back. Um, I understand uh, Mr. Kegel from Northern had a, a announcement that we overlooked, so apologize for that and turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner and Regents. I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Steve Don. Steve Don has been with MSU Northern for over 20 years. Um, Steve has accepted the role as the Dean of the College of Technical Science up there. Steve uh, did his undergraduate work in New Zealand at Canterbury University and furthered his undergraduate work at Northern and, and then did a, uh, a stint at MSU Billings where he did his uh, master's degree. But uh, Steve's been very active on our campus. He's uh, been involved with a lot of things that uh, have helped us advance the technologies. Um, we couldn't be happier than uh, him accepting this role. So Steve, you're out there somewhere. Would you please stand up? Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. All right, we will move now to the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee. I'm actually going to turn it over to the current chair, uh, Ms. Uh, Regent Buchanan from home a moment, momentarily. So I'm just doing a check. Regent Buchanan, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Good morning, Chair Dombrowski. Can you hear me? Yes, and we can see you too. Excellent. Very excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, Chancellor Reed, um, thank you so much to you and your team for hosting this meeting, Dylan's always one of my favorite places to visit. I'm sorry I'm not with you. And to the board, thank you for allowing uh, me to join remotely today. Um, Regent Fulcord, thanks for jumping right in on this committee. Um, we appreciated your participation in the committee meeting. And um, again, welcome to the board. Congratulations on your appointment. Um, I, this is a neat opportunity for me to introduce uh, Regent Yeager, who will chair this committee today. Um, as you know, as we all know, Montana is unique with how we position a student regent with a, a full authority on the board. And Riz Regent Yeager has not only gained momentum and steam with, with his focus on what he's doing, he's certainly demonstrating some outstanding leadership skills um, as we think about the agenda in front of us today. And it's just such a pleasure for me to pass the gavel to Chair Yeager for the Academic and Research and Student Affair Committee for this March meeting. Um, regent Yeager, it's all yours. I look forward to, look forward to the meeting. Thank you, Regent Buchanan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's quite a privilege to be able to, quite a privilege to be able to come here and chair this committee at my home campus. It really does feel like home being back here in Dillon. I think the last time I was in this room, there was a, a pretty intense pickleball match that I didn't fare well in. Uh, but we have a pretty great agenda here in front of us that's very emblematic of a lot of hard work from staff from across our campuses, from leadership, and from our members at OCHI. So thank you to everybody that was able to bring these items to the table today. As we move into the consent agenda, are there any items that the board would like to see removed for discussion? Seeing none, we will move forward uh, to honor some of our emeriti faculty. There's just a tremendous amount of experience and commitment that these faculty members have dedicated to their institutions. And uh, to expand on that, I'll turn it over to 
Deputy Commissioner Teal to call some people to the stand. Oh, thank you, Regent Yeager. And I, I just want to provide a quick context for the board. We, we like to take a little time out just to recognize these Emeriti faculty. Um, Emeriti status is not bestowed lightly. I think there's a short on this list of 25 years of service to the university system and a long of 37 years. So we are talking about a full career of service to education, research in the state of Montana. And so just briefly, we want to take time and, and invite our provost to uh, share a little bit about the service and experience and dedication of the faculty to whom they're recommending you bestow the status. And we'll start with Provost Lawrence from the University of Montana. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Board of Regents, uh, Chair Yeager, thank you so much. We are really delighted to uh, nominate and submit for your consideration uh, the, the two, two faculty for emeriti status, Dr. L. Scott Mills and Dr. Diana Six, both of whom have served in the Frankie College of Forestry and Conservation. Um, and Scott has also served in the Vice President for Research Office. Um, we are really delighted to recommend them to you. Um, each have served 26 years at the University of Montana, and their engagement and involvement in our community is, is a huge part of our success. Uh, Dr. Mills, uh, his teaching and research program pioneered the field of wildlife population ecology, combining multiple disciplines to understand how population dynamics of wild species are affected by human perturbations. Uh, he has been successful uh, in contributing to UM's undergraduate and graduate teaching mission, receiving the UM Most Inspirational Faculty Award and the School of Forestry, uh, the Montana Druids Faculty Service Award. I need to learn more about this award. Um, it's a compelling name. Um, his research has been highly impactful, crossing scientific disciplines and international borders. His work has been cited over 16,000 times, featured on the cover of at least nine journals and included in at least 20 textbooks. Dr. Diana Six has conducted high impact research on bark beetles, symbiosis, and climate change adaption in forests in multiple countries. Her pioneering work on bark beetle fungus symbioses show that some, including mountain pine beetle, uh, depend on fungi for crucial uh, elements of their development and reproduction. Um, her work on climate, climate adaptation uh, has found a genetic basis for tree survival during outbreaks of uh, mountain pine beetle in both lodgepole and whitebark pine. She is an internationally respected leader in her field and currently an extraordinary professor of ecology um, at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. She's published over 90 scientific papers and has been cited over 5,000 times. She's served in numerous capacities in the Frankie College of Forestry and Conservation, including Chair of the Department of Ecosystem and Conservation Sciences and as Associate Dean of Graduate Programs. Um, we proudly forward our nomination. Uh, congratulations, Scott and Diana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Provost Lawrence. We, we also have three nominees from MSU Billings, and I'd like to invite Provost Eskandari up to introduce them. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair Dombrowski, Regent Yeager, members of the board, uh, Commissioner Christian, on behalf of our faculty at MSU Billings, uh, the Academic Senate at MSU Billings, and Chancellor Hickswell, it is truly my honor and pr privilege to bring three Emeriti nominations for your consideration today. I'll be very brief as uh, uh, time is limited uh, and certainly I cannot adequately represent all of the accomplishments of these three nominees. Uh, in the order listed, Dr. Tom Dell has served MSU Billings for 18 years in our Department of Rehabilitation and Human Services within the College of Health Professions and Science. Dr. Dell has a distinguished record of teaching, research, and scholarly activities, as well as extensive service at the department, college, university, community, and discipline levels. Dr. Dell received the MSU Billings Outstanding Faculty Award no less than four times in 2006, 2008, 2010, and 2014. He was also the recipient of the Outstanding Faculty Award in American Indian Heritage Award in 2013. Details are included in, uh, in the nomination statement. I'll, Deputy Commissioner, if it's okay, I'll move forward to the next one. 
Dr. Stuart Snyder uh, has served MSG Billings for 22 years in our Department of Biological and Physical Sciences within the College of Health Professions and Science. Dr. S uh, Snyder is a physicist with a distinguished record of teaching and extensive record of research and scholarly activities, obtaining external grants and publishing many scholarly articles, and of course, extensive service at many, many levels. Again, the details are in the nomination statement. Finally, Dr. Patricia Vettel Becker uh, has served MSG Billings for 26 years in our Department of Art within the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, also serving as the department chair from 2009 to 2021. Dr. Vettel Becker is, a, is an art historian with a distinguished record of teaching, extensive record of research and scholarly publications, uh, publishing numerous articles, and also a book titled Shooting from the Hip, Photography, Masculinity, and Post-War America. Of course, she's also uh, done extensive service at uh, many levels. Dr. Vettelbecker received many awards at MSG Billings, including the Winston and Helen Cox Fellowship for Faculty Excellence, as well as the Faculty Achievement Award at the national level. She received the Illumina Teacher Award in the category of Artists Call for Justice. At MSG Billings, we're incredibly proud of these uh, three faculty members. We thank them for the years of service to not only to MSG Billings, but to the Montana University system, and we thank you for your consideration of these nominations. Thank you so much, Provost Eskandardi. Excellent nominees as well. And uh, last but not least, I want to introduce Provost Makwa to introduce Bozeman's nomination. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Teal and Chair Yeager. Um, Montana State University is honored to request the distinction of Professor Emeritus for Dr. Ed Dratz. Professor Ed Dratz served in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at MSU since 1986. He has many accomplishments in his 37-year career as a teacher, researcher, and scholar. Dr. Dratz's areas of expertise uh, span from research on, on protein-coupled receptors to developing tools that help us better understand biochemical mechanisms in health and diseases. His list of, of scientific accomplishments is long and distinguished, including substantial external funding, uh, a long list of publications, and, and several patents. Ed's career truly is distinguished by his curiosity and innovative approaches. One area that, that deserves a special note today is the emphasis that Dr. Draft has, has always placed on working with undergraduate students in his research labs. Today, this is widely recognized as a best practice in higher education, but Ed was doing this as far back as, as 1986. He is truly a trailblazer, and many students who worked in his labs have gone on to distinguish careers as scientists, researchers, and educators. Thank you for considering MSU's request to award Dr. Ed Dratz with the distinction of Professor Emeritus. Thank you so much, Provost Makwa. Again, Regents, these nominations are on your consent agenda, but uh, as you can hear, uh, some incredible service, some uh, incredible accomplishments of these six faculty members and grateful to our provost for bringing some of their stories to this table. Regent Yeager, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, and thank you, Provost, for helping us recognize some of these amazing individuals and the contributions that they've made to the university system. As we move into our action items, there is more recognition to be given for just some incredible individuals. Influence, passion, community, I think these are words that really define uh, some of the individuals up for honorary doctorate right now. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Provost Lawrence to share a little bit about UM's two candidates. It is my pleasure, and I mean pleasure, underscored and highlighted, uh, to share the nominations for two incredible individuals for an honorary doctorate uh, at the University of Montana. Lily Gladstone for an honorary doctorate of fine arts and Carol Tatsi Murray for an honorary doctorate of education. A widely celebrated actress, storyteller, and social justice advocate, Lily Gladstone is a native of Browning and a University of Montana graduate. While still early in her career, Ms. Gladstone already has an impressive resume, including roles in Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, Certain Women, Winter in the Blood, 
and Jimmy P, Psychotherapy of a Plains Indian. Ms. Gladstone was honored with the 2024 Vanguard Award at the Palm Springs International Film Festival, named a Time Magazine's Next 100 list, and is the first Indigenous nominee for the best performance of a female actor in a motion picture category of the Golden Globes, which she won. Um, she was also nominated for the Best Actress uh, Oscar at the 2024 Academy Awards. The first Native American to receive a Presidential Leadership Scholarship at the University of Montana, she was named the Davidson Honors College Distinguished Alumna in the fall of 2023. Carol Murray is a respected educator, former college president, leader in the Blackfeet community, and University of Montana alumna. During her 36-year tenure at Blackfeet Community College, she served as the president for eight years, interim president for six years, vice president for six years, and in other critical roles, such as the registrar. She has played a vital role in the cultural and ceremonial revitalization of the Blackfoot Nation, particularly in the repatriation of cultural and ceremonial items. While at Blackfeet Community College, Ms. Murray also made impactful contributions to the cultural curriculum, secured more than $20 million in facility development projects, and helped found key cultural events. Her impact is felt at other institutions, including UM, where she contributed to the research and advancement of Blackfeet studies. Beyond academia, Ms. Murray has been instrumental in creating cultural events such as the Days of the Picani and the Bear River Massacre Commemoration. Carol now serves as the co-curator of our People's Gallery at the National Museum of the American Indian. Thank you for your consideration of these UM alumni and distinguished professor professionals for honorary doctorates at the University of Montana. Thank you, and what excellent candidates. I just want to extend a thank you to the University of Montana for bringing them forward. It's so humbling to hear stories like this, especially uh, close to my community um, near the Blackfeet Reservation, and the impact that they have made there is just tremendous. So again, thank you. Moving on to our next two honorary doctorate candidates, I'd like to turn it over to Provost Makwa to share a little bit about who MSE was brought to the table. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Board, for considering our, our two requests for honor, honorary degree candidates. The first is Paul Wiley. Uh, we're requesting uh, honorary doctor of humane letters. Paul Wiley was born in Livingston, Montana, and graduated from Montana State College in 1959 with a degree in chemical engineering. Mr. Wiley began working in the rocket industry as an engineer where he garnered extensive experience with a famed Minuteman missile. He subsequently became a patent examiner at the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, which eventually motivated him to return to college in pursuit of a law degree. While working full-time, he attended law school and graduated from American University, Washington School of Law. From there, Mr. Wiley had a distinguished legal career as, as corporate counsel and in intellectual property law private practice, including several very high-profile infringement cases between large corporations. He also served as chairman of the American Bar Association Committee on Patent Contracts. So if you're keeping track, we have a, a rocket engineer who designed intercontinental ballistic missiles, a highly accomplished attorney, and then in 2007 or so, he became seriously interested in historical studies and, and fully devoted his, his energy and his intellect to this passion of research and writing. One of his first books is titled The Irish General, Thomas Francis Meagher. Mr. Wiley researched extensively the life, life, and, death, life and death of General Thomas Francis Meagher and this work became a highly acclaimed read in the historical field. His writing is praised by historians in the United States and among readers of Irish heritage around the world. In 2015, the president of Ireland uh, dedicated the Meagher Bridge in Waterford Island. And he, he quoted extensively from Mr. Wiley's book in doing so. The mysterious death of Meagher also led Paul to write, produce, and stage in several Montana communities, a play titled A Coroner's Inquest into the Death of Thomas Francis Meagher. And it was based on documents from the time of Meagher's death. Mr. Wiley next wrote Blood on the Marias, 
the Baker Massacre. In this book, he researched and uncovered as much as he could on what caused the, the Pegans and the Calvary to meet on the faithful day of January 23, 1870, on the frozen Marius River in Montana. Paul has been of tremendous service to the Native American people, and the Blackfeet Nation have honored Paul, Paul's work in several instances. Mr. Wiley most recently penned the book Montana State's Golden Bobcats, an epic story of the Golden Bobcats, Bobcats of 1929, who won the National Basketball Championship. What a, an appropriate day to be uh, honoring him. Uh, and in this story included two gifted African-American siblings who were born in White Sulphur Springs at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, Taylor and Rose Gordon have been known to Montana historians, but this was the first serious study of their remarkable musical connection to the Harlem Renaissance. Mr. Wiley has contributed much to Montana State University and the citizens of Montana. He has served on the board of directors of Eagle Mount. His wife, Arlene, co-founded the Cancer Support Community in Bozeman, and Paul was an early volunteer and significant supporter. He's donated over 1,000 hours of free legal service. He's donated significant funds to the MSU Athletic Endowment, has supported the Montana State University Library, and established the Paul and Arlene Wiley Student Endowment Fund for Native American students in the College of Engineering. He's hired history students to help with his research, providing them invaluable training and much needed income over the years. Mr. Wiley is a man of extraordinary achievement a chemical engineer, an intellectual property lawyer, and a distinguished historic author from Montana. He's also a man of strong character, integrity, compassion, and generosity. Montana State University wholeheartedly supports the nomination of Paul Wiley for an honorary doctorate degree from Montana State University. Thankful for, thank you for your thoughtful consideration. And our second candidate? Go ahead. OK. Our second candidate is Ms. Eho Pomeroy, and where we re request consideration for honorary doctorate of humane letters. Ms. Eho was born in South Korea. And while working in South Korea at the US Navy Trouble Desk, she met her future husband, Derek. The couple returned to the United States and settled in Montana, uh, where her husband was raised. After Derek completed law school in Missoula, they moved to Bozeman raised a family, and started a small business. Iho has, has owned, led, and managed a successful, award-winning Korean cuisine restaurant, Iho's Korean Grill, for over 25 years here in Montana. She has a reputation of being one of the most generous spirits, volunteering and organizing countless fundraising opportunities for nonprofit groups, educational causes, international disaster relief efforts, and preparing food for those in need around the community. In addition to being a fixture in the community as a local business owner and tireless volunteer, Eho Pomeroy was elected to the Bozeman City Commission in 2013, a position she was reelected two times thereafter, with a decade of public service as a Bozeman commissioner. Eho's priorities during her tenure included affordable housing, mental health care access, promoting open space in Bozeman and for Bozeman Recreation and Community Gardens, um, as well as encouraging the city's growth uh, to ensure that Bozeman continues to be a walkable and bikeable community. Ms. Pomeroy is known for holding community fundraisers at a restaurant, with the proceeds going to many deserving causes, both locally and internationally. Eho regularly volunteers her time to speak on panels at Montana State, most recently speaking on female entrepreneurs of color in Bozeman. Eho has contributed so much to Montana State University over the years, and her impact has had a remarkable reach to the citizens of Montana and beyond. Eho truly embodies the best of Montana. She is a selfless community leader and public servant with, with tremendous enthusiasm, compassion, and generosity to those who have had the opportunity uh, to work alongside her. 
It would be a tremendous honor to bestow an honorary doctorate degree to Ms. Eho Pomeroy from Montana State University at MSU's Spring 2024 Commencement Ceremony. Thankful, thank you for your thoughtful considerations. Thank you, Provost Makwa. It's, in my opinion, one of the greatest honors we can have is in honoring others and providing gratitude for some of the significant contributions and impacts that members in our communities have made both scholastically and just in the community at large. So it's something that we as regents take very seriously as we review these proposals for honorary doctorates and we take into executive session before in order to discuss. And in reading these, I just remember saying the words, wow, 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 over and over. It's uh, truly humbling to hear these stories and truly motivating. Uh, in a career of leadership. Thank you. I'd like to turn it over to any of the other regents for any remarks or comments. Seeing none, I will turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Teal on our request plan proposals. Regent Yeager, members of the board, thank you so much for, uh, for turning over. I'm happy to introduce uh, the several request to plan items that we have for your consideration today. Again, these are academic changes uh, to centers or institutes or academic units or new programs that uh, come before the board at an early stage in their development and consideration. And some of the, the reasoning and the thought is that that both gives uh, OCHI staff, other campuses early forewarning about directions that their colleagues are moving in as well as um, gives you as regents an early opportunity for input into how those proposals are shaped and developed, uh, and an opportunity for input before uh, too much substantial effort and resources are put into some of these program development, because program development does take important and finite resources. So today we have seven proposals before you. Uh, these have been vetted and discussed by OCHI staff, by your chief academic officers at institutions around the state, and then reviewed by the ARSA committee. And we'll start off uh, inviting Provost Eskandari up to the stage to introduce the first item. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Teal. Uh, Madam Chair Dombrowski, Regent Yeager, members of the board, uh, Commissioner Christian, uh, we are bringing a request to plan for your uh, consideration to consolidate two existing academic departments. So this is a unit organization proposal rather than a program uh, proposal. Uh, these two departments are the Department of Healthcare Services and Department of Health and Human Performance uh, to uh, form a new Department of Health Sciences and Human Performance. Uh, our dean, our associate dean, our department chairs, and our faculty, they've engaged in quite a bit of consultation uh, considering both uh, the short-term and long-term benefits of such a merger to both our faculty and our students. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the consultation has been pretty uh, extensive with our faculty and with our students. In fact, the chair of our uh, Department of Health and Human Performance, Dr. Suzette Linus, is with us uh, here uh, today. As I mentioned, this is a unit level change. This is an organizational change. It's not gonna impact in any way the programs that are offered by these two departments. It's not gonna change in any way how the classes are offered. It's not gonna change how the students are, are served. It will bring about um, operational efficiencies. It will bring about having synergy in a larger department with a critical mass of faculty that can perform all of the functions that a healthy department uh, should, should perform, such as providing faculty mentorship, um, synergies for both curricular interactions and also uh, partnerships with respect to scholarship. And I think it will also uh, create opportunities for the growth of our health sciences uh, mm -hmm. program. So with that, I'll stop and I, I thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions. Not a question, but a comment. I just appreciate the words that you used in terms of getting everyone at the same, you didn't say this exactly, but everyone around the same table, efficiency, and then out of that is gonna become growth in an area that's so critical for us in the healthcare profession. So appreciate the work that's involved. I'm, um, I'm sure it was a lot, and, and, and you're bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
I really appreciate Thank you. just all the work. Thank you, Provost Eskandari. Uh, thank you, Regent Yeager, uh, Regent Dombrowski. With that, uh, we'll move on to uh, two proposals from the University of Montana. The first to, uh, again, do a unit merger between uh, an existing lab school at UM and the UM Institute for Early Childhood Education. I'll turn it over to Provost Lawrence. Thank you. Um, so as, as Deputy Commissioner Teal um, just noted, we are proposing to consolidate the lab preschool uh, with the Institute for Early Childhood Education. Um, it, by doing this, we hope that it will improve outreach, uh, that we will be, be able to use our state-of-the-art facility and um, sort of the joint uh, early childhood delivery mechanism with the lab preschool and our really robust early ch childhood education programs in the College of Education as a demonstration school for other communities in the state. Um, and ultimately, we would like to expand services in the lab preschool to, to from ages three to all the way up to eight. So it will become an early learning center uh, rather than strictly a preschool. Um, we already work collaboratively together and this, we think, will improve some of our um, efficiencies. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Again, no question, but just a shout out to the consolidation and the, and the looking for that opportunity. Appreciate that. Thank you. And I'd just like to highlight the importance of the area with early childhood. Uh, in my community, we haven't been able to have an early childhood program, and mm -hmm. it's had such a, a detrimental impact on students' abilities to, to function when they get into those early grade levels. It's just so important that they get those routines and procedures in before they start school. So thank you for your work on it and trying to better that field. Thank you for recognizing the importance, Regent Yeager. Mm -hmm. If there are no other questions, uh, Provost Lawrence, you can move on to your second item. Great. Our second request to plan is for the Indigenous Research and STEM Education Center at the University of Montana. Um, much of the work has been happening in this, what, what we hope will be a center, over the last decade. Uh, Dr. Aaron Thomas, a, a faculty member in uh, the Department of Chemistry, has really led this um, this work, working with tribal colleges and universities, uh, working in particular with Native students, impacting uh, over uh, it's between 200 and 250 students over the last decade be, who range in age from middle school all the way up through graduate school. Um, the, the work that he has been able to do has been supported through extramural research funding and outreach funding. And if this center um, is approved, or the, the planning for the center is approved, we believe we'll be able to expand and leverage relationships that we already have with tribal communities, tribal colleges and educations and in ways that will better serve those communities and we'll be able to do um, more collaborative work uh, that benefit um, the, the people who live in tribal communities, the people who live in the state of Montana. So we uh, respectfully and hopefully submit this RTP for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. If there are any questions, I'll make one just quick note, which is that um, we now have several centers at UM, at Montana State University, that are really building a great set of research expertise, both on uh, Indian education for all, Native education, Native communities, health, and natural resource management policy issues, and I think it's a growing strength at both of these institutions. And, Related to a previous item, I will say that it's, it's also a growing strength and collaborative focus between tribal colleges and the university system. Uh, Salish Kootenai College's component of the Tech Hub application it is very aligned with this direction at the University of Montana in terms of developing STEM education resources that uh, are responsive and work with tribal colleges, tribal communities, and, and some of the curriculum that they need. So thank you, Provost Lawrence. If there are no other questions, and with your permission, Regent Yeager, we'll move on to Montana Tech. Uh, we have Interim Provost Hardy here joining us. Tech has uh, three items, and I'll turn it over to you, Provost. Uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, Montana Tech does have three requests to plan today. 
The first is a Certificate of Applied Sciences in Smart Manufacturing Technology from Highlands College. This program will train students in entry-level skills in modern integrated and automated manufacturing to prepare them for rapid entry into the workforce. Highlands College will work with the Montana Department of Environmental Quality and the Montana Manufacturing Extension Center at MSU in Bozeman to provide additional training opportunities across the state. This is a two semester, 30 credit program offered in hybrid format and will be structured to be an exit point for an advanced manufacturing technology AAS that's currently being designed to develop skills as a manufacturing technician. Funding is available for equipment and faculty for three years and it's anticipated the program will become self-sustaining through uh, student enrollment. So I'll be happy to take questions. Are there any questions for Provost Hardy? Hearing none, please. The second request to plan also is um, from Highlands College, the Certificate of Applied Sciences in Broadband Technology. This program will provide students with technical skills in broadband internet technology, including issues in safety, warehousing, fiber, and splicing, and training in CDL for, again, rapid direct entry into the workforce. This program aligns with state priorities to narrow the digital divide and provide high-speed internet to rural and underserved communities. This is a one semester, 30 credit program delivered in hybrid format. Broadband technical courses need to be created and some faculty hired. Several equipment resources are needed and already on site um, for the pre-apprentice line program. And this has sufficient capacity to be dual use for this program as well. Thank you, Provost Hardy. Are, are there any questions from Regents on this proposal? I want to make a quick note on these two proposals and, and a quick shout out both to Montana Tech and also in particular to Bernie Phelps, who works at Highlands College and was instrumental in writing two grants that these proposals emerged from. The first is with the Montana Manufacturing Extension Center, focused on kind of modern manufacturing work, including work that's aligned with apprenticeships. And then the second a statewide grant that Tech and Highlands College led uh, to the Strengthening Community Colleges competition from the U.S. Department of Labor. And, and that focused on uh, this being one component, but a broader investment in broadband workforce pathways, which are going to be really important for us in coming years. There's anticipated to be north of $600 million of state and federal investment to try and expand broadband access. And because of their alignment program, I think, Montana Tech Highlands College are really well positioned and have done an incredible amount of good work that's multi-institutional leading in, creating some new ideas in that space as well. So the, these two proposals certainly come with, with our support. Uh, agreed and second on all of that. <laughs> so our final request is to establish a center for education and ecosystem studies. Uh, the proposed center arises from the Clark Fork Watershed Education Project that has been operating on the Tech campus since 2005. CFWET began providing ed education in watershed science for communities in the Clark Fork and over the years has grown to include education and professional development in STEM for K-12 teachers and students through partnerships with Montana school districts and campus researchers. Um, CFWEP has served over, I just got updated, 89,000 students, um, provided professional development opportunities for close to 1,000 teachers, and dedicated over 311 student, con uh, sorry, not more than 311, 311,000 student contact hours to promote and foster STEM education and literacy. Uh, at this time, CFWEP is poised for growth and an established center will expand its reach beyond the Clark Fork and broaden its education spectrum to include current and future ecological threats, including climate change, as well as population growth and development in the state. The aims of the center include creating a formal educational structure that empowers K through 12 teachers to open STEM education pathways to all students and particularly targeting to those that are low income, rural, and indigenous communities to address educational disparities across the state. 
Uh, CFWAP has been supported by soft money for the past 20 years and is expecting to just at the beginning need an additional staff member as we go forward. Any questions or comments? And, and um, we also hopefully and respectfully um, put this before the board for approval. Thank you for bringing okay. these all to us today. It's uh, very evident the amount of work and collaboration that went into these. So I'd just like to commend you and your team on all of that effort and bringing this to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Yeager, with, with that, we reach our, our last two proposals coming from this campus, the University of Montana Western. I'll invite Provost McLean uh, up to the podium. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Teal and Chair Yeager. Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm really excited to present both of these requests to plan. Um, I'll start with our uh, request to plan a bachelor's of science degree in farm and ranch management. And I'd like to connect to Chancellor Reed's opening remarks this morning. We're really proud of uh, our unique um, way we offer our education through our block model. It allows us to uh, introduce um, field trips, introduce experiential components to our educational environment that we think uh, set us apart. We're also really proud of the demographics that we serve. And Chancellor Reed mentioned this morning that 70% of our students come from uh, Montana communities of fewer than 10,000 people. And <clears throat> what we found is uh, uh, many of those students coming from those rural areas want to return to their rural areas and, and work in, um, in the farming and ranching industry. And our business and technology department has a long history of serving those students by um, or through uh, our small business uh, focus. Four years ago, we created a, a minor in farm and ranch operations. And the impetus of that minor was to help those students who were coming from rural communities and returning to those rural communities gain specific uh, content and skills in the farm and ranch industry. What we've seen over the last four years in that minor is uh, a, an enormous trajectory, an enormous enrollment rise. We currently have 61 students who are minoring in that uh, credential. 61 students at a small campus like this is, uh, is really significant. It's one of our, actually, if we just count it as a, as a unique program, it would be one of our biggest programs on campus. And that's only a four-year-old program. Um, we want to leverage the success that we've seen in the farm and ranch operations minor and request to plan this bachelor of science degree in farm and ranch management. So I bring that request to you first. Uh, I'll turn the time back to Joe. If Professor, maybe we'll open up if there are any questions on, on the farm and ranch management bachelor's degree. And as we do, I, I wanted to provide a little bit of context for the board because I, this program did develop some conversation for good reason, I think, which is that uh, in board policy, when we set out some ideas of how we assess new program proposals, we think about alignment with the campus mission, we think about the campus's ability to deliver the program uh, to the right degree of quality, we think about student and employer demand. Uh, and we also think about uh, of trying to, where possible, avoid unnecessary duplication. Um, and on your agenda, Regents, you should know that each time when it reaches the Regents meeting, there's a short sheet that summarizes some of those information points for Regents so that you have visibility. Here, there are similar programs related to this around the state. MSU Bozeman has uh, two options as well as a standalone degree that serve farm and ranch management areas. Uh, MSU Northern has like an agricultural technology bachelor's degree. There are three uh, two-year campuses around the state that have some substantial focused areas at the two-year level serving farm and ranch management, in part because exactly what Provost McLean said, there are rural communities, rural students who, more, that's their objective. 
And so I'm bringing this to you today to say that there have, I think, been some good conversations between MSU Northern and UM Western, MSU Bozeman and UM Western regarding each other's programs. OCHI staff has taken assessment in terms of the uh, enrollment. Our assessment is that uh, the student demand evidenced by UM Western's minor, uh, their existing program mix at this campus, the campus mission, uh, this seems like a sensible direction for the university to move in, and, and so this program comes with our recommendation. Thank you, Provost McLean, and to your entire team for working on this. Uh, just to share some personal perspective, uh, being from the demographic of the farm and ranch community, there's so many of my peers that go into higher education simply as an opportunity to leave these family operations for a little bit and experience something different. And in order to do that, they have to take a program that in some way will benefit them, and a lot of times that is business. Now we're able to provide programs such as this Farm and Ranch Bachelors that better serve those students so they can get those views, they can contribute more when they go home, and they can also be a part of uh, an engaged college campus that's with the block schedule, able to go out to some of our partnering ranches and uh, really get some hands-on experience. So thank you for your work on this. If there aren't other questions from Regents, uh, Johnny, I'll have you introduce the last request to plan item. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner and Chair Yeager. Um, the next request to plan is, uh, is a minor in strength, condi strength and conditioning. We have a really strong kinesiology curriculum here, and it prepares students for advanced certifications. One of those certifications is through the National Strength and Conditioning Association's Strength and Conditioning Specialist Certification. Beginning in 2030, that uh, certification exam will be restricted to those who graduate from programs accredited by the Council on Accreditation of Strength and Conditioning Education. To help prepare students for this certification and the associated employment opportunities and to align with recent recommendations from our seven-year reviews external reviewer, we request to plan this minor uh, and then once hopefully it is approved and we establish the minor, we will plan to gain the necessary program accreditation so that we can continue to prepare our students for this important uh, certification. Thank you, Provost McLean. Uh, are, are there any questions on uh, this proposal or, or any of the proposals on the request of plans? Hearing none, thank you. And Regent Yeager, I will turn it back to you. Thank you for helping us through that section of our agenda, <laughs> Deputy Commissioner. and. Just a big thank you to all of our campus leadership and all of the work that you've done in bringing these programs to us and all of the thought that goes into it as well as the collaboration. Uh, it's so appreciated and our students benefit so greatly from it. So one more time, thank you. As we move into our information items, there's uh, a few policy revisions uh, mainly pertaining to student fees and how um, the online modality can sometimes change the way that we need to look at that. So I'll turn it back over to you, Deputy Commissioner, to expand upon that a little bit. Great. Thank you, Regent Yeager. I'm going to invite Dr. Sue Balterreitz up to the podium. Sue, uh, in addition to being a longtime faculty member at MSU Billings, has come on part-time as our Director of Online Initiatives. She's leading a lot of the learning management system transition work that we spoke to you about. She also convenes uh, the statewide group of uh, directors of online learning, your e-learning advisory council, and, and both of these policies have benefited greatly from that team's work and development. So Sue, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the distance education policy series first. Thank you so much. So I want to talk to you quickly about the process we went through, and then I'll give you a very, very brief overview of the 303 uh, policy changes and then I'll turn it back to Deputy Commissioner Teal to talk about the 940 policy changes. So as you know, online and distance education is under a revolutionary change cycle and our policies, which at the time were really very sound, 
uh, we're really constraining innovation as well as clarity. And the work to be to put together these policies has been going on for several years uh, under the leadership of the e-learning committee, which is soon to be renamed the Distance Education Committee. So we had a few policies in 3037 that were smooshed together to try to do a lot of different things. So the first move we made was to separate those policies. 3037 now provides oversight to keep us um, consistent with federal and state regulations as well as to address some of the upcoming regulational, regulation policies that are emerging out of accreditation as well. 3037.1 just uh, separates out from the original policy the Distance Education Advisory Committee and establishes their mission and overview. 3037.2 is where we've made the most change. And uh, before I go on, I need to call out the e-learning group under the capable leadership of Dr. Joy Honey from MSU Billings, who's here today, and Eric Vorkepper from University of Montana. Uh, they led a very robust discussion on uh, thinking about changing the modality definitions. We used to only have three. As you can see, those have expanded greatly. Um, and they are intended really to do two things. Um, first, provide clarity for students and faculty as they enroll. Programs no longer are simply online or face-to-face, -face, but there are multiple technological innovations that allow students to engage with faculty members in a lot of different ways. So that's number one. The second goal is that going forward, this will allow us to do a much better job of tracking both the growth of distance education as well as how well students are doing in distance education courses because we aren't going to be collapsing everything into a single modality definition. So it's very different to be in a high flex classroom than in an online classroom, than a synchronous remote classroom, than a hybrid classroom. And so I think that this will give us tools as we move forward to see how well distance education is working for the students across Montana. And with that, I'll hand it back to Deputy Commissioner Teal. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, turning to, to the tuition and fees for distance education policies. So your existing policy 940.20 does two things. It gives campuses flexibility when setting non-resident tuition in online programs to uh, set that at a lower rate than typical non-resident tuition. We're not changing anything about that part of this policy. That's really intended to give our institutions trying to build online portfolios more flexibility in competing in that increasingly competitive marketplace nationally. The second part is that it indicates for students who are in uh, at a distance from campus and enrolling fully online, only in the online modality, uh, a fee waiver for fees that primarily contribute to services that are only offered on campus. Um, and so the change is that we are tightening our definitions around that fee exemption for those certain mandatory fees. We're moving that to the mandatory fee policy to be more consistent. Uh, Given some of the emerging complexities around uh, distance education modalities, we're changing that from a two-part test to be a one-part test related to a student's distance. And then we're particularly calling out uh, a few instances that hadn't been as prevalent in the university system but are growing. A key example is prison education programs. Uh, we incarcerated students likely can't use the services supported by some of those fees. We're trying to find other ways to serve them over time. Uh, but this uh, provides those students a clear waiver of, uh, or exemption from some of those mandatory fees in Regents policy. Um, and uh, also provides a route which exists currently for campuses to offer students an opportunity to opt into those fees if they want to access some of those services if they should come to campus. Uh, so again, Reacting to, I think, where our students are studying, how they're studying, uh, some of the changes in our delivery of academic programming around the state and trying to make sure that we're consistent and clear in our current policy as to where fee exemptions should be applied. Um, 
just a quick note on process. These are in front of you as information at this meeting. Uh, these policies have benefited greatly from feedback from our chief academic officers, our two-year leadership group. They've been distributed to registrars, our chief financial officers group. Uh, I expect that there will be a few slight changes based upon some of the feedback that we continue to receive, as well as uh, some supportive uh, guidance on timelines and interpretation uh, between now and May. May is when you should see this with a summary of some of that further feedback received come forward to you for a vote. With that, uh, Sue and I are happy to open up for any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe just one qu quick question on that second uh, policy revision under consideration with regard to the uh, fee waivers, uh, particularly around the distance education aspect, the non-incarceration side of it. Um, in, in the policy, we talk about an objective measure uh, for each of the campuses. Can you what 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 is an objective measure like? What are we? What are some of the things that the campuses are thinking about? Because it could be very subjective to figure out how to accomplish that. And that's where I see the reliability in the policy is maybe right there. Yeah. Regent Lowe's are glad to discuss it. And I'll say that's probably one of the points of greatest continuing discussion and debate. And, and here's the challenge is that um, our current policy has similar language. And in practice, campuses are looking at residents in a county, residents in certain zip codes uh, as their their measure, um, and really given kind of the diversity of our campuses, it's hard to set a single threshold that's sensible given kind of their commuting zones and distances. And then operationally, in order to recognize when a student is due an exemption from those fees, we need to have ways to gather that information and to process that pretty regularly, including in times where a student's eligibility for a an exemption can change term to term. Um, and so typically we've used you know, students' places of residence as that source. So there's some limitations in terms of where we can source information to set an, an objective measure. There are also, I think, important differences in campus context where it's, it's valuable to um, have some flexibility on the measure that they set locally. Um, what we're exploring is, and we've had a request, is to, to think if we can have some tighter guidance around that, perhaps that doesn't come into policy or, or at least some gathering of information as to what measures campuses are setting. Um, but that's some of the context as to why we've moved from we're going to set a specific threshold to maintaining some of the flexibility that exists in current policy. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the flexibility we're providing in policy here. Um, listing each of those objectives may not make sense from a board policy perspective, but uh, maybe it's something that um, you can all come back to with some specificity of like which what the campuses are actually using once that model is developed. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Lozar. Is there any other uh, questions or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, we will move on to academic review items with our academic approval memo. Deputy Commissioner Teal, I think to you once again. Uh, I'm just doing a little bit of a time check, and I'm, I'm just trying to be sensitive to wh the length of this item, if it's quick. Uh, Regent Dobrowski, this is the fastest item on the agenda, oh, and I would suggest that we break after this item as Excellent. we have more time for ours after Excellent. lunch. Thank you. Uh, Regent Dobrowski, Regent Yeager, um, our, our academic approval memo brings to the regents kind of the second stage of the process that you heard earlier in this agenda. So you hear the request to plan items, we provide feedback from OCHI, from campuses, from, from you. Campuses then enter and do a lot more work to develop budgets, curriculum, the materials they need for accreditation changes, uh, as well as other changes that the board has delegated to the commissioner's office or to the campuses. And so this is encapsulates and captures all of that much more detailed information that happens on monthly uh, chief academic officer calls 
and updates uh, kind of our, our curriculum uh, and program map at the system and, and institutional levels. Always happy to dive into uh, the great amount of detail that is in this memo, and, uh, but it's here for your information. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Madam Chair, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Regent Yeager. Um, I, I just have to say, uh, again, a note, this, this is outstanding work and detail, and so I, I, was, I thought others might have questions, which is why I was thinking it might take longer, but the detail in there, I think, probably for most of us, answered, answered any questions we might have. So appreciate the work that goes into that. I just don't ever like to jump over this, because this is, this is very real uh, and, and credible work of, the, of this system. So thank you. All right, with that, it is uh, 11.58. And uh, we will break now for lunch, and we will return back uh, promptly at 1.30 for the remainder of the ARSA agenda. Thank you. Good afternoon. I think I'll try to bring us back together, please. Gave you an extra long break. I just duly noted somehow, hopefully, that there'll be some payback along the way. Not sure how, but... Um, Happy to do that, and I, I saw Dr. McLean up there. Oh, she's ready, and so I'm just like. <laughs> so we will um, commence with our meeting again, and uh, we'll finish up with the ARSA committee business. So Chair Yeager, to you, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. We had a wonderful conversation with our students, listening to some of the amazing things they're working on that I'll touch on a little bit later. But as we move into our strategic priority items, we have, um, Angela McLean here with an American Indian Movement report. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Regent Yeager, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Great to be here with you at the University of Montana Western this afternoon. What I'm going to do this afternoon as far as the American Indian and Minority Achievement Report is, first of all, walk uh, through some of our fast facts about our AMA data. Second, I will recognize and thank our dedicated AMA council members. And then finally, I would draw your attention to the new AMA recommendations that are attached in your agenda online and discuss why they are so important. But first, I'd like to circle back to some of the data. One of the most important things I think that is happening right now is we're seeing strong enrollment growth. And one of the pieces that I pointed to last fall is this enrollment growth is happening on almost every single campus, year in and year out. Uh, one of the things that we noted yesterday when I met with this campus's AMA Council in particular was the fact that their AMA numbers have grown uh, so strategically over the last few years, and it's almost a straight line. So quite remarkable work happening here, but it is happening across the Montana University system. And one of the things that is important with that is it's happening across the system, but we're also bucking national trends. At a time last year when American Indian student enrollment nationally declined by a percentage point, this is what we saw across your MUS. Uh, second, we have more American Indian graduate students on our campuses than ever before in the university system, and an increase of a quarter, 25% uh, over the last decade. And then finally, American Indian student retention has grown over 10 percentage points over the last decade. And we all heard Regent Lozar loud and clear when he talked about the importance of accelerating these efforts. And I can tell you that the AMA Council and all of us at the Office of the Commissioner are dedicated to doing exactly that. And we think that uh, while rolling up our sleeves as a team, along with your dedicated AMA Council members, that we can get to a different place in short order. And with that, I would like to recognize and thank all of the AMA Council members who come from campuses across the university system and they contribute to the important conversations that I think are leading to the strategic data growth that we're seeing across our campuses year in and year out. We also have partners from our tribal college system on our council. Additionally, we have our partners from our K-12 schools. And so if you would just take a moment, take a look, and say thanks to all of those good team members uh, from your campus and those across the system for the great work and the leadership that they provide as a part of this strong effort to, around American Indian enrollment growth, retention growth, completion growth, all kinds of things. And with that, the AMA Council has worked tirelessly over the last year or so on a set of new recommendations that I 
asked you to open up at the beginning of the presentation that are in your packet. We now have eight recommendations, and I'd like to provide some color, as Regent Lozar called it, to just a couple of the changes to the recommendations. Right now, we have five recommendations that each of our campuses, year in and year out, develop action plans around, and then they submit them to us. Then we put them on the website so that there's accountability, there's clarity to external stakeholders like our tribal colleges as to who they need to reach out to, et cetera. And just a couple of changes that I'd like to highlight here. The first one is the inclusion of Article 10 of the Constitution. The council thought that that key piece is critical to everyone's understanding of the importance of the work that we as a council and that all of us are trying to do in the Montana University system around American Indian student success. Next, we outlined a clear vision and mission statement. Next, we included American Indian student retention and completion goals as part of recommendation number one. We thought that that was really important uh, that campuses had those and they were outward facing so that everyone on their campus as well as folks from across the state understood what folks were aiming at. Next, the addition of employment and career services because we recognized the need to attract and retain American Indian students, uh, faculty, and staff all across our campuses and in all of our employment ranks. Additionally, we added the word qualitative to our uh, collection of the quantitative data asks that we've been asking our campuses to provide. And then one of the other pieces that we think is unique uh, to Montana is the inclusion of American Indian voice in the search processes. And one of the things that we've done is go live with these recommendations and at the same time offer practices on the website for our campuses to look to as they seek to, in this instance, provide American Indian voice in a search process. And it doesn't necessarily mean having an American Indian faculty, staff, or student on every search committee, but it does mean perhaps engaging them in different ways, and we've offered some practices around that. And then finally, the last one I think really engages so much of what you heard this morning around Apply Montana, FAFSA completion data, to support American Indian student access and enrollment on our campuses. It's not just enough to get them to apply to one or more of our campuses, as you heard was happening from Director Lemon this morning, but then we need to take that data and support our American Indian students to greater FAFSA completion and ultimate enrollment on our campuses in our classes and then finally to greater retention and greater completion. And so we're asking for our campuses to develop a plan around those pieces. And so these recommendations are very important and I outlined some of the reasons for that importance in my next slide. First of all, they inform campus-based action plan development. And again, you can see those after June 5th on the Montana University System website. Next, they provide for a structured focus for all of our campuses. And I think we're seeing the outcomes of that structured focus, especially as we look to two of our data points, enrollment and retention. And then finally, it's designed uh, to grow our data use and examination in, in a strategic way and make sure that everyone is opening up the American Indian Student Success Dashboard and taking a look and seeing where we sit as a campus, uh, as individual campuses, and also as a Montana University system. So good things are happening. And just a couple of things that I would just like to highlight before I close out the report. Uh, one, the tribal uh, relations reports uh, will open up from the governor's offices and our uh, governor's office and our campuses always do remarkable work uh, on that and those will go live as well around July. Uh, next, we have uh, a tribal college tour planned. Deputy Commissioner Teal and I will hit the road in April and we will visit the tribal colleges. Uh, next, we have the AIM action plans due on June 5th. And then finally, uh, thanks to a great connection made uh, between me and uh, Hila Shimon uh, by Regent Bao, um, we have several of our educator prep programs uh, engaging in a partnership with, uh, Sheila, uh, with Gila around uh, an NSF grant. And so, uh, and we're engaging the tribal colleges uh, through that effort. So a lot of great work continues to happen on this front. And with that, uh, Regent Yeager, Madam Chair, I would open it up to uh, any questions that the board might have. Thank you, Dr. McLean, and my apologies for misspeaking. I believe I called it the American Indian Movement, not Minority Achievement. But to these national trends that you guys are bucking, I just want to really highlight the work you guys are doing and the impact that it is making. It's truly evident in these statistics that we're doing a lot of things right, and we continue to make changes to do more right. I think that's, uh, we're putting ourselves on an excellent trajectory. Thank you. If there's any questions or comments from other regions? Yes, 
Uh, thank you, Chair Yeager. And uh, just to piggyback, I think you said it really, really well. Like, I, we are bucking the trends with regard to sort of increasing uh, student success of our native population in Montana. And it, that is not uh, happenstance. This has been very structured, very uh, well thought through for a number of years. Um, I think that maybe the biggest part of the success is the inclusion of native voices through the AMA Council to help guide uh, Ochi's office in, in doing this work. I I will tell you, I've had lots of different universities in the last year uh, say, what are you guys doing there? Um, so obviously it's, we're bucking the trends and we see it, but people are noticing some of these great outcomes. So uh, kudos as always. Um, I, I did wanna just riff on just this, um, I think the number two recommendation in the attachment, and I don't think there's, to my knowledge, any uh, updates to that, um, but it's the point of contact. And that is one of the things that I've shared with um, the other universities that have asked me about the Montana success is that in addition to having EMA and having the structured process, having a native that understands Indian country at a high level on each of the campuses is probably what's driving a lot of this change. And I know that was something the council did seven years ago, six years ago, and I think we're seeing some of the, the positive output. Um, so something that I think we should raise, continue to raise as a top priority of the AMA Council and a top priority for the campuses. If you wanna see these kinds of outcomes, having the voice at the table is, is really, really important. Um, and with, with regard to the last recommendation, rec recommendation number eight, um, more, more of a general comment, you know, when we were having the conversations years ago about a central app and the power of a central app, the efficiency of a central app, you know, we talked a lot about data and having centralized data and being able to go through the CAS now and having the access to the data very, very early on in the process allows us as a system to provide curated interventions for a wide variety of different types of student applicants and be able to support them along the way. Right now we're talking about native students, but there's so much additional power to be able to meet the needs of, of students who are applying that have, have, dif have different needs specifically. So with regard to supporting them through FAFSA, supporting them through their decision on admissions is, is really important. So I, I, I hope that we can, as campuses, really develop these plans in really thoughtful ways and, and use a the AMA Council as a kind of a central ground to um, share some of those ideas. So more commentary than anything, uh, huge kudos to you and everyone who's contributed. Thank you, Regent Lozar, some excellent comments. Any others? Well, thank you, Dr. McLean, and I think we keep you at the podium as we move to our next item, uh, college access updates. Thank you so much, Regent Yeager, Madam Chair, members of the board. So this presentation is about a college access in the Montana University system, and as part of this presentation, I'm going to walk you uh, through the three competitive federally funded college access grants that we house at the Office of the Commissioner. Then we're gonna discuss uh, the current initiatives that are grant funded or staff supported. Um, and then finally, I'm going to share some of our potential statewide initiatives under the Gear Up grant that we're looking to uh, apply for right now. And so moving into this presentation, uh, the Montana University System houses three federal college access programs, ETS, Gear Up, and Educational Opportunity Center. The EOC, this is the very first time that the system office has ever had it. Between these grants, we get about $5 million each year, and I oversee a team of 19 OCHI-based and remote employees to do this college access work through each of these programs. And some of the things that happen as a result of the staffing of these three programs uh, are the delivery of the ACT to all of Montana's high school juniors, and that's been as a result of the Gear Up grant, and that, as you have read, uh, is coming to a conclusion this year as a result of the fact that we'll be applying for a new Gear Up grant. And if we could move to the next slide. We also um, support uh, the pre-ACT for high school sophomores, and so we manage the contracts, et cetera, with the OPI on, on all of that. 
And then outreach to high schools to support college application weeks. And really, that is when about two-thirds of all of the applications come in to apply Montana. And it's an exciting and a busy time, I think, for the portal, but also for our campuses. Uh, we're working diligently to augment the efforts of Director Lemon around FAFSA completion. And then right now, we're talking to our high school counselors about making sure that their high school seniors are deciding and committing to your campuses uh, each and every day. And so these efforts would not happen without the staffing of these, the, these three federal programs. And then finally, uh, Gear Up has been a strong contributor to uh, the One Two Free program as it uh, continues to exist and provide strong support to our campuses. Now, the Gear Up grant is a seven-year grant, as I have indicated, and uh, it does expire on September 30th of this year. We did learn last Friday that the Gear Up grant is open, and we have a team back at the office, along with Deputy Commissioner Teal and I, and, and we are working diligently to put ourselves in a good place to hopefully be refunded once again. And uh, some of the potential initiatives that we might see uh, with that um, would be uh, definitely an interest in, in continued support for, for one, two, free. We'd like to see some student support uh, efforts. Um, and uh, we just really look forward to, to making sure that we're working and connecting uh, more strategically with the Apply Montana team and uh, their communication with our high school students and uh, with our high school counselors on everything from uh, college application weeks uh, and FAFSA completion and decision day activities. And so we look forward to uh, rolling up our sleeves over the course of the next uh, 60 days and putting in a very competitive um, application and bringing back good news to you uh, in late summer or early, or early fall on that. And so really that's kind of what the college access picture looks like from the office of the commissioner. And that's some of the good work that's happening by our team that's uh, there at the office and uh, a lot of the folks uh, in the remote parts of our Big Sky State doing that important work, supporting folks uh, in middle school and high school to better understanding of post-secondary opportunities as well as the adult learners through EOC. Thank you, Dr. McLean. As always, a great presentation and just very evident of all the work that you and your team have put into this and some very exciting updates. Uh, one question that I would have, um, what demographic of student are we still struggling most to reach? Is it more uh, a population of students or is it some uh, demographic of small schools that we're most struggling and getting these resources to? Regent Yeager, uh, Chair Dombrowski, uh, members of the board, one of the things that I think Regent Bow touched on this morning is that we are, and I think that we always have, uh, been able to reach a consistent population. Those that are probably, uh, those students that know that they're going to be college going probably as young as first or second grade, right? And we get them, and they're applying to the portal. Um, and I would offer that uh, the students that we need to uh, work harder at attracting and make sure that they understand that Apply Montana is for them as well, are those students who are looking for those short-term workforce credentials. I, I think that there is a disconnect between a lot of students and their families about what we offer in the Montana University system and the understanding that the access point to all of those workforce development opportunities is the Apply Montana portal. So I would tell you that's who I think we need to be working with to communicate that conversation better. Thank you. It's great to see how many of these items have aligned today on our agenda and how they all kind of complement each other and what we're working towards in the Montana University system. Are there any other questions or comments from the board? So just a practical question. Are all three of these grant funded, all three of these college access programs grant funded? Madam Chair, yes, they are. Yes. So gear ups due in September and the other two, I don't know, that always is kind of worrisome to me, but maybe maybe I shouldn't be worried about it. But, but you know, you have to submit. I wonder if we didn't get gear up again. Like, what would happen? Well, we have uh, made sure, Madam Chair, members of the board, we have made sure that uh, clear communication has gone out to every single one of those 15 schools that mm -hmm. we partner with that are K-12 schools all across the mm -hmm. state. Uh, we have made sure that clear communication has gone out to each of our post-secondary campuses that we partner with for our first-year services. We've also made sure that we've had clear communication with every single one of our vendors that we have long-standing contracts with. 
um, as well as our internal team members. Um, but I will tell you that uh, when it comes to folks who are seasoned uh, at uh, writing uh, these proposals and folks who understand the federal grant landscape, especially as it pertains to college access, uh, I think we have the A-team. Uh, and uh, when they asked me, what are you looking for when we hire a gear up director, I said, I'm looking for somebody who can not only lead the program, but somebody who knows the landscape and would be ready on day one to submit the grant. Yeah, yeah that's helpful. Thank you. Regent Nebraska, Regent Yeager, if I, if I might. I want to just add one thing to that, which is uh, I'm really glad we have the A team and that they've done some good preparation and some good focus. It is a shifting grant landscape. That's some of the story behind um, the discussion around the ACT is that federal priorities change, what these grants can fund change, and so we need to be thinking and planning ahead about our infrastructure internal to the OT office and where we want to focus our priorities. Uh, and that's part of why we wanted to bring that to you today is those priorities that can be funded through these federal grants have to be focused and limited and kind of aligned with our purposes as a system. And the Gear Up grant in particular uh, supports staff, uh, supports, has supported major statewide initiatives that are pretty central to some of our outreach to high school counselors to communicate college access resources broadly. And so um, I, I'm confident that we have the team and the work in place to be successful on this grant. They are competitive. And, and that's why that's important because that team is a key cog in the machine, both of driving those communications, funding some of those uh, statewide initiatives, one, two, free, ACT, and then also providing kind of in-person services in communities that otherwise would lack. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Any others? Thank you, Dr. McLean. Always appreciate hearing from you. As we move into our last item on the ARSA committee, MUS Teaching Scholars, I think we'll call Christine Miller to the podium. Uh, Chair Yeager, members of the committee, uh, I'm very pleased today to um, share an announcement about this year's selected MUS Teaching Scholars with you. Um, this is the first announcement that's gone out about this cohort, so I'm really glad to be able to do that live in person. Before we get to our selected teaching scholars for this year, I want to tell you a little bit about what this program is and why it's important to our system. Uh, the MUS Teaching Scholars started, I think, in 2019. This is our fourth cohort of uh, faculty. The program uh, was developed to acknowledge and elevate high quality teaching in the Montana University system um, and is really intended to uh, uh, sort of emphasize our commitment to teaching as the core of what we do. Um, the program also, uh, while it seeks to acknowledge and recognize faculty for their excellence in teaching, it also seeks to grow those good teaching practices. Each year we choose a theme that is related to uh, needs in our system related to teaching and learning, uh, trends in the national teaching and learning landscape, uh, areas that are of particular interest uh, to our system, and we select faculty, uh, select from a group of faculty who apply, um, and Sue can talk a little bit about that. Um, and then those selected faculty lead groups of other faculty at their campus in developing and exploring and implementing these really high quality evidence-based teaching practices. So it's both a way to acknowledge, elevate, and also spread um, the kinds of good teaching that we want to see happen in the system. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Sue Walter Wrights to talk a little bit about this year's theme and some of the examples of the kinds of work that this year's cohort is focused on. Sue? Thank you, Christine. This year's theme really came to us as a lightning bolt based on just the conversations that have happened around campuses and around the state, and it is artificial intelligence in the classroom. And the goal is, 
that this is clearly a disruptor of higher education in a way that we haven't seen in a lot of years. And the original impetus of faculty was really about um, academic integrity. And our goal in this theme is to move beyond what we're calling the syllabus and think about the best ways to integrate um, artificial intelligence as a way for, to prepare students once they're through. And the, um, we had an incredibly rich set of applications and some of the uh, topics that we're seeing include ensuring equity across disciplines in learning about academic or AI, um, exploring the ethics of AI, creating personalized learning environments, embedding chatbots to help students in, uh, in any particular class, developing AI literacy, and one of the ones that I'm really excited about is creating OERs that can be shared across the system so that faculty can integrate uh, AI in while thinking about the, the controlling questions of AI. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Director Miller to unveil this year's cohort. Thank you, Sue. Um, so, and if we could go to the next slide, I am going to read the names. I'm very pleased to share with you um, the selected teaching scholars for this year and acknowledge the truly excellent faculty and uh, educators that we are lucky enough to have in our system. Uh, Blaine Barrington from Montana Technological University from the Chemistry Department, Kendra Campbell from the Writing and Development, Developmental Humanities from Gallatin College, Jason Clark, uh, who does research analytics optimization and data services through the MSU library and has proposed a joint proposal. I'm gonna go out of order here a little bit with Taylor Mormon, who's an instructional technology librarian at MSU. Carrie Dale Huff uh, the edu in educational theory and practice from MSU Billings. Charles Denny, who teaches English at Miles Community College. Sam Downs, again, English at Great Falls College, who's working with um, Jana Parsons, who I think, oh, oh, Jana was here earlier today. <laughs> she left. Uh, uh, Jana Parsons, also in English, uh, who's working with Great Falls College. Uh, that joint proposal um, is going to do a campus-wide faculty learning community around their general education courses. So it's really high impact at that institution. Gwen Hart, again in English from MSU Northern. Christian Glide from Business and Technology here at UM Western. Chris Dr. Glide, are you here? Uh, well, if you see him, congratulate him. Uh, Karen Henderson, General Education at Helena College. Uh, Taylor Mormon, again, is with Jason Clark at MSU. Uh, John Pinnell, Computer Systems Technology at City College. Amy Reddo Parks from the Writing and Public Speaking Center, and also a faculty member who teaches uh, and runs many of our developmental writing classes at University of Montana. Uh, Jana Parsons, again, Great Falls College, and Rebecca Tyler, Mathematics, Great Falls College. Uh, please join me in giving these wonderful faculty a round of applause. Uh, so I'm just gonna conclude by sharing a little bit about what they will do. These groups of faculty will run faculty learning communities at their institutions during the fall 2024 semester. Eight to 10 faculty will participate in each of those. They will test out, learn about, uh, put into practice in their own classrooms, many of the themes and strategies and topics that Sue mentioned. Um, and then they will share kind of a, a white paper of learnings about that experience from that group of faculty to be available across the system. This is really important uh, just as a learning community generally, but this year in particular, our theme of AI in the classroom, um, that communal learning and that ability to kind of spread knowledge and experience across the system is the number one uh, challenge that our work group has so far identified in thinking about how to deal with AI. So I'm really pleased that we're kind of jumping ahead and getting a start on uh, doing some of the work that that task force has identified as necessary for our system as we encounter this emerging technologies. Um, so thank you very much, uh, and I'm again, congratulations to our selected scholars for this year. Thank you, Director Miller. What a great recognition of some amazing individuals as they work to better these chances for learning opportunities and professional development. Did they know? Like, is this the first time, or do they, did they know? They just <laughs> got an email, I 
prepared it okay. and sent it out right before this. So this is the big announcement. Nice. So please, uh, please do share and, and recognize for uh, recognize our faculty for, for this award. An actual follow-up question. I want to make sure I heard you right. So the work that will be done here mm -hmm. will get connected with the larger AI. I don't know. I don't know the name of that group, but the one that that we chose. Yeah. Okay. Regent Dombrowski, what I'll say is uh, that the AR working group that we've convened of provosts, this is one I think of many uh, different places where AR work will be embedded in parts of what we do as a system. That will be policy, that will be um, uh, uh, operations. When it came to thinking about AI's impacts on teaching and learning and on curriculum, what we've heard from that group was, a little bit what we heard in our faculty breakfast, A, faculty uh, are, in the post-COVID era in particular, are feeling like their plates are very full. And AI feels like a big, scary thing that's hard to wrap our arms around. Uh, and adding that to a full plate uh, often drives us to the most limited questions of, uh, academic integrity, cheating, which are important questions to address, but not nearly the most important questions when it comes to the potential impact here. Uh, and so that is where this is uh, one piece, I think, of many ideas that have been discussed in the gr that group, have been discussed in other working groups, stood up at the campus level or affiliation level. But thinking about how do we focus some of our resources in these places, our resources across teaching and learning centers, uh, across campuses, to build and invest in structures that give faculty the time, the recognition, those who are taking this leap in a time when there is a lot on their plate, um, to, to recognize that bravery and that expertise, but also to help them support their colleagues in coming up with good and innovative ways to react to use, incorporate this new technology, and also provide feedback to us all as to where there are um, dangers, limitations, equity implications in terms of access to technology that we need to be thinking about and addressing. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Any other questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, that will wrap up our ARSA committee. Thank you, Director Miller. Uh, as we wrap up the ARSA committee, I'd like to focus a little bit on the student affairs side and acknowledge some of our amazing student leaders that we have across the state. I can't stress enough how important student leadership is in all areas of the Montana University system. It's what has me in this chair today working through ASUMW and with Mass, and I have been so blessed with the privilege to work with some amazing leaders this year, if they'd be willing to stand up if they're in the room. Uh, they've done some great work on trying to revitalize student government and find these barriers that are keeping them from the significant impact that they're capable of. As I've attended some national conferences, I found that Montana is very unique in the fact that we have a statewide student government that does just tremendous work in lobbying at the legislature, working towards policy, advocating here at the Board of Regents, and it's all to these students that will one day be in seats like this and some great positions of power, leadership, and impact in their communities for the rest of their lives. So thank you all for the tremendous work that you do. With that, I think Regent Buchanan has a few closing remarks that he'd like to say. Uh, thank you, Chair Yeager. Um, fantastic job running this meeting and your reference to amazing student leaders. You certainly fall in that category. Great job today. Um, I like the conversation about AI, and I thought Deputy Commissioner Teal's summary of where it sits as a priority with Anochi um, is important to point out and point out that it's consistent with members of this committee's top priorities. Um, you, Chair Yeager, in a couple of our debrief meetings have repeatedly com commented that this needs to be a focus. Regent Bao, um, you've clearly stated this needs to continue to be elevated. So, so thank you for that and um, a commitment from this committee to continue to keep that front and center. Um, and then just to echo your comments from this morning, uh, Chair Yeager, 
to all of, of Deputy Commissioner Teal and Ochi's team and the academic teams on each of these campuses, the amount of work to bring these information items and action items um, to us in the, in the fashion that they are. The work to get that done is not lost on us and can't thank you all enough for the tremendous amount of work that's, that you put into it. Thank you, Chair Yeager. Thank you, Regent McCannon. With that, we will close the ARSA committee for today and come back tomorrow morning to vote on our action items. Madam Chair, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Regent Yeager, and I would echo you. You did a great job chairing today and um, really leading the students. And so um, for that, I'm personally grateful. And uh, I know as board, we're, we're proud of you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair Buchanan's feeling the heat. Uh, <laughs> Wait, I don't, I don't know that he heard that. Would you repeat that, yeah, Regent Bow? Yeah, I think uh, ex-Chair Buchanan is feeling the heat from <laughs> Chair Yeager. I, I gladly set the gavel in Garrett's lap. You did a great job. All right. Uh, so I'm going to take the liberty of uh, giving us another break, although it might seem early. Um, we'll call, I'll call you back here in about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll, that will give us time to get uh, set up, and then we'll move to the Budget Committee. So if you can return uh, by about 25 after 2, uh, I'd appreciate it, and then we'll turn over to Chair Lozar. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to call us back to order, please. So thanks again, um, Regent Yeager, for the nice leadership of the ARSA. Uh, great, great agenda and items, and we'll move now to the Budget and Audit Committee, and I'll turn it over to Chair Lozar, please. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. We've got a uh, pretty diverse agenda this afternoon in the uh, Budget Committee. Uh, a number of items in consent. Um, action items cover uh, quite a few authorizations to either plan and design or construct uh, facilities on campuses. And then our information uh, agenda is also a bit eclectic, um, kind of helping to start the conversation about building a, a budget for the legislative session, as well as getting into a couple additional facilities-related items. Um, so I think it's going to be a, a pretty busy uh, committee this afternoon. Um, let's just start with the, the consent um, agenda. Just curious if anyone has any items that they want to move down and talk, talk about a little further. All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the action agenda. And I know Deputy Commissioner Trevor will be assisting as well as Director Lyons on uh, the remainder of our agenda today. So maybe kick it over to, to Tyler to tee up the first action item. Sure, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In fact, Director Lyons is gonna take all of the action items and just kind of walk through each one of those. That sounds good. All right, Director Lyons. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, the first item up on the action item to, or action agenda for today is a request for authority to construct main campus parking at the University of Montana. Uh, this is part of UM's larger student master life plan that they've had in place for quite a while. What they're working on is adding some additional parking so that they can work forward for some other projects in the future on, on campus. Um, part of that project will be talked about later. Deputy Commissioner Trevor will tee up a presentation on that later. Um, but this parking really provides some essential spaces on campus for students during any construction times um, that are much needed throughout the campus. Construction will take place hopefully this summer with this approval, and it's paid for with capital operating bond funds. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll stand for questions on this one. Uh, thank you, Shauna. Any questions? Yes, Chair You Nebraska. happen to have a visual. Madam Chair, I do. Um, attachment two to this item is a visual of where the, the identified parking locations will be on campus. So the yellow identified locations throughout campus. Um, I'm really bad at directions. So <laughs> over by Beckwith Street, the long strip over there, and then by the UC, you'll see some tennis courts that will be replaced with some parking locations. Um, some essential areas throughout campus just to provide additional parking spaces. So the yellow, in essence, are the, the new parking. The identified locations, correct. 
Has there been any consternation about the tennis courts? Madam Chair, I think probably a little bit. I know that they've got quite a few tennis courts, but I will defer that over to President Bodner. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And Madam Chair and Mr. Chair. Uh, no, I mean, we've, we've gone through a process. We've talked with Grizzly Athletics around that. And, and you know, for the board's information, that the two lots by the, by the Champion Center there and by um, Aberhall on the, uh, I guess that is the west side of campus, north is to the left on this side to orient everybody. Uh, we may make some minor adjustments in the location of those um, to uh, adapt and complete some of the work on Memorial Road, so on the north side of campus <clears throat> right there. Um, but those are, those are plans in flex. I just want the, be, the board to be aware that, that we're listening to campus feedback and we're making some tweaks here to get additional surface parking in a geographically constrained area. Good question. Any other questions or comments? Um, I had just one one comment, um, certainly in support of this. Um, I know this parking has been a conversation at the university for, for a number of years, so I'm glad to see us taking the steps to be able to um, increase parking opportunities. I did have the opportunity at lunch um, engaging with several of the students that um, attend University of Montana, and they had mentioned that um, some of the conversations with regard to parking constraints have lessened um, in the past uh, six months or so with some coordination with the registrar's office, um, coordinating where the classes are taking place or certain courses are taking place, you know, the inclusion of heated bus stops and uh, kind of the, the list went on and on. So that was great to hear. So hearing uh, less lesson constraints plus uh, more capacity for parking, I, I think will be, will be huge. And, and Mr. Chair, if I, if I may, just one point of reference. Our, our current parking utilization is about 79%. And uh, Chair Lozar, your, your, your point is spot on. Peak utilization is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. <laughs> when everybody wants to have class. So it's been a, a mix of trying to, to, to plan schedules and, and, and increase utilization at different times outside of that peak area and additional bus routes and these lots, we think we can, we can ease it. But we also recognize that over the longer run, and, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, that that some vertical structures are, are necessary. Thank you, President Bodner. All right, I think we can move on to uh, plan and design of the clap building renovations. These next several items are kind of tied together. All of these are part of the long range building and planning program that comes out of House Bill 5 appropriations from last session. This first one is a request for authorization to plan and design renovations to the clap building at UM. The clap building, as many of you may know, is one of the largest science buildings on campus. It's in definite need of some renovations. Several of the floors have gone through renovations. This request is to utilize a portion of their funding received from LRBP. They're requesting to spend $4 million in order to do the planning and designing of this building. A request for construction will come at a later date, but the overall goal of this project would be just to do general renovations in the building, upgrade the mechanical, upgrade the classroom so that they're more modernize, um, provide better teaching labs for the students as well. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll stand for questions on this item. Are there any questions or comments? All right, uh, let's move on to C. This next item is a request for authorization to plan and design the Flathead Lake Biological Station water and sewer systems through U of M. Also a funded project through LRBP, they received $2.5 million and they're requesting to spend $300,000 for the planning and design for the new water and sewer systems. There's an existing project right now with Flathead Lake Biological Station for a water treatment system and this ties into kind of a second phase, if you will, with that, with replacing some of the lines, um, adding some supply water issues, purification, to help enhance the systems there at Flathead Lake Biological System, or Station, sorry. And again, a construction request will come at a later date. Any questions? Okay, let's move on to D. This request is for authorization to construct the campus storage building here at UM Western. Um, typically, we would bring planning and design first, but there's a timing issue with this project. Um, last, the prior session, Block Hall received funding for renovations, but as Chancellor Reed mentioned earlier today, 
the campus storage warehouse building is in critical need in order to move forward with the block hall renovations. So we need to move forward with planning, design, and construction all at once with this request of $1.25 million. Any questions? Chair Dombrowski? And this is funded, usually have it at the end, and I, maybe it just isn't. Madam Chair, with LRBP funding again. These all will be LRBP funding. My apologies for not saying that. All right, moving on to Main Hall at Montana Tech. Okay, our next item, go back to planning and design. This is a request for authorization to design the renovations for Main Hall at Montana Tech. They also received $30 million from the last legislative session for LRBP to renovate their main hall. This is one of the oldest buildings on their campus um, in great need of some renovations and upgrades to provide ADA, ADA accessibility, upgrade to their classrooms, renovations to restrooms, again, electrical, mechanical, pipe fittings, all of that throughout the building in order to make it more of a welcoming facility for students, staff, and visitors to the campus. Um, there'll be a lot of upgrades as well to the exterior. They will bring a request for construction at a later date as well, and this is also funded by LRBP funding. Any questions on this one? We can move on to the engineering hall. Okay, the next request is also for Montana Tech. This is a request for authorization to design renovations to engineering hall. Tech also received $8 million in the last legislative session of LRBP funding. Um, they're requesting to spend $1.2 million for planning and design. Engineering Hall, which was originally a gymnasium, is now housed for faculty offices, classrooms, and such. And they want to bring some much-needed renovations and ADA accessibility throughout the building, upgrades to restrooms, um, technology upgrades throughout the facility as well. Again, a construction request will come at a later date, and this is funded through all LRBP funding. I think we could probably move on to the last two items. This next item is a request for authorization to design infrastructure improvements, safety improvements, and research facilities at the Montana Ag Experiment Stations. This one's a little bit different than the others. We've grouped a couple of projects that were funded through LRBP together in this single item, as they will work together as part of the planning, design, and construction moving forward. Um, you can see that they received multiple sources of funding for projects, um, including with BART Farm for a new seed plant and soil processing facility, some funding to help renovate their lambing barns, um, funding for demolition of outdated facilities at the BART Farm, and then right now what we're doing is requesting to spend $1.5 million to do the planning and design to do all of those items that I just mentioned. These will be great improvements to our BART farm systems um, and our ag programs throughout the state, and a construction authority request will come at a later date, LRBP funding for this project as well, with a little bit of authority only from fundraised dollars. And our last item is a request for authorization to design the ag research labs at the Montana Ag Experiment Stations. This one, again, has a couple combination projects that we're putting all together. The reason for some of this, too, is with all of the projects that were funded through the LRBP process, there was a lot. And so working with A&E, we're trying to put them out in bundles in order to get the projects moving forward in a timely manner. So this is the reason that we're combining these. Um, two sessions ago, MSU received funding for a wool lab and for the research labs. Those projects are ongoing, but during the last session, they received additional funding because the research labs needed supplemental funding because of inflation factors. And then they also received a little bit additional funding for renovations and safety upgrades for shop facilities at the WARC. This request is to utilize $1.6 million for planning and design on these projects. Um, it'll help with space limitations, upgrading for research spaces, and then also there are six laboratories throughout the state of Montana that are connected with Maze that will have new upgraded research facilities, um, being able to provide better research opportunities um, for our ag communities throughout the state. A construction request will come at a later date, and this is all funded through LRBP funding. Excellent. Any any questions on that item or any of the other items? 
All right. Well, uh, thank you, Director Lyons. Oh, well, actually, I think uh, Todd has a question, but I, I just want to note at this pace, we should have you out of here in about six minutes. A um, little, little ahead of schedule. Um, I, that was I do want to. <laughs> I do want to mention, though, that, you know, of course, the, the committee meets in advance, and we walk through all of these with in, in, in much greater detail. And I think uh, one of the things that sort of jumps out with, with regard to these items is that connection to the LRBP uh, process and the funding, um, of which I'm assuming that's why we're having limited discussion uh, on each of these items. So I appreciate the, the committee putting in the time in advance. Um, to, that, to pose the questions that they had. And Mr. Chair, again, when the construction requests come, it'll be a much larger That's item right. of information for you as well. That's right. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Regent Buchanan, who I know had a kind of a broader question about um, these action items and, and LRBP. Okay. Yeah, Chair Lozar, thank you. And, and Director Lyons, appreciate the work and, and roll out of those. Um, I guess I just am looking for some, some macro comfort maybe from the budget office, not only at Ochi, but from within these campuses. Over the last couple of years, um, we've seen, I think it's fair to say, probably more than we're comfortable with um, requests for extended budgetary authority um, related to expanded costs on a lot of these projects. And clearly we're all aware of the inflationary cycle that we just went through. Um, but I don't know if you, Director Lyons or Deputy Commissioner Tyler, Trevor can can share. Have we modified how we're putting together these proposals? Are we are we communicating um, when we talk about these projects on an individual basis? Not as much related to the merit, but to the number that we're approving. Um, we've had some discussions where we've talked about that. You know, these numbers matter, mm -hmm. and we approve these numbers, and then to find ourselves revisiting for a request of extended authority. I don't think that's the pattern we want to maintain. Um, so I'm wondering, have we adjusted or do we have a, a feeling of, that we're grasping some of the budgetary expectations, not only for those that we just approved the planning process for, but as we look forward to the, the item in the, this committee about the future LRBP plans, mm -hmm. um, I'd love a little context from that, um, Director okay. Lyons or, or Deputy Commissioner Trevor, please. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll handle that. Uh, thanks for the question, Regent Buchanan. Um, the answer is yes, uh, broadly, that we have, as you see, every one of these items are a request for planning and design, and that we have implemented a new uh, operational requirement that all projects uh, will come to us planning the design first and construction second. It hasn't always been like that, and that has been the cause, at least one of the cause, uh, for um, projects that may have been at a lower amount uh, that, that we had to come back for and ask a request for an increase. But I do think we need to separate LRBP projects from our, our, our auxiliary projects that regions have complete authority to approve, um, whereas LRBP, are, uh, the authority comes from the legislature and the funding comes from the legislature. And just as a reminder, in this last session, um, a, a large chunk of our capital project funding came as a supplement which the state recognized the fact that the kind of the extreme environment we were operating in with inflation and the cost of supplies and, uh, and, and so on and so forth after um, COVID uh, created this downstream problem. And so we weren't alone in the fact that many of our projects that were assessed and uh, planned for before um, the kind of escalated costs needed to come back. Um, with that said, um, our auxiliary projects, um, we have taken uh, a much uh, closer look at, at the request of this board. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit when we talk about the um, projects that we have on the LRBP list and the uh, due diligence that we've done in order to come up with those dollar amounts and uh, the hiring of third party consultants to come in and help us assess those amounts. So um, in a nutshell, I would say, yes, we have changed. Um, we've uh, paid more attention to those dollar amounts and the state of Montana has recognized the fact that some of these projects needed extra funding. Um, and is that to say that we're uh, perfect and we've got it right? Uh, not necessarily, but um, we're trying and uh, I think we're making good progress. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lozar. That's all I've got. Actually, maybe to piggyback off of that, I'm just curious if you can speak to sort of cost stabilizing 
Um, you know, I know the last two or three years or t 2020 to 2023, it was pretty consistent rising costs. Are we kind of getting to that place where we're slowing down? Uh, Mr. Chair, just based upon CPI alone, I would say yes, we are. I mean, obviously, that doesn't affect uh, the cost of all um, goods, uh, the, though I, I believe that construction prices and uh, supplies have stabilized. Um, I'm sitting uh, with a guy to my left of me who probably could be a much more of an authority on that topic. Um, but I do think we've hit into a, at least a stabilizing zone where we're a lot more comfortable with the dollar amounts that we're putting forward. Excellent. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Shauna. Any other questions or comments about any of the action items? All right, let's move over to uh, information item A, performance funding allocations. I think, Tyler, you're going to walk us through this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a couple slides here. Most of you will recognize these. I feel, uh, though, it's probably important just to quickly move through them to ensure we are all on the same page of what performance funding is and what it isn't. And then I'll talk about the uh, amounts that the model has generated for this upcoming fiscal year. So just a brief bit of history. Um, it's an oversimplification, but it, it makes a point. From 1972 to 2014, the primary driver of the allocation of the, st of the state dollars that we receive has been enrollment. Enrollment size of campuses up and down uh, helps dictate the amount of funds that we allocate. Um, up until 2015, we're using enrollment only, uh, an input uh, measure. Following the development of performance funding in FY 2015, we added in uh, output metrics. And for the first year, uh, it came in as a $7.5 million amount, which is 5% of our state appropriations. And we did a fairly unsophisticated model based upon two metrics. They were the same metrics for all campuses. It was retention, which is the percent of students that come back for a second year, and then completions. Just counting up the number of awards that are uh, given out at graduation. Following that, we went into a uh, much more detailed development of a model, and we've been using that model that has been tweaked a few times since then. So FY16 to present, um, we've allocated $15 million through performance funding uh, and, the, and, and grew the complexity of our metrics. I'll talk about that real quick. The goals of this, um, has always been to increase degree production. And I guess there's three diff few different ways of saying that. It's also to um, incentivize campuses to improve student success. It puts a focus on the output. It clearly sends a message to the campuses what the regions and the system value. Um, and I think that if we, if, when you think about that as we walk through the metrics, these are communicating through quantitative measures, what's important to the university system. And then um, finally, connecting our finances to the outcomes is another way of saying it, pay for what we value. So there's about eight or nine primary principles. Uh, the first one is, is that the dollar amount for each campus is determined based upon the percent of resident students that they represent in the system. So we take an average of the past three years if you look at that top line, this is old from 17 to 19, just as an example. Uh, MSU Bozeman, without Gallantic College connected to it, as we separate out the embedded two-year campuses, represented about 35, 36% of the total system resident FTE. They then would be eligible to receive that exact same percent of the $15 million, which equates to about $5.3 million. And you can just do the math for every campus there. So as far as the metrics go, we have two primary metrics. Uh, they still are the same metrics, retention and completion for every campus. But based upon mission, we've identified additional metrics that have been added into each of the categories of flagship, four-year regional, and two-year campuses um, that better reflect the mission of the campus. So uh, for instance, with flagship campuses, we have retention and completion, but then we also measure graduate degrees uh, awarded as well as research expenditures. 
I'll talk about this more. As you can see at the bottom, there's underrepresented groups in retention and completion, and that's, that's an attribute we've added on um, along the way. So you can pick out your campus. You can take a look at the metrics on four-year campuses. It's retention or completion. Uh, a couple of them have dual enrollment added in. A couple of them counted uh, graduate completions. Two-year campuses have had kind of a, a more diverse set of metrics. It's reflective of their mission. Um, we get into dual enrollment. We also get into completion of gateway courses and credit accumulation um, as students progress. The underrepresented groups, as I mentioned, uh, for retention and completions, we split out um, these four categories of American Indian, Pell recipients, veterans, and non-traditional students. And we, we came up with this uh, great idea here. It was, it's based upon best practices. And, and this is one of the areas where I think we got it right, for sure. Um, we continue to, to evaluate and, um, and, and work to better understand these metrics, as we heard Director McLean talk about American Indians, that we are making progress sometimes in the performance funding model, though you will see that's an area that campuses um, have either excelled in or are still trying to make more improvement. Uh, the metrics are measured annually and compared to a three-year average, but the most important statement here is campuses compete against themselves. They don't compete against other campuses. So um, when you measure your success, it's based upon improvement over your three-year average. Um, for instance, you could take a look here at the top line, graduate degrees in this example, three-year average of 200. This campus, uh, sample campus had 210. That was a 5% increase which uh, becomes important as we increasingly get a little more complex in this model, and this is when you're starting to think, hey, this performance funding model is actually a little bit more uh, detailed than you might have thought. Um, that's because we employed some experts uh, and some very smart people who, who helped us when we had initially started this. I, I say that with a smile because Joe Thiel was one of them when he was a student region. So, um, and I like to share the blame for this model too. <laughs> Metrics are weighted, and so for each different type of campus, you can see if we look at the flagships, the, uh, the undergraduate uh, completions are at 30%, retention rates are at 30%, and so on and so forth. And for all campuses, the underrepresented groups uh, make up 5% of the total. They're then indexed to a standard scale of 1,000 points. And so 1,000, if you scored 1,000, would mean that you were the, your, your level where you're at is the exact same as what it's been for the past three years. We expect them to improve by 1%. So you have to beat 1,010 in each one of these metrics. And then we have a transitional loss zone. So it, when, you, when, when you don't reach an, a level of improvement for a metric, we don't just go in and take away all your money. We incrementally back off the amount of money uh, based upon a, a transitional zone that works um, a campus down so there's not just an abrupt cliff. cliff. And then finally, um, we provide opportunities for campuses that fall short of targets uh, to participate in system initiatives. Montana 10 is a good example of this. Um, another way of saying is we have residual funds that are left that are unallocated we then collect those at the system office and apply those to system initiatives and farm them back out to campuses in the name of improving retention and completion first and foremost, and it creates this symbiotic cycle. I'm not sure every campus can say symbiotic, but I like that term. Uh, these are some slides that just show you we're not alone in the United States here. There's a landscape of performance funding. I'll let you take a look at those in the name of Getting to the outcomes, and this will be the first um, edition of performance funding in, what, over 10 years that I've got away from my 1990-looking slides here, and I'm using updated technology to demonstrate, um, this is supposed to take me to my link, but maybe Ange will do that. If you click on that, um, it should take me to the dashboard. Yeah, get me to the dashboard. While we're getting to the dashboard, I'll give kudos where it's deserved. Uh, Eric Meredith in our office uh, is our dashboard guru. So as you see, our dashboards continue to expand and improve. And this is a big time one right here. 
that he spent a lot of time on it. I can't even imagine the programming that's back uh, on the back side of this. Um, it, it's really impressive. Eric's sitting over here. He doesn't get a lot of uh, a lot of mic time, but he's hugely appreciated and a valuable member of our office. Okay, so um, this is the primary out put page, you can glance through it and, and check out the campuses that, um, you know, the unallocated column over here would be, can't, you know, if you're at zero, that means you got all your money. If you have some dollars in an unallocated column, it means those are the funds that were held back. Um, we can take a look uh, at a drop down of all of the years back to 2015 and what they look like here. Um, Probably the most interesting is you can click into um, the performance funding scores by campus and quickly use these bars over here to identify where a campus was either improving or fell a little bit short. Um, I find this extremely easy to use. Uh, we have some line graphs down here. This is City College, for instance. You can track their scores, which remember, if they're over 1,010, it means you get to retain all of your performance funding dollars, and you can see where uh, City College has been quite successful over the years with minus one year of a dip there, um, and they're, they're running above that line. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions, go into any campus detail, and click on this dashboard. I don't know, for the next hour and a half, if that's the amount of time. That we have some time to make up, so. Maybe every regent has a question for Tyler. <laughs> uh, jokes aside, any questions or comments from for the one percent approval? Yeah, Regent Bow. <clears throat> so Tyler, just a, a question, a really big picture question. So, I, you know, this all happened before I became a regent. Um, it's taken me a few years to partially understand it, um, but. Are, are we accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish when you first laid this out you know, 10 or 12 years ago? Uh, Mr. Chair, well, I could go back to the goals slide and I would say absolutely we're accomplishing based upon those goals, uh, particularly the one that says pay for what we value. Uh, student success uh, is at the heart of, I, I mean, arguably, nobody will argue with the fact that that is the the key mission of the university system is to enable Montana residents to succeed. And we have, um, we can demonstrate that through the various metrics, retention rates in particular. I think if we go campus by campus, you'd see improvements across the board in retention. Uh, degree completions have been, uh, I guess, the, the struggle point. And those, as you might guess, are somewhat attached to enrollment. And it's no secret that we've, you know, pa post uh, the Great Recession and the kind of the flood that came back to higher education in 2012 and 13 um, has diminished along with the actual number of high school graduates. So uh, campuses have struggled. Those who have struggled have struggled in the area of increasing degree completions consistently. Um, but uh, thanks to the architects of this model, we weren't just measuring just that metric. We have multiple metrics and campuses had chances in other areas. Uh, to, to make up for those losses. Um, so uh, overall, uh, the, the next point I, would, I guess I would say is what we accomplished is, um, is clear communication and uh, accountability uh, to those folks that allocate those state dollars to us. Starts with the taxpayers, but obviously the legislature. Um, we are the only state agency that takes the, a chunk out of their appropriation and allocates it across its various components based upon performance. Um, and and we, we show the world our hand after we're done. And so we can evaluate and compare within campus trends over time, which I think is hugely valuable. Thank you. Uh, so what's the process for saying, well, you know, we've accomplished a couple of the goals um, and, and, and a couple are lagging. So how would we tweak the incentive system to, uh, you know, how do we modify this um, so that it's not stagnant for another decade, like to get more of what we want? Mr. Chair, Regent Bell, great question. Uh, if I would have said that to Regent Johnstone, he would have said, of, of course, I'm not going to ask anything but a good question. Um, th what I would say to that is um, we have, uh, 
that we have over time incrementally added in metrics as they became more relevant. Dual enrollment would be a good example of this. Initially, the f smaller four-year campuses, at least Western and Northern, uh, did not have that as one of their components, um, as one, two, free, and the whole kind of up uh, swell of dual enrollment came about, we added that in. Um, we've tweaked uh, numerous times the metrics associated with uh, developmental education as it relates to two-year education and our kind of approach to handling um, those students, and now we call it gateway uh, course success. So I guess the point I'm trying to get at there is that uh, besides retention and completion, which I would argue are never going to be complete. I don't, we won't sit in here in a day and say that's good enough. Um, you know, campuses uh, with amazing retention rates. I'd point out Montana Tech, uh, a retention rate over 80% and has been for the last 10 years, continues to progress in retention. So um, I don't think there's a limit to that. Um, and that's why, for a lot of reasons, I, I'm. I'm a, I'm a big fan of our metrics because they're grounded in two primary metrics. It'll be in higher education forever, but we have a freed up zone of other multiple measures that give this board a chance to adjust and, um, and, and a campus community that's you know ready and willing to try to digest those and, and fit them in. Thank you. So at the moment you have no recommended tweaks or enhancements to to the scores and the calculations. Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Bell, no, I don't. Um, we did this time, you don't, it doesn't come out fully here, um, that gateway course completion for the first time is, uh, has been implemented for all two-year campuses. We sort of uh, transitioned some campuses into that, but this go around every campus using that metric. So um, in essence, we have made a slight improvement, but right now I would say no. And Deputy Commissioner, what, what would you put on our radar as what might be next and, and potential timing? Mr. Chair, Regent Bell, uh, you know, I would rely a little bit on what we hear through the ARSA committee and these reports that come back through our different uh, sectors on emerging topics, um, areas of focus or of our interests, uh, you know, Montana 10 related type uh, areas. I, I mean, think about things that we might want to incentivize campuses for. Um, could be a host of different uh, topics. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I'm lacking the very specific one here at the moment, but um, I, I oftentimes have thought on a topic, wow, let's plug that into performance funding. If we want to ignite something in the system, it'll definitely communicate 100% from the regions that it's important. Uh, I, I just don't have a specific example. Great. I, and all I'm trying to do is uh, let you show off a little bit because it's a great result, <laughs> um, but also to encourage the idea that that we should be considering and rejecting and are accepting other valuation metrics, which I'm sure is happening. But I think it'd be helpful for the board to realize that that you know those kind of those kind of changes can be incorporated, right, to reflect our student body and what they want. Mr. Chair, if I could. I I guess a couple thoughts on that. A absolutely. And I think in the past, and we have modified it, we've taken, um, you know, input from campuses on areas that they feel are either unfairly measured or need to be measured different or just have changed over the years and, and where we want to put more focus. And then I, I think it's also a really good sort of July retreat conversation as we build out work plans, as we build out student success agenda, what, what's on board members' minds. and are there other things that we want to drive in that? And I, I make the last point just, you know, as we as we approach that, I think we need to think with and through the campus lens, but also, you know, through a board lens of what what is on the horizon that we may want to change um, over time. I think one of the success stories of this is that we haven't done anything too rapidly because if we change the formula every year, I think it's more about guessing and luck than it is about really driving performance changes. But um, yeah, I think that's a conversation we should continue and, and we do try to each year as we look at those success agenda items. And maybe also to, to piggyback off of that, having been on the board for a while and been a part of a number of different discussions with regard to performance funding and adjustments to 
or the addition of the new metrics, conversations about the weighting that um, they are almost exclusively driven by board involvement and board perspective of what we truly value. And I'm, I'm glad you underscored that, Tyler. So I do think there's, it's, it's always good to sort of reflect on what we have, what's working, what's not, what how higher education has changed, and is it appropriate for adjustments in the performance funding model down the road. Um, again, reflecting though on a number of conversations, what I've heard from the campuses and from OCHI is consistency is really important. Um, so not changing the model, not changing the formula year over year um, really helps them focus on the interventions that they put into place on campus and see those sort of bear fruit. So I think I would just urge us to be really thoughtful uh, in the long term of, of thinking about performance funding and in, any adjustments. Um, you know, I guess one area where I would have interest in us having a discussion is just looking at the weight, the weighting. Like, I think the metrics are spot on. Um, are the weight, is the weighting right? I don't know, I haven't put much thought into it, but um, it might be something that we discuss in the, in the summer. Um, I did wanna then answer your first question or add to what Tyler said, uh, is it working? How do we know it's working? And I, I think one of the things, one of the really positive byproducts of performance funding is the, the item in here um, and the, the slide deck around data collection and tracking. I think performance funding in many ways helped lead us to where we're at with these dashboards that we have as we were sort of forced, if we are going to measure something, we need to be able to do that and be transparent with it. And it really was the springboard for us to have one of the most robust data programs of any higher education system. And I think it really stemmed from performance funding. So I think that is a, a really, really positive, um, a positive byproduct. Maybe transitioning to a question that I, that I had, um, just more about performance funding shifts and changes nationally, and I know you kind of quickly skipped over that slide, um, but I'm just, I'm just curious if, as you've tracked and if you have tracked sort of shifts in performance funding, if you see um, different metrics being put into place, um, you know, maybe since the pandemic, as higher education has seen some shifts, and then um, I think you're spot on in the sense that there is no magic number with regard to how much money we should be putting into performance funding. But if there's any sort of shifts and change nationally, if those, those percentages um, have changed over time, I think we're at 7.5% or 5% right now, where are we tracking with regard to other states? Mr. Chair, now those are some great questions. I'm not gonna be able to answer them uh, in complete uh, thought, I suppose. I'm not in touch with uh, the exact um, distribution of state allocations, for instance, that are put in. I, we do have uh, a couple year old data, and I have some bullets here that list those. Um, but let's start, I guess, with the 7.5% of our appropriations that we put in, because after, um, you know, going down the road of establishing it at 7.5 million, which was 5% then, and we kind of locked into the $15 million amount and got away from an, a percent of our budget. Uh, the, a lot of that came from feedback from the campuses and the, the tri just the, tricky the trickiness of budgeting uh, every year for an amount that you're not positive you're going to receive. Um, and, and now, performance funding is pulled out from the lump, but by nature, when you allocate it, um, th the lump that goes to a campus base, and so you're counting on that base, and whether that's right or wrong, um, that's how campuses have dealt with these dollars. So I, I would be real reluctant to up or move the percent. I think we've hit the sweet zone, and that sweet zone, how do you know you're in the sweet zone? I think you're there when um, you, you put enough dollars in to get everybody's attention and create an interest around the topic. And there's no doubt about it, we have that. Um, and from there on, I don't know when it becomes a, a, an adverse penalty and downward spiral and so on and so forth happens. So I would argue, I think we're at the sweet spot and it might be the reason why I'm not quite as in touch with what other states have done. Um, I do know states where you see large percentages. I mean, you can see there, there'll be a chart somewhere that says there's one state that has 99% of their allocation in, in 
uh, in performance funding. Now, we went down that road uh, before. Uh, we took a couple runs at performance funding that uh, didn't materialize. And one of them was on a track like that. And how you do that is, is you allocate based upon successful grades. You change the way you calculate student FTE based upon only counting students who were successful. Those with Fs don't get counted in. Those in some states with Ds don't get counted in. And therefore, it's just part of their overall calculation of enrollment. It's crossed with performance, and you, you allocate the total amount on that completely different model than what we have. I think it would be dangerous for us to do that with these specific type metrics. Um, I'm not getting to the answer on all of your questions, but uh, keep firing at me and I'll try. No, no, I think you answered the, the funding question um, because, yeah, the, the percent, our budget has increased, so the percent of performance funding as part of the state appropriations has gone down over time. But to the, your point, if the campuses are very much paying attention to this and are driving some of the, their strategies through performance funding, know that knowing that they have access to these resources, that that seems very a, a logical approach. Um, I think the question about any shifts and change nationally on sort of the, the metrics, um, you know, maybe that's something we can do a little deeper dive on to see if there has has been any. It might drive some of the discussion that that Lauren was interested in. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, and I would add to that, I mean, so if we could go back to the, the core metrics that we have, retention and completion, um, it often campuses will bring up the topic, why are we still counting completions when we know that they're tied to enrollment? Can't we just switch to graduation rates, for instance? And there's an argument to be made with that, um, uh, but there was a reason why we didn't initially because graduation rates... Um, are often controlled by admission standards and can be ma manipulated by, uh, you know, s shrinking the the gate uh, open instead of flinging it wide open like we do in Montana. Um, so that's, uh, I guess, an argument as to why I still think we've got it right with retention and completion. But I hear what you're saying about other m measures, um, and uh, and I welcome uh, the challenge to try to figure out a big, better m metrics. Absolutely. And your point about what this has done for us in terms of central collection of data, that we measure every one of these metrics from the system office, it, that, that has been one of the principles all along, is that you you got to be able to do it out of a single place. It's pushed our abilities, um, and we met the challenge. So uh, if there are metrics out there that, uh, that, that are more conducive to a specific type of mission, I welcome to, to, to test them. And uh, uh, we can go take a look uh, and reevaluate where we're at. Excellent. Uh, Region Dabrowski. I have a way more practical question. So there, I there is in this dashboard sort of the overarching results of the <coughs> of those who were not able to achieve versus those who were able to achieve. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I just sort of call out, are, you know, are those are is that discussion had somewhere along the line about um, why why I didn't I didn't achieve it and what I'm going to do to try to achieve it and then please re remind me where where do those funds go that weren't allocated because I didn't achieve Mr. Chair Regent Dombrowski absolutely the the discussion about uh, why have you continued not to reach a certain level in a metric or, that would demonstrate improvement is discussed um, I, I would say first and foremost that it's discussed at the campus level. A campus that's struggling with retention absolutely knows that they're struggling with retention. And after they then see it in terms of a performance funding model and it's this visual, they, they, they're, they're focused on, on that topic. And we've seen that and we've seen the improvements uh, from the campus level. And that's, the, I, I believe, the right place for those discussions to occur. Um, we have and we reach out from the system office on these and it, it's connected to the uh, second part of your question of where do the residual funds go, the funds that are unallocated. They stay, they essentially stay in the OCHI office and we use those to address system initiatives. The most current one, Montana 10, um, is funded through the residual currently. Uh, but that's the beauty of it. It goes to address campuses, uh, particularly those campuses that are struggling with those core metrics, particularly retention and, and uh, completion.
Excellent. Good question. Any any other questions? Uh, I, I would just note on a positive front, um, if I looked at the data correctly, I think this is the lowest amount, total amount of unallocated uh, funds in the past four or five years. So uh, obviously that's an indication too that the campuses are making headway on some of these key metrics. So kudos go out to, to the campuses. I think we're ready to transition to the biennial budget development. Uh, Tyler, want to get us kicked off? You bet. Uh, Mr. Chair, just a couple slides here. Um, really just to, as a reminder that we are in the process of developing the budget uh, that'll move forward into the next legislative session. It's called the 2027 biennial budget. And uh, if anybody's confused about why in the world it's called the 2027 biennial budget, I, I'm with you. It's just the way, it's, there's some language that's used uh, in, in the budget development process in the state of Montana. You pick the last year of the biennium and you call it the biennial year. So it's FY26 and FY27 that we're developing the budget for. And so um, this spring, leading up to the May meeting, there's some key elements that, have, that we have to produce and we ask the regents to vote on in May and I just wanted to make sure everyone is aware of those. Um, we're going to talk about LRBP here coming up. Um, we, uh, in concert with that, um, we often think and talk about the pay plan and what that might let, what that might look like. But as it comes to the, like the nuts and bolts of our budget, it's the present law adjustment that we look at, um, or the inflationary cost that we would submit to the governor's office in May. June time period, um, and then work with the governor's budget office throughout the summer uh, to hopefully have those numbers appear in the governor's budget, and they have in recent years. And so um, this is the beginning of that process, uh, and in May we'll ask you to vote on those dollar amounts. Uh, Director Lyons, uh, who so adeptly went through the LRBP projects earlier, will is the key point person on the, the calculation of the present law adjustments. Um, they take in uh, more than just the mechanical part of it. We also look at uh, new proposals. Those will come forward in May, as the commissioner talked about earlier. Um, change in enrollment mixes, tuition revenue analysis will be done along the way that also add information to our calculus. Um, present law is a term that you'll hear often, and it's so often that we almost think Anybody should know what it means, but it's not, it's not super intuitive. Um, and the definition in state law is there, the level of funding needed under present law, so any adjustments that might have been made in the previous legislative session to maintain our operations and services at the same level. So you take into consideration uh, inflation, but also things like um, a pay plan that was funded at 4% in each year of the biennium, the largest play, pay plan ever. Now that's part of something that we're going to carry forward going into the next um, millennium uh, as part of our base. Uh, oftentimes that uh, pay plan uh, didn't start on July 1, did this time, so we don't have to account for the backfill of it. Sometimes it would start in January, which we would means for one of those years we didn't have it in our base, and so we would be putting that into the equation. Um, there's a whole other list of present law categories um, very much related to personnel costs in the university system. Is That's about 80% of what we pay for in the current unrestricted is our people. Um, and there's a, you know, a litany of, of different um, increases that could be associated with uh, a large um, uh, population of, of faculty and staff. Uh, higher education operations are a little bit different than other segments of state government. We have our little towns built inside of these campuses and the utilities and the library and the IT maintenance and all of the contracts associated with that are, uh, by and large, uh, our own operations. ITSD runs the executive branch, our campuses and their uh, uh, internal IT offices um, are responsible for our campuses. So um, then some technical stuff related to statewide changes that happen for everyone. Um, 
And then uh, we've talked a lot about new space O&M, and that's going to be a, a big topic coming up in our next budget, as, uh, as you'll see in some slides I have that our, our LRBP program in the last legislative uh, session uh, was wildly successful. And it'll dictate that we have more new space for operations and maintenance that will that will pick up. So um, the very bottom there is just an example of what we'll be bringing forward. You know, a typical type um, calculation of what is the inflationary cost in in the current unrestricted. What portion of the state? It, what, what what portion of it falls on the state, and what portion falls on the student? And that's that's sort of the balancing scales um, that that we're we operate under, and, th and that's part of what makes us different from other agencies. Any questions on the building blocks of the biennial budget development? All right, let's, uh, let's dive in into LRBP. There's like big topics just coming in wave after wave here, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Okay, um, LRBP process, and I'll jokingly aside, this is what I call the 1990 slide because I still can't come into this uh, new era of technology without uh, being locked into text boxes and circles and prefabricated. The arrows arrow. are really cool, though. Yeah. Well, yeah. But if you, <laughs> but if you notice, they, they're all identical size. I mean, it's not that easy. <laughs> All right, uh, the process, uh, this looks far more complex really than it is. Uh, in the summer following the legislative session, it's always a wake up call that campus has got to get back to work and come up with a list of what are their, uh, in, in terms uh, of this, your capital uh, project needs. Um, they meet on each side of the system. The lists are uh, aggregated together for each side of the system. And then as we move into the winter and spring, where obviously we are right now, um, we had a little bit different uh, addition to our typical LRBP pro process is that we have a board subcommittee on um, infrastructure. And so we took an opportunity there to take these projects early on in January and have them presented in detail to the subcommittee. Um, the, uh, following that meeting, the uh, uh, presidents and uh, the commissioner uh, met and consolidated those projects into a single list. That's what we'll talk about and I'll show you here in a minute. And that leads us to where that circle is there in red. Um, we have the draft consolidated list. Uh, we'll bring that for an actual vote in May. Um, this summer, after the vote, we uh, send the list uh, to architecture and engineering, who then um, develops the capital construction uh, program for the state. And we're hopefully included in there in one manner or another. In addition to the, the big time capital projects, we also have major repair um, items, and I'll talk about those as well here in a second. Uh, and then we hold our breath and we see what happens and out in sometime in November, usually at the uh, Regents meeting in November, we're able to talk about what's in the governor's budget. Um, and then we work our way very quickly after then into the legislative session and that process begins. Then it, then it starts all over again. So um, in terms of uh, coming up with the ranking and the priorities, we've had a long-held hierarchical list of, of items. And first and foremost, um, we take a look at projects that have health and life safety uh, issues and, uh, for a campus. And uh, almost every one of our projects has some aspect of health and life safety associated with it. And then you can read the list as it goes down. To, and finally, at the end, we, we have planning and design, which um, Essentially, regions have complete authority to, to plan and design without any legislative approval. So um, we do that. And you saw us here on the LRBP projects um, very closely hand in hand with architecture and engineering on their kind of rollout of these LRBP projects. That's why you saw the list that you did. It came to us from a &E on their calendar. So, um, as long as we're talking about metrics, we might as well kind of set the table here with where have we been with our, our capital project funding from the state of Montana 
going back to 1999, it was really kind of the furthest back that where we had accessible data. Um, we've had $379 million worth of capital funds uh, given to the university system for projects. You can see the difference between MSU and U of M, pretty close there for a over 25 year period of time. Um, interestingly enough, that 379, if you took out this last session, you'd be closer to 200 million. So it, we, we did quite a job here in this last session of, of uh, receiving funds. Um, here it is on a comparison between MSU and U of M over time with the 2023, obviously a standout year. And then I just broke up into flagship campuses, the smaller regional four-year campuses, two-year um, split out, the embedded two years split out from the flagship. Um, and then agencies, and I thought that might need a little bit of description here. It, um, just as a reminder, as a result of uh, land grant missions and uh, just uh, kind of the fabric of our campuses. We have interconnected agencies within our campuses at the, uh, and I, I, it's almost a challenge for myself, so I'll name them. On the MSU side, we have the Ag Experiment Station and Extension Services and the Fire Service Training School. And at uh, the University of Montana, we have the Forest and Conservation Experimentation Lab not lab, but um, station, thank you. And uh, on the Montana Tech campus, we have the Bureau of uh, Mines and Geology. So we take a look at where we're at in, in a kind of same time series there by those four categories. The eligible square footage between the two sides of the system, very close. And I should say by eligible square footage, the LRBP, the legislature approves what would be deemed as academic buildings. The regions have complete authority to build auxiliary buildings. So we're, what we're talking about here, we're not talking about the dorms and the dining hall here, we're talking about just those academic buildings. Um, and on the UM side, 64% at the flagship, and you can kind of see the breakdown by the, the affiliate campuses. And a very similar picture on the MSU side with the affiliated campuses. So that does it for the presentation, kind of the process and planning of this. I'll just dig into the consolidated uh, capital projects list. So um, capital projects fall into this category based upon two things. So one is if it's new square footage over $250,000. So essentially any new square footage is gonna be a capital project. And then anything uh, that involves renovation, construction over 2.5 million is a capital project. And this was part of what the commissioner was talking about in 2019 when the uh, process for um, the LRBP process was a, and went through a major overhaul in the legislature, they made these definitions very clear. So if we scroll down just a little bit, so maybe blow it up just a hair there, we have um, the list. And uh, not quite, sorry, I guess I can scroll too instead of just bark orders. Um, and you can see at the top there, we have them, we have them ranked, the first rank one is at the UM campus, classroom and teaching, lab modernization. This one is a kind of a unique bundling of much needed classrooms that I think ha the, the line of demarcation was hadn't been updated for over 30 years. Um, U of M, as we're gonna talk about and have been talking about, has gone through in the last five years sort of a campus revitalization. Um, a lot of it on the student life side, but a whole lot on the campus and classroom side. Um, and this is, is, is an item that has been I don't know, for lack of better words, brewing on that campus for quite some time. Um, and, and I guess I'll just kind of stop right there, and Mr. Chair, you tell me on the level of detail we want to go through on these. You can see I have beneath here a description for each one of the projects with the dollar amount and square footage um, and some bullets that help describe it. <clears throat> uh, sure, I mean, I think we should, we have a little bit of time. I think we should walk through just, just seeing how uh, the total dollar amounts, is these are big decisions uh, by, by the board, 
um, that we walk through them. I'd, maybe a similar in nature to what you just did with the first one. Okay. Uh, maybe spend a minute or two on, on each, just make sure we have the opportunity for the uh, regents to pose any questions along the way. But maybe I'll just back up just for a second and um, talk a little bit about the new infrastructure subcommittee from a, a regent perspective. You know, this is certainly new and we're figuring out how best to, to sort of leverage this group. Um, but since the November meeting, I think we've met multiple, we've met multiple times. Um, one, to talk about sort of the charge and kind of the prioritization uh, with regards to infrastructure and the system and our role as regents. And then we did spend a lot of time um, in January um, going through UC10 here. Um, but there were many, many, many other projects that were considered that we had the opportunity to talk about um, in, a f in a full day meeting in, um, in Helena. Um, so I just want to make sure, just provide a little bit of the comfort level to the other regents who are only seeing 10 that we've gone through a pretty rigorous process. One, that, one of which um, I think is important to call out the um, gratitude uh, to the campuses. I know this is a lot of work to be able to build and design and consider what, what are top priorities and the campuses have done an incredible job. They did a great job presenting to us and then to the presidents and, and the, the commissioner of taking a pretty darn long list um, of opportunities we have for infrastructure and, and whittling it down to these. And I think each one of these has um, really strong rationale and good logic um, to why these are the most important and why these are prioritized in the way that, that they are. So I just want to thank, you know, the commissioner and, and Chair Dabrowski for getting this subcommittee kicked off. Um, and, and then I think we can dive through, through each, of, each one of these a couple minutes each. Yeah, Commissioner. If I could, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, just I guess a couple other perspectives to add. That this has come up before. It, yeah, there's 30, 40 other projects on the list. Those projects don't go away. Uh, um, you know, it, it, it is one part of the MUS that we tend to prioritize. Those priorities stick around. We, we have to choose some that we will send to the governor's office. Um, to hopefully be included within that budget, but um, those questions got asked last session. They're they're not they're not gone. They're not go going away. It's just what we're trying to elevate for consideration. And and the other part of this that we didn't talk a lot about is um, for the two year process that we described. Ultimately, the governor certainly has free reign to put whatever he chooses in to his budget, and we've seen that over the years that. Sometimes we would get guidance to say, hey, you know, great ideas, sorry, no new construction. Or, um, you know, they, they sometimes set parameters that will change uh, our list. And then, of course, um, the governor's budget carries all the water right up till the first day of the legislature, and then they can do whatever they want with it. So it, it, it is a sort of a multi-step iteration. Sometimes the governor's office has changed um, our priority considerations. So we sort of revamp uh, our own list. Uh, sometimes the legislature has changed it. And so it, 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 it does stay a bit of a moving target, but it's not lost the, the work that goes into these, the, the, the need for these, the facilities assessment that are driving many of these, student demands that drive it. And so uh, we, we continue to see how we can put together the, the best and hopefully the, the highest probability of success in the legislative session. And uh, we do that in an interesting lens, knowing that uh, we, we can't solve all 45, 50 projects at one session. And um, we work through the priority piece over time. And uh, some of these projects have been around for decades and some have gotten funded, but we'll continue to sort of work that list back and forth, trying to find a, a high success probability list. Okay, I'll just kind of scroll through these. Uh, the number two on the list there is Lewis Hall renovation at MSU, $46 million, roughly 40,000 square feet. On most of these, uh, the ones that um, I can, we have the facilities condition index, uh, which are annually updated by our facility experts. 
um, that kind of it produces a score, and I'm no expert on that score, but I believe that this 23.5 means it's 23.5 percent of the square footage is deficient. Um, I'm looking around at Terry or Paul to tell me I'm wrong, but I'm looking like I'm right. Um, so Lewis Hall is uh, it's you, you know hey we have 100 year old buildings on our campuses this is one of them and it's in a predominant place on the MSU campus it's home to the microbiology uh, immunology eco ecology and earth science programs um, it is in massive need of renovation uh, they uh, MSU does a great job of identifying really what the dramatic increase in student utilization can and, and would be with a redesign of a, of a building like this, and they've proven it before with Romney Hall. So uh, I think this is a, uh, is a safe bet that they are, are um, they're really good at, at this type of uh, assessment. Um, they address all kinds of different deferred maintenance inside this building. Uh, obviously, code compliance, safety, and ADA are top of the list, but really just opening it up to be a functional student-utilized classroom space. Number three is a music building. Um, you're going to see the music building on here twice, and I believe this is one of those ones that the commissioner just indicated has been on our list for quite some time. Uh, the renovation of, of this building has been problematic on the UM campus. They've, in fact, addressed it a couple times with, I believe, a total amount of $3 million since 2015, really at the behest of the accreditors, um, is that, that music is uh, an interesting type program that has unique needs within, a, within classrooms. You know, if you're playing a tuba in one, this is a non-music person example, but if you're playing a tuba in one room and you're trying to sing in the other, you know, they kind of don't match, I don't know. Uh, you, so so you, you, you have to have the facilities in order to have the, the ability to grow a program, and this program has grown. In fact, it's doubled since the time of its inception, but the space hasn't, um, and it's in much need of, of a renovation, so $16 million for 37,000 square feet. Montana Ag Experiment Station on the MSU campus, uh, Precision Ag Building. This is new construction um, uh, to increase uh, the educational and research opportunities that surround Precision Ag. Um, uh, hot topic in Montana, obviously. Uh, a new building would have research labs, a teaching amphitheater, instructional rooms, chance for more hands-on learning from students. Uh, they also have some private funds that, that are going to be uh, in addition to this of about $6 million, so a total cost of $30 million. Jumping back to the UM campus, um, the Mansfield Library has uh, been a topic for U of M for quite some time. They recently received some funds to do some modifications and have completed those on levels one, three, and four. Uh, the fifth level is uh, what this um, project focuses on uh, with a big time emphasis on student success and making this a modern learning place. And I, I think, um, I, you know, I almost feel like I should remiss talking about it because we've got President Bodner here who knows far more about it than I do. But this would end up creating a center for student success on that fifth floor and adding a component um, that is much needed to this facility that is kind of the hub of the, the student learning for the campus. $18 million on that project. Um, Hamilton Hall on the MSU campus for $6.5 million. Uh, here we go for these old buildings again in 2010. Uh, I think we did a tour there last time we were on campus. It could have been maybe a couple iterations ago. Um, if you've been in uh, Hamilton Hall, the headquarters for Gallatin College um, at the time, also Army and Air Force ROTC. Uh, Super cool building, very, you know, a space that needs addressing in terms of functionality. Just the hallways, the size of the, of the uh, rooms, and and really focusing on the the classroom space and expanding that to something that is more usable. Number seven is main hall on the UM campus. Um, now. Here we go, in 1898, not the oldest building in the university system we heard this morning, but very close to it. 
uh, is an administrative off office, has primarily administrative offices, also some meeting slash classroom space. Um, the ADA accessibility in this building is, is not good. Um, the <laughs> I tried to say that lightly. Um, it, it is uh, a building that has a, a lot of different attributes that need to be fixed. The renovation is, is, is pretty severely needed. Um, building safety, fire suppression, ADA, adding an elevator. You can't get in really anywhere if, uh, ADA accessibility past the first floor, I believe. Um, so we could go on and on on that one, 23,032,000 square feet. Number eight, Rankin Hall on the UM campus, uh, 14 million. Once again, 100-year-old building project, uh, again, uh, related to an elevator, HVAC, life safety components, code compliance. I believe we toured this building, and I can't remember which board meeting it was, but it had some wavy floors and a really low rail as you came down the stairs. Uh, number nine, Montana Hall renovation on the MSU campus is sort of the companion to the main hall on the UM campus. Um, although MSU has recently done some work on this, this might arguably be the oldest building in the university system in 1896. Um, it still has extensive deferred maintenance that is needed, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing capacity. Um, it is, you know, the center point for the campus, obviously, as you see in many pictures. 42 million at 40,000 square foot. And finally, uh, number 10, uh, the music building addition. And so the music building, the current one, uh, is not sized to meet the current student population. It doesn't house all of the music-related degree programs. This would give them a chance to uh, unite those programs across campus with a renovated space uh, that we talked about uh, on number four and um, a new building adjacent to that of 23,000 square feet. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I'd like to open it up for conversation or questions or comments from any members of the board. No comments. Um, oh, yeah, Regent Dombrowski. I, I would say more of a comment. Um, maybe because there's no comments, it really does reflect back to the work that went into the infrastructure subcommittee, at which, again, I would echo Regent Lozar's comment. I appreciate all the time and effort that went into that. I, I trust that that process was um, good for everybody, that it wasn't just a sort of a lesson in let's bring everybody together. But I, I do think it gave us the time to understand the needs from a different perspective, and we took the time. We talked strategically. We certainly left the list back with Commissioner Christian and the, and the two presidents to prioritize. It looked a little different when it left us, but that, that was part of the process. And now we find ourselves here endorsing perhaps this list, knowing in, in just what you said, Commissioner Christian, it, it could all change or could get moved around um, through the next series of iterations. But I, as a region, have been on here, you know, five or six years, feel far better equipped to understand the facility needs across our campus. So I, I really appreciate that part of the process, and I and I would look and would hope that that continues into the future. So I don't really have any questions because I think they all got answered through our process. Excellent, thank you. Just Regent to Southward. point point out one piece of logic: the you know um, the 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 campuses understand that that. You know, um, it is the wish of uh, of Helena. You know, with the size of the asset base that that we control, that you know, really focus on taking care of what we have, and and not so much on just building more buildings. So, when you look at this, um, I think it was number way up high on the list: the music building at UM. Um, the, 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 the renovation and then the addition, if, if anybody was curious, like, why those got separated, logically it was because we didn't want to hold the renovation ransom to the, to the new uh, if it was to carry through as one package. So uh, thanks for doing that. I hope that strategy works well. Question, Jeremy. 
Can, just remind us who's on the infrastructure committee. Um, the, the subcommittee. Subcommittee. Um, it's Jeff and Joyce, myself, and uh, Bree was. Yep. And, and Commissioner, can you maybe remind everyone, and, and particularly for Regent Folk Boards, um, being new, you know, what the process is from here? And, and how the governor's office gets involved and what the legislature does, because sometimes we can go through this list and it, it would appear that we have hundreds of millions of dollars to distribute to campuses, and when actually we know that's not true. Yeah, uh, Regent Bow, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, uh, good question, and uh, again, it's, it's a bit of a moving target, but from here, we, we'll continue to work with uh, the list and the governor's budget office, now that we're starting to congeal around some ideas uh, and getting some feedback, um, it is our intent that we'd come back to you in May and ask this board to somewhat endorse um, the list that we move forward. Uh, we, we deliver all of this stuff to the governor's uh, planning process in June, and then ultimately we'll work through the summer to try to identify, justify you know, I think the the big question is, and we talked about a little on the break, what does the state budget look like? What does uh, surplus potentially look like? What will this legislature be willing to invest? I think we don't know much about those topics yet. Uh, do I think that um, following, you know, large-scale investments from the governor, and I certainly don't speak for any of these groups, but the, the governor of the legislature in the last session, I, what I hear is that there will be less investment this session, that there will be less surplus to invest this session. But, again, I, I mean, I'm, I'm way out on a limb there, way out over my skis on, uh, on, on making those. But I, I think that's part of the process. What, what would they entertain in terms of requests from us? And, you know, again, um, if the feedback from the, the governor's budget office over the the course of this process and, and the summer is, um, you know, it's X amount of dollars. It, it doesn't put, it, I mean, it doesn't benefit us to then try to put 10X that in front of them, right? So it may shift some priorities again as to what we, get, we think we can get funded. But they will, as a legislative body, uh, start making their estimates over the course of the summer. And as we get to fall, um, we know a little more. There's some pieces of that that sort of solidify around the mid-October, and, and then ultimately the, the governor's draft budget comes out 15th of November-ish. Um, and, and that sort of is what it is until uh, the final budget, December 15th, and then we move into the process. So I, I think, you know, there's just a lot of variables that affect not only this, but really all of our proposals moving forward, and I don't think we have all those answers quite yet. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I guess just reserve one last comment. Um, I think what's what's important for us as regents is that you know we're putting forward projects that we absolutely need, right? At, and and granted, we're so much of the ultimate decisions is out of out of our control, but that we're putting together things that we think are the most important priorities, and that we're really conscientious about how we steward public funds, right? So ensuring that we're not building Cadillacs here, that we're, we're making sure that the facilities are the highest utility uh, and are modern, but we're not building the most expensive um, facilities that we could possibly build. So I, I think it's a, a good message to the public that, you know, that we are, we are consciously always thinking about that, and there may be some adjustments al along the way for each one of these projects just based on you know bumps in the road or different perspectives from uh, the other partners that have the opportunity to weigh in on this so some of these may not look the same um, towards the end of the the next session but I think the key thing here is more more gratitude I think Joyce you're spot on like uh, we we are positioned better now as a board than we've ever been on sort of our involvement in the process and understanding these projects in more detail than we've we've had so uh very much appreciate um us you know doing this sort of process improvement at the board level to be able to be more involved if i can add that, that's exactly right and 
I think implied in all of our conversations is just the absolute undertow of this, which is, and, and where do we serve students? How do we serve students? And, and frankly, where do we serve the, me, the, the most students, right? And so I, I think those are part of the calculation and ultimately the prioritization of the list is we want to be able to do everything for every campus. Um, the question is where's the highest need that, that will ultimately serve the most students um, with, with the limited funds that are available. Yep, that's right. All right, moving on to major maintenance. Okay, if you could open up one of those, it'd be great. So each, uh, I guess is just some comments about the major uh, maintenance list. Post 2019, um, new rules of the road, we used to call this first and foremost, uh, deferred maintenance. Um, uh, now uh, it's called major repairs, major maintenance. Um, these projects, uh, the, the total amount of the dollars that the state puts forward for major repairs now is part of a formulaic decision. So they, the, those dollars um, are, in essence, going to be there at a certain level depending upon the formula and the, and the drivers of that formula. Uh, we submit projects, uh, our campus, all of the projects are uh, at a dollar amount below $2.5 million. We submit them to um, architecture and engineering. Who does the ranking? So we don't rank these. The regions don't um, vote on the ranking of the major repair list. Um, campuses uh, obviously vet these across each side of the system and uh, we enter them into the state system and, um, and, and what comes out is in, in the governor's budget is what's in the budget. Yep, right up. That's MSUs, and um, yeah, I think we're done with that category, this topic. Any questions? questions on that last item? All right, I think we can move on to um, the UM Residence Hall proposal. Uh, we have a presentation to bring up here. I, I, I guess I'll start off making a few comments here, and then I'll uh, lateral to uh, President Bodner, and uh, we'll, we'll walk you through this presentation. I, I th First, I want to remind everyone and the regents that um, uh, we've been talking about LRBP projects. Those are academic space. Those are academic buildings. I know there's, there's a lot of grayer between just academic buildings and auxiliary buildings, but you've got two categories. The state of Montana, uh, the legislature provides authority for the university system to build and renovate academic space. Uh, the regents have sole responsibility for auxiliary or revenue generating space. And so this falls into that category. Um, I say that. Also, I wanted to mention we talked a lot about the board subcommittee. This topic has been a, a, a first and foremost topic in front of that committee um, in, in January along with the LRBP projects. Uh, the subcommittee also received a very detailed presentation related to this. Um, we've sort of boiled down the high level points and uh, are prepared to, to walk you through those just to kind of get everybody on the same trajectory on what is this proposal and what's a possible timeline associated with it. You know, and with that said, this has been part of a long-term planning process at the University of Montana. We talked a lot of, and you hear a lot about the student life master plan. When President Bodner came on in 2018 and Vice President Lassiter, they put together a comprehensive plan to um, revitalize the campus on the academic side and then on the student side. And on the student side, um, there's been a whole host of projects, remodeling of dorms, the dining hall, the memorial walkway. It's uh, an integrated plan. And, and really, from at least my seat, as I see this, it looks like this is the final domino of that plan, albeit the largest piece of the plan. It's, it's a very critical piece of that plan. And so um, I'll turn it over to President Bodner to kind of give us the who, what, when, where, why version of this. <clears throat> Thanks, Tyler, Mr. Chair, and uh, members of the board. Yeah, as, as Tyler mentioned, this is the next step in, in what has a, been a multi-year plan. Uh, and, and the goal really is to ensure that our student-facing infrastructure at UM is conducive to a safe, healthy living and learning environment. And the goal today, we just want to give 
the broader group an update on our plans to address what, what really is a, a 600 bed challenge that we have in our residence halls. Um, and the steps we're taking to, to mitigate certain other challenges, both financial and logistical, that arise as we address this 600 bed challenge. So if you go to the next slide, just briefly recap the history. You know, we've been playing a little bit of catch up infrastructure wise here. Uh, as those of you on the board who were on the board in 2018, 2019, uh, will recall, you know, UM was significantly lagging our peers in terms of student-facing infrastructure. We had an external analysis that showed that our age of plant ratio was approximately 29% 20 higher than peer institutions. Um, widespread, consistent feedback that this was a barrier to both enrollment uh, and learning on our campus. So it was back in 2019 we undertook what was a collaborative process. Uh, to develop this student life master plan and identify those areas of greatest potential impact. Um, so we restructure our debt portfolio to free up investment to, to, to meet that need. Um, as, as Tyler said, significant progress over the past five years, uh, renovations of existing residence halls, new dining facility will open this summer, as well as core infrastructure, you know, and that both improves the experience, also saves money. Um, heating plants listed here, it's a great example. It's It'll be finished later this year. It's actually will now be a heating and power plant, uh, turning that into a combined heat and power plant. Uh, not just an upgrade of critical campus infrastructure, but saves us over a million dollars a year in, in, in utility costs, as well as uh, it, it represents the largest uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction in campus history. So really a triple win on that one. Um, and a key point that, that uh, Chair Lozar made that I, I think were, is worth emphasizing, and, and that we're making significant investments, but this isn't about creating luxury on our campus. Um, I've shared with our, uh, our our campus community, you're not gonna be a university that, uh, that builds a lazy river through campus. That's not who we are as an institution. Um, we also don't need a lazy river, we have the Clark Fork. Um, so this really is about ensuring that our living and learning spaces uh, support our, our institution's number one priority, which is place student success at the center of all that we do. And these investments are about not just our students today, but, but the next generations of Montanans uh, that will enjoy our campus. So if you go to the next slide, as, as Tyler said, the last big puzzle piece here that we're trying to address is the issue of uh, three residence halls. Craig, Elwell, Craig, Elrod, and Dunaway represent about 600 beds average age of about 80 years. Um, these dorms are in need of significant upgrades. Um, you know, I, uh, I've shared with, with some of the infrastructure committee, I, I help students move in each year. And as I said to my team, you know, it, it's, it's maybe okay when the parents say, hey, this dorm hasn't changed since I was here as a student. But when the grandparent says that, um, uh, it's not good. And, uh, and, and I'm deeply proud of the hard work that our housing, our maintenance teams do to make these dorms comfortable for our students, uh, they, they work magic, but, but that's not sustainable over the longer term. So we face a decision. Um, we either put significant investment into these older structures or we invest in a new structure that'll serve the needs of our students for the next half century. Um, and the other complicating factor I think it's worth noting is that we've seen increases, significant increases in our incoming classes over the past three years. Um, and our dorms right now are over 90% occupancy. So it's a great news, uh, sign of enrollment progress, but it means that, that the option of, of putting investment into these existing structures would mean displacing 600 students um, into a housing market uh, that is very challenging. Um, so, so we don't really see that as a, as a viable option. So the, the plan we would like to move forward is construct a new dorm and then once complete, take down these older structures. Um, as you can see on this chart, we've done a lot of planning on this. Um, we believe this is the right decision, but, but there are some considerations. First and foremost, the, the price tag is significant, um, and uh, the construction period will present some challenges with, with parking capacity. We think those challenges are, are less than the impact of, of taking 600 beds offline, but they're issues nonetheless. Um, and I'm gonna just briefly hit on those. Uh, so if you move to the next slide, we'll talk parking first. Uh, here's another visual, uh, Regent Dombrowski. Um, you can see the, the lower right-hand corner, which is actually the uh, southwest corner of campus, is where the new dorm would be located. That would displace a current parking lot next to Panzer Hall. Uh, you, you saw uh, Shauna's presentation on the additional lots we're putting in place. 
right now uh, for next academic year. So, so we would be down uh, next next academic year 100 about 108 spots as can, compared to our current capacity. Um, you know, we take some offline, we add some. The net loss is 108. Next summer, the plan would be to add 69 additional spots, so down about 40. And then once the new dorm is complete, we'd take down Craig Elwood. Elrod and Dunaway and uh, put a surface lot there where you can see that red box. So net, uh, once those buildings come down, we'd actually be up about 150 spots relative to our current capacity. So couple year pinch, um, but those are the steps we're taking in the near term. If you go to the next page though, and, and we mentioned earlier, we're blessed with a beautiful campus. Um, the geography that makes that campus beautiful <laughs> also creates uh, square footage constraints for surface parking lots. So we, we recognize that, that, that we, we have to go vertical and we need to begin uh, planning for the addition of, of some, some structures on campus. Uh, we have one, uh, it's a discussion we've begun. It's something we're gonna work to continue uh, in, in conjunction with the uh, infrastructure committee. So if you go to the next slide, um, you know, the other major con consideration here's the price tag. It's, it's significant. Um, you're, you're talking a nine-figure price tag. Um, you know, the discussion about inflation, yes, inflation slowed. It's not zero. Um, so we believe this project is, is, is something we need to do, and it's not getting any cheaper moving forward. So it's an investment we believe we need to make now. Uh, we have a plan in place to use existing funds together with some housing reserves as well as proceeds from the issuance of some additional bonds. Um, that would, uh, would finance the construction. Uh, done a lot of analysis of our capacity for this. And the good news is based on, on, on the estimates we're getting back on current rates and how we'd structure this, that even after the issuance of these additional bonds, our university's debt service coverage ratio would still be better than it was in, uh, in 2018. Uh, for reference, our debt service coverage ratio in 2018 was 5.1x. Our, our estimate here in, in the analysis shows that after this issuance, um, our, our debt service coverage ratio would actually still be 7x, so higher than it was, so better. Uh, and that's due to a combination of, of three factors. Lower interest rates that we locked in back in 2019, significant increases in our revenue over the past five years, uh, as well as a longer amortization period of the debt. So, and I do want to thank, as, as Tyler mentioned, Vice President uh, Lasseter for his hard work and expertise on this. So. If you go to the next slide, just in terms of timing, um, we'd like to proceed with the, with the bid process this spring with the idea that um, we'd come back to the infrastructure committee and then to this body ultimately in June. Um, uh, June to the infrastructure committee, July to this body. Um, and, and while we do that, we're also planning to engage with an independent third party looking at our debt capacity to validate what our underwriters have, have given us. Um, not just looking at our UM's debt capacity, but making sure that, that, that it remains solid, but that also that we retain sufficient capacity for our affiliate campuses and, uh, and their investment needs. So uh, again, wanting to give some context for an, uh, some items that will come before this body in a couple months uh, to address Regent Buchanan's press, uh, question from earlier about changing estimates. We're, we're planning to, to give you a heads up on this and go to go through the bidding process and have firm bids in hand that we have the actual numbers. One of the things we've had before is we've gotten authority, we get the bids back, they're higher, we have to ask for more. The idea, it would be that we would have these firm bids in hand, so we're asking you for the authority based on a firm number that uh, uh, a bidder has given us. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Tyler for anything I'd missed and stand ready for, uh, for any questions. Mr. Chair, that's uh, the conclusion of the presentation. So, any questions? Regent Bell. Chairman, President. Um, just a question you know, on many campuses across the country, people are partnering with, with uh, private developers to build um, uh, facilities, beds, right? What's the advantage to the university and the system owning these and, you know, owning the whole project versus partnering? Mr. Chair, Regent Bow, and I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the commissioner here. I mean, there are some, you know, state statutes that, that actually don't allow us to, to do uh, public-private partnerships for dorms at this stage. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, these are, these are buildings, and, and we're thinking about this building on a, 
on a 50 to 75 year time horizon. Uh, some of the other projects, you know, you, you run the risk of a, of a shorter time horizon, not as quite high quality. Um, you know, you look at our the financing that we can get, the the tax structures that we have. Um, it is tougher for some of these private partners to compete with that. So those are some of the advantages in quality and cost. Um, and then we're thinking for the long term versus a, a 30 or 40 year lease. So, so those are some thoughts, but I, I would defer to, to Commissioner. Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Bow, we've, we've given this a fair amount of thought. And in fact, we, we looked pretty high and low on this topic maybe six, eight years ago. I, I think there's some areas where public-private partnerships make a whole lot of sense. I, you know, we're, we're in the middle of one uh, in, in the works at the Bozeman campus that I think makes a lot of sense. And I think there could be housing ones. But I think when you come to very fundamental core, um, sort of that first-time, full-time freshman on campus, uh, there there's some absolute advantages. I mean, when you look at the university system, uh, y you know, the, the candid answer is we can borrow money, generally speaking, cheaper than the private sector. We don't pay tax on the structure. If it's, um, we, we self-insure or insure through a huge pool. I mean, you look at the costs that drive most commercial real estate and we're either at zero or significantly reduced from from that market. And, you know, ultimately, we're also not trying to make a profit off of the students, something that uh, private sector and absolutely don't begrudge that. It's just part of the, the process. So I think when you're talking about some amount of sort of core uh, dormitory space on campus, that us owning that for a long-term investment, a 100-year type investment, makes a whole lot of sense. I don't think that precludes conversations around, um, you know, upper class living uh, partnerships that are adjacent to much different sort of structure, look, feel to those projects. I, I think that's still very much on the table. But um, when you lo really look at where and, and President Bodner's opening comments, where the, the that core space is on the U of M campus and how outdated it is, uh, the need to refurbish that and the easiest way to do it. Um, this probably makes a whole lot of sense. Thank you. That that wouldn't prevent us from from having a pro forma to show what the investment return is going to be over fifty or hundred years, right? And 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 I guess my other, <clears throat> um, yeah, I think uh, I have one more question. It slipped. Yes, uh, Regent Southwark. Yeah. Thanks, Chair Lozar. Um, just for clarity, just for um, the 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 hundred million is just for the vertical construction of the new dormitory. It, it is not encompassing any scope for the demo of the existing dormitories or the elevated parking um, to uh, lookers north of the site plan. Correct. Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Southworth, we have accounted for the, not for the parking structures, we are in our debt considerations, and I might ask Vice President Laster to give us a little bit of, uh, he can give us the, the specific numbers, but we have accounted, as we're thinking about the the, the debt, what we would, what it would take to uh, to take down the other uh, Okay, reforms. great, but, great. Yeah, in, in the uh, current project list that we have uh, communicated to the commissioner's office, we've set aside about $5 million for the deconstruction of uh, the existing facilities, but they are in a separate pool, separate bucket, separately accounted for. The $100 million here, that rough estimate is just to put the new structure in place. Uh, just a t tag on that, just because I won't ever get to talk to anybody at a &E, but when, you know, this, this comes to fruition, um, as we've talked about, you know, a concern that everyone shares, you know, on our, especially on our flagships is just the, you know, they're not making more dirt for us out there, you know. So when the, I, I love the idea of the elevated parking garage and just a, just a must that it, it is designed to, you know, whether you do two elevated decks or three elevated decks, whenever that happens, that the, the design of it is is meant to stack more decks in the future so that, we don't have to play the horizontal game yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Chair, Regent Southworth, yes, we've 
we felt the uh, the challenges of that, and we have our campus engineer, Jamil Chaudhry, here on campus, and I always ask him, well, can't we go up? He says, well, no, that isn't possible. So we want to make sure that uh, our successors have, have flexibility, uh, because you're exactly right. We uh, Square footage uh, in that main campus footprint at, at U of M, again, we're blessed to be in a great location, but, but we don't have anywhere to go. Uh, other than up, so we want we'll, we will certainly think for uh, long term optionality as we're uh, making these investments today. President and Chair, uh, I remember my question, which is so net net, <clears throat> this is we're replacing six hundred units, six hundred beds. So we're not picking up any new beds, we're not picking up new parking. So that this is should should I then assume that effectively the the existing 600 beds that those units are so bad that we should consider them uninhabitable uh mr chair oh sorry that was a little a little closer than i meant uh, mr chair regent bow uh the investment that it would take to give additional life to these existing uh craig elwad elrod and dunaway it is is not worth the cost. We've we've made that assessment, and that we believe it's it's a far better use of the funds to invest. You know, again, we end up with, I think it's maybe a, a net gain of of less than ten or fifteen beds. It's it's a it's a replacement essentially. We got to get that replacement before we take down the old structures, though. And then we would plan to have surface parking there. You know, over the long term, if we saw big increases, we could consider additional uh, room there. But but that's not we're not. This is not a net increase in, in beds. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Regent Bowe, I, I, that's the right answer. I, I mean, I don't know if I like the term uninhabitable, but I think end of life certainly comes to mind. And we have to think about what the next iteration is, right, and where we're going um, from there. And I, I think when you look at it in those terms, um, we need we need the next plan, and, and I think this one makes sense from a cost structure. Yeah, the, it, it, those norms have character. I don't, want, I don't like that term either, <laughs> Mr. Commissioner, so I don't want anyone to, to think that. And I want to give cu huge kudos to our housing team, our maintenance team. They, they have worked miracles and, and kept these, extended the life of these dorms. And our students are, are comfortable, they're safe in these dorms, but what we're doing today is not sustainable without significant investment into those current structures that we don't think is wise. We don't think that's the best use of, of of ultimately student dollars. And that's why we think a structure that will serve the next 75 years is uh, is the right bet. Any other questions from, from board members? Uh, I just had one comment and I very much appreciate in the process, uh, one of the last slides, the process that we'll go through before it comes back to the board. So one, it will go, come back to the infrastructure committee with an updated plan, um, but one component between now and then is um, going to a third party uh, to look at our sort of bonding capacity, our de debt capacity, which I think is particularly smart for us to do. And you look at the last five, six years of the developments that have happened on University of Mon Montana campus, it has been about, uh, based on really smart uh, handling of our debt and refinancing our debt. Um, and so I really look forward to the, the evaluation by the third party and just would ask you to continue to do what you've done um, over the past five to six years. Like if you have debt capacity, that doesn't mean you s use all the debt capacity. I know they're still moving targets, right, with regard to how much this thing uh, might cost. So I, I appreciate um, previous approach and, and hope that we can model that approach going into the future, that, that we're basing this investment on the needs of the students and not on our debt capacity. Mr. Chair, thank you. Very much understood. And uh, we'll continue to do so. And, and, and just to emphasize, you know, the, the current assessment has been done not just by an internal analysis, but our underwriters. underwriters. Uh, we've been working with banks. So, so it'll, it'll be another uh, independent analysis here. Our, our goal is to be good stewards of this institution and to, uh, to hand ultimately to our, our successors and future generations of Montanans uh, a campus that uh, has, a, has, a, has a better debt service coverage ratio and, and enhanced infrastructure. And, uh, and we've done that so far, and that's, that's, our, that's our continued goal that we, we share that, that uh, intent. Yeah, Chair Dombrowski. 
um, I think it's important that we as the board um, hear those talking points that we are consistently speaking about this opportunity as well. And I, I can imagine that after the infrastructure subcommittee in June, part of the deliverable will be those talking points, not for a scripted, but for a consistent uh, approach from the board. I like that. Good point. Yeah, and, and sorry, Chair Lozart. Um, in, in June, one request, just kind of piggybacking off uh, what Regent Bow was saying, you know, just it, it would be kind of cool just to be able to present to the regents that, you know, I know that this is not intended for profit, but yet it still is a, a pro forma, right? Like it, 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 it wants to be able to at least tread its own water. So just, uh, you know, the, the math on, you know, the, the, the O&M, I understand you don't carry triple net like a normal development, but the, the O&M and then, you know, the, the assessment of fees and how that registers based on the 600 pillows, uh, you know, like the fun math, and then, it, you know, it's, it's X amount of years. And, and I just think that it's healthy for us to be able to look at it that way. Um, and it, you know, and sometimes it just shows a project, uh, you know, maybe it won't look as scary or, 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 or whatever, but it would be fun to be able to look at that. Thank you. I, I think we can move on to the next item, the MSU facility financing item. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd invite uh, Vice President Terry Lease from MSU up to actually address the next two items. Chair Lozar, members of the committee, um, good afternoon. Welcome, uh, Regent Folkford. I was uh, not here this morning, so appreciate you being on the board. I know you've Provide a lot of support to uh, higher ed in Montana for many years that I've known you, so glad to have you here. Um, bringing this item to the board um, to keep you informed about wh what we want to um, do at the May meeting, which is bring some financing, a financing item. We've had projects that were approved by the board. Uh, one was uh, an athletic indoor facility. Another one was the, the Rob, Mark and Robin Jones College of Nursing um, buildings, and then uh, parking improvements that uh, we're going out to bid for right now. So the first uh, two of those, the indoor athletic facility and the nursing facilities will need, uh, we've got donations coming in and we've got project costs. Um, and so there will be some level of uh, bridge financing for those. And uh, we'll come again in, in, the, in the May meeting. The parking will be, those will both be like five year uh, terms is all. So, the parking will be a, a 15 years, what we're kind of looking at right now. We just went out to bid on March the 8th for, for all of this. Um, so we'll have firm numbers um, prior to the, the May meeting. And that wraps it up in a nutshell. Happy to answer any specific questions that you might have. Questions from the committee? I, I did have a question. Um, I'm trying to make this all add up. Um, so the athletics indoor facility and the College of Nursing are donor funded. So it's just a bit of a timing delay on the pledges coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, sort of as we're looking at financing, what that gap is right now when you're looking at the total amount of financing that's associated with this, um, this ask of the board. And then Similarly, you know, I know we had that conversation for the parking in the January meeting, and there was several resources available to, uh, to facilitate um, <clears throat> those parking improvements with a little bit of a caveat of, and we might go to debt financing as an option. So a couple questions here. What, what is the total amount that is under consideration? And are we looking at uh, bond financing? Are we looking at right. loans? It's, it, there's a, a little bit of lack of clarity in, yeah. in this item. Uh, Chair Lozar, excellent question. And uh, we knew less about that in January than we know now. And we'll know more uh, prior to the May meeting than we know today. But uh, the, the option that we put out there to bid on March the 8th calls for really a, a, a direct placement. We think that we can, um, there's quite a bit of cost and process with issuing bonds. Um, but at any rate, this, this financing, there's three components. One would be for the um, indoor athletic 
facility. And on that one, um, we feel like the peak gap between donations and the project cost will be around $5 million. Um, and that that would happen somewhere in early 2025. And then as the donations come in, uh, and then that project, um, as the donations come in, that amount would, would reduce over the next four years. Um, that project has about a nine month approximate um, construction time period. So five million for the indoor facility. The nursing project, um, the peak would be, it would start off in um, early 2025 with about $16 million. Peaking in the first half of 2026 with we're estimating $37 million right now. So on the bid, we have a, a drawdown loan uh, request um, for bids of um, up to $40 million for that one just, just in case. But again, we would only pay interest and borrow the, the exact amount that we need, and we could pay it off early at any time that we go. So uh, there's no risk uh, to us there. And then on the parking, um, we haven't got the bids back yet, but we're, we have um, design estimates, basically. And so we're estimating that uh, with, we have $3 million in cash that the parking enterprise has been uh, putting away. And so that combined with up to $10 million, we're hoping that it's less than that, but we're going out to bid for up to $10 million. Hopefully we can draw down six to seven is where I'm hoping to hit on that number. So 55 million. Yeah, it could, yeah, potentially for the total. Two of those the, um, being five year max, the bulk of that being the nursing, again, five years uh, till that comes in. Okay, that's helpful. And then I think, appreciate this coming to us as an information item this far in advance, so I know that yeah. Um, you'll have more specifics when it comes down to decisions that we'll make as a board in, in May. Right. Um, this seems uh, very different than what we've done in the past um, it, within the university system, uh, particularly on the donor-funded projects, right? So um, I think this is important for the board to really sort of process this decision and to really think about is this – an anomaly with regard to how we think about funding projects that we anticipate to be donor funded? Um, or is this a strategy that will give us additional agility? Um, I think both sides have their pros and their cons. There's a little, there's a part of me that is a, makes me a little bit nervous that we're trying to finance donor funded projects before we've received all the, the funding from the donors. It's typically we get all the donations and then we do the project. So um, I, I just personally am putting a, an asterisk um, in my head on this. It's something that we really need to be thoughtful about um, as, as a members of the board, as this kind of strategy might sort of shift how we think about um, the process that we go through um, approving some of these, these items. So uh, no, I just wanted to put the plug in and, and the region's heads on that. And then to just, Terry, to appreciate the more specificity um, as you get closer and you have more of the accurate numbers when we uh, this comes in front of us in, in May. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on that comment that you made, which is a good one, uh, part of our project cost for all donor-funded projects is an allowance for donations that might not come in. Our foundation has a lot of historical background on, on um, what percentages that might be, uh, depending on how many donors contribute to a project and uh, various types of projects. So we do incorporate that into the cost so that we make sure that we, we have it covered ultimately with an allowance for some portion of the donations possibly not arriving. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. And we have uh, the next item you have, yeah. Terry. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the next item is uh, also due, um, related to our nursing project. Again, we wanted to just give the board a heads up. Um, we have, uh, as you know, uh, this board has approved our college, um, the Mark and Robin Jones College of Nursing, um, based on their generous investment in our, in our program and the healthcare of, of Montana. 
And we have our buildings in the other non-Bozeman locations, uh, which will just clearly have a sign, Mark and Robin Jones College of Nursing. On our campus itself, we would like to uh, propose the name of Jones Hall. Um, based on our policies here or, or practices with the board, we know we need to go through a, a 14 day um, public vetting of that. And so we will do that prior to the May meeting. I just wanted to give you a heads up that that was coming. I uh, certainly appreciate the, the advance uh, heads up on, on this. I know that the naming of buildings has been a point of conversation uh, over the years for the board. And, um, you know, some of those come to the board with little time, some come with advance time. So we appreciate um, the, you know, two, three months warning that you're going to go through the process that we've laid out. So yeah. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you. Perfect. Well, Madam Chair, um, I suppose it's time to hand it over to you and just we'll note that it's 429 and I could probably talk for another 40, 45 seconds, okay. but I won't just to say that we ended early. Thank you, Chair Lozar, appreciate that. Um, thanks for a great discussion and again, the preparation on, the, on this budget and admin and audit committee, um, outstanding, so really, um, Thank Commissioner Christian and Tyler and Shauna and all the, all the staff. It's uh, I, I I can't say it enough. I think we're in a far uh, the best position we've been in in terms of knowledge and and uh, opportunity to move move this along. So I'm looking at the agenda and I'm looking at Jasmine and we're not set for public comment till 4:45. Uh, so you should have talked for 15 more oh, minutes. I, uh, <laughs> no. I think our asterisk there covers it okay. very well. Okay, all right. I, give public notice that it can come at any it time. It come at any time. This is, okay. this is early enough at any time. Okay. So we'll move to public comment. Since this is a public meeting, I will now call for any public comment. Public comment may be offered on items on this meeting's agenda or on any matter, not on the agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the Board of Regents. Written public comment may also be sent to Jasmine Casanovas at J Casanovas, that would be J C A S A N O V A S, at montana.edu. To allow us to give everyone a chance to comment, please limit your comment to three minutes. Is there any in person public comment? Is there any online? public comment. Okay. I don't want to say that's a first, but it feels like a first. So um, at this time, I'm going to recess the meeting. I recognize it's early. Uh, before I let us out of the room, I'm going to turn it over to Chancellor Reed to see if there's any instructions for the rest of the day. Thank you, Chair Dombrowski and members of the board. I guess I would just, uh, again, I hope everybody was able to uh, have an effective and, and comfortable meeting. Uh, I do remind everybody that we have a reception this evening, uh, approximately 5 o'clock over in the Lewis and Clark building. And I will just uh, announce that we have one of our student clubs, uh, the Polynesian Club, that uh, they uh, ceased to exist back in 2005. They've been reinvigorated. This club consists of uh, Montana Western students and community members, and uh, they would, uh, they'll show up sometime during the uh, reception to do a little performance for us. So uh, we invite them. We're, we appreciate their willingness to come and um, entertain us a little bit. So again, we hope you have a pleasant evening and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Terrific. Thank you very much. The meeting's adjourned and we'll reconvene tomorrow at 8.30. Good morning. Welcome back to day number two of the Board of Regents meeting. Glad to see you all. We uh, had a terrific opportunity, we as the Regents, with some OCHI staff, with uh, members of the community here in Dillon. So I know Chancellor Reed isn't sitting here, but I want to thank he and his office for putting together such a great list of individuals who are not only committed to Dillon and, and uh, certainly Western, but we're willing to engage in conversation about higher ed and, and how we can continue to be nimble and, and focused on the needs of our communities and our employers. It was, um, it was outstanding. So that's why we're running a couple minutes late because the conversation was so great. So again, Chancellor Reed, thank you for putting that list together this morning and 
having so many of your contemporaries there. We'll jump right into the two-year uh, community college agenda. Chair Southworth, please. Thank you, Chair Dombrowski. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Chancellor Reed, uh, just a shout out. Thanks for making this uh, so comfortable. It's, this is my second meeting in Dillon, and, and I love this community. I, I'm jealous of your college here in, in Dillon. I, I, every time I come here, I'm just like, ah, if Loosetown had something like this, it would be so cool. But uh, anyways, you're doing a fantastic job here. And, and thanks to all your staff for helping uh, set this big party up for us. Um, I'm trying to boot up here. I think I maybe got to where I needed to get to. So um, I think we'll, we'll I'll introduce um, kind of as we go, instead of doing a big summary of, of, of what we're about to do. Um, first uh, on our agenda today is a um, uh, request for approval from uh, the, Perkins, uh, the Perkins team. Uh, there was an advisory board set up uh, uniquely this year for the, I think it's close to $7 million. Uh, that's really the you know the catalyst for the funding for the CTE in in our state. It's uh, it's very important. We're hoping that the Perkins amounts uh, can increase over time. And the the cool part about the advisory is is that you know there's it it gives the it gives Perkins some oversight to assess where there are real needs or maybe where people are behind uh, people being you know different districts. Uh, on the K-12 side, um, so that a lot of Montana high schools can can kind of catch up to where others are and meet industry, uh, you know, right right where we're at now. So, um, anyways, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Till, if you want to uh, um, kick this off, please do. Regent South, we're glad to, and and I'm going to invite uh, our State Director's Career and Technical Education, Jackie Treister, up to the mic to talk through this process. I, and starting off really with some recognition of Jackie and her team and also her counterpart at the Office of Public Instruction, Shannon, and uh, their team, they, I think, ran a very thoughtful process to solicit feedback from the field, to uh, in inspect our data, to think about how, how our state plan should be structured. Jackie. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the board, happy to be here today to um, seek out your approval for this state plan. Um, I'm going to give you a few highlights. Um, thank you, Chair Southworth, for being a champion for Perkins. I so appreciate it. Um, and uh, it really, it's, it is, there's so much good work happening both on our campuses and at the uh, secondary level that I'm just so proud of. And so um, it's a, a great time to celebrate that a little bit and then give you some of the highlights for uh, our state plan. So, do you want me to drive? Okay, so why does it matter? Uh, why do we make such a big deal of the state plan? So just for your uh, uh, information, this is gonna cover the next four years um, of kind of a strategy of how we implement CTE programs both at the secondary level and the post-secondary level. Um, it really sets our vision for the workforce development system that we have in the state and our relationships with not only K-12, but also with uh, labor and industry, um, our business partners, both private and public, um, and how we really meet uh, the needs of workforce and our students at the same time. Uh, it helps us establish strategies, <clears throat> excuse me, on meeting the needs of special populations. So we've, we've talked about this before, <clears throat> you know, keeping in mind that students with disabilities, um, non-gender traditional, or sorry, non-traditional gender students, so those are um, male students in education and nursing, female students in STEM fields, things like that. Um, in order to meet the workforce needs of our state and really our country, we need to start thinking outside the box of traditionally the students that have been attracted to those types of occupations and think about ways to recruit them into those CTE fields. Um, we are uh, always thinking about ways to support our teachers and faculty, and the state plan really helps us define the processes and procedures for how we really use the money at the state level, but then also how we evaluate success. Um, so what are the ways that, uh, what are, what's the data that we're gonna collect, how are we gonna analyze it, and then what essentially are we gonna report back to the Department of Education, and then what's gonna help um, inform some of the decisions that we make at the state level in how we wanna spend the funding. 
So just a little overview on the state plan timeline. You can see we've been pretty hard at work for the last six months. Um, we are currently posted for a 60-day written public comment period. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end so that if anyone is interested in participating, they can do that. Uh, we are, <clears throat> excuse me, in the obviously March 24, hoping for your approval today. And then, um, uh, you know, assuming that we get your approval, um, we will uh, work with the governor's office to request um, his support. <clears throat> with uh, a letter just saying that he uh, agrees with our strategies and supports our work, and that's something that um, we anticipate will happen, and then the state plan will be submitted on May 10th. So uh, as Chair Southworth mentioned, we, do, we had a fantastic Perkins State Plan Committee. Um, this is something that is actually written into Montana statute, um, and so it's something that, uh, it's a group that we get together only when we're reviewing the state plan, so it's every four years, um, but <clears throat> excuse me, These uh, this list of folks, I'm sure they're all familiar to you. They're all very involved in, um, in so many different areas, both at the education level and the workforce development level. They're all fantastic partners. Um, I love to tell everybody that every single person on this list has spent time in the classroom. They know what students are experiencing, what they need, um, you know, what life in the classroom actually looks like. And so their insight was just so incredible. And we, we, I just can't say enough about this amazing committee that we uh, were able to pull together to help work on the plan. So, um, you know, one thing that I wanted to point out is that we, we actually simplified um, our, our statewide vision, and I'm not going to read it to you, um, but just to let you know, you know, we really kept the spirit of the last state plan, but we, we did try to simplify things just in an effort to, um, you know, drive some more of that work that sometimes it's useful to have um, a little bit more of an efficient, uh, succinct uh, kind of vision for us to run with, and so I think that was a positive change. A couple of other changes for you to note. Um, we have uh, performance indicators, and, th and that's that data I was talking about where we kind of evaluate our success. You know, we really took the time to, um, to think through with the committee, you know, what data do we feel uh, really confident about as far as validity, uh, reliability, how we can collect it year over year, um, and, you know, making sure that um, you know, comparing one year to the next that we feel comfortable with the numbers and where they're coming from. And so we did, we updated a few of our performance indicator definitions and I, I feel very comfortable with where we landed on those. Um, we increased our funding uh, for our state institutions. So this um, is a pot of funding that goes to our Montana State Prison, the Women's Prison, and then the Pine Hill School. They're doing such fantastic work with career and technical education and certifications for those folks. And so we increased the funding that is gonna go there. We also increased funds um, to support career exploration in middle school. A big change from Perkins 4 to Perkins 5 was that we were allowed to um, use funds for activities for students that were much younger. And so we are um, seeing that that's really important to talk to these students um, when they're still in middle school before they get to high school so they can start thinking about these things. And so we've increased the funding that we can use to those activities for those students. And then we're always thinking about ways to strengthen secondary and post-secondary collaboration. We wanna make sure that if a student is in um, a CTE pathway, uh, at the secondary level, if they choose to pursue that at the post-secondary level, it should be a, a fairly easy transition for that student. Um, they, they should be familiar with, um, you know, the terms and, and everything that they would need to be successful in the post-secondary level. So much of that is partnering with industry and industry associations, knowing what they're looking for. You know, we talk a lot about, like, these soft skills, 21st century skills, employability skills. That's a huge part of it, and that's a big part of Perkins as well. Um, we, those have to be embedded in each of our CTE pathways, and knowing what industry is looking for is a huge way for us to accomplish that. Um, and then we are always thinking about ways to be innovative with technology and um, these learning options. You know, Perkins is really um, an access uh, type of legislation, and so making sure that every student in Montana, regardless of where they're located, what opportunities they might have in their community, they should have access to these quality career and technical education programs because they do have such um, positive outcomes for students, and so making sure that that's available all around the state 
In a big state like Montana, we are always thinking of ways to use technology and use um, these different learning models to help serve those students um, all over. So one uh, thing that we've, and, and it actually was brought up a couple of times yesterday, is you know building this awareness of the great work that's happening. Um, you know, we're asked sometimes, like, what, why aren't you doing more with CTE? And the, the fact is, is that we're doing quite a bit with CTE. Um, and we just are trying to get better at telling our story and celebrating the successes. And so um, with COVID not being too long ago, we had some money that was left over in the state leadership uh, pot of funds from Perkins. And one of the uh, ways that we're allowed to use that funding is to actually build some CTE awareness. So we uh, partnered with a production company who helped make some really incredible videos. I have three that are completed. I, I would love to show you one of them today. Um, I'm going to show you the workforce development video, but we also have um, videos on uh, CTE dual enrollment, healthcare careers, IT business careers, skilled trades, gender non-traditional, work-based learning. Um, and so just a really uh, fantastic highlight of what's going on around the state. Every school that participates, every post-secondary school that participates in Perkins is highlighted in at least one video, including our three tribal colleges. So that's really exciting to showcase um, just the great programs that are all around the state that uh, all of our students have access to. Um, and each video is about three minutes long. Um, they will be um, featured on our website. All of our school partners are able to use them. We're thinking about ways to take advantage of some social media campaigns, things like that. Um, but having these videos um, kind of at our disposal, I think, is going to help us build some CTE awareness. And so, Mr. Chair, if you are okay, I'd love to show a three-minute video, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Thank you. As industries advance and evolve, colleges across Montana are responding with innovative career and technical education programs. These programs are tailored to meet the demands of a dynamic industrial landscape and equip students with the skills and knowledge needed to thrive in advancing professions. I'm Mark Fairbairn. I'm the site leader and director at the Boeing Helena facility. Standing here at Helena College, we're partnered with the college to really drive curriculum development so that the, the skills the students are learning when they when they come through the, the classes here are applicable to, to the skills that we need in our business. Even though we have a, you know, an international brand and a very strong brand, getting down and in, into the local communities and organisations and associations has been crucial in making this pipeline work and that's where we really appreciate the leverage that Helena College has in the community and helping us to, to expand that pipeline. My name is Brandon Cassidy and I'm one of the three instructors out here at Highlands College for the Pre-Apprentice Lion School. We reach out to all of our all of our surrounding REAs and cooperatives as well as Northwestern Energy and speak to them in length on the things that they want to see us teaching these kids so that they come out ready to hit the ground running. These programs integrate skilled-based training with practical knowledge from foundational concepts to direct application. In top-tier labs, students are readied for immediate roles in their industries. My name is Adam. I work here at Quantel by LumaBird. I graduated the Photonics and Laser Technology program at the Gallatin College through MSU. The technical degree with more hands-on training, if that's how you learn, that is a better way to go a lot of the time. I learned things by doing them, and we had the ability to do that and really get a grasp of where we were headed when we graduated the program. Not to mention the cost difference was a huge factor for me. The Photonics program came out of a need from industry. Here in Bozeman, we have over 35 photonics companies, and as they march from R&D into production, they realize that they need technicians to actually build the lasers. These programs are more than just a bridge between education and practice. They are incubators of skilled expertise, turning education into action. Education aligned with industry needs cultivates a skilled, adaptive workforce. My name is Corinne Porter. I'm an avionics technician at Bridger Aerospace, and I'm an instructor for Gallatin College avionics program. The role of an avionics technician is that we're responsible for maintaining communication systems, navigation systems, anything that has a wire running to it, it's our responsibility to maintain. And as the industry is progressing and the technology is progressing, we're seeing that avionics aspect and expand into more and more systems on our aircraft. 
So it's super important for us to continue teaching students how to get into this program and into this industry and keep the industry moving. My name is Simon. I'm a avionics student at Gallatin College, MSU. I'm interested in planes. Uh, I've always really loved automotive mechanics, and so this is just a step up from that, a little bit more uh, in depth and more intense, and I think that's super cool and exciting. Just walking through and seeing the planes every day, it helps you dream a little bit about where you can go with this program. Echoing industry advancements, these accessible and affordable programs are producing highly sought after graduates, primed with advanced skills in their fields. And so go for it. Get a trade, get into an industry, and while you're still learning about yourself and what you want to do with your life, that's a really great place to be. Discover what's out there at applymontana.mus.edu. So um, as you can see, I, th I think those turned out pretty well. We have a, a whole bunch of them coming um, soon. They should all be done, uh, I think, within the next couple of months. So excited the way th about the way those turned out. Um, and then I, the only other thing I want to point out for you all is that um, attached to the agenda is um, the entire draft of the state plan as well as an executive summary. If you don't want to take the time to read the entire state plan, I, I won't blame you. Um, but we, we have those both attached in the agenda today for the board as well as on our public comment. Um, page on uh, the MUS website, um, and, and this is open until uh, the end of April, um, and it's a, it's a federal requirement, but um, we always appreciate public comment from, um, you know, members of the community, students, um, some of our agency partners, things like that, and so if anyone feels uh, like they'd like to leave a comment, please do, and, and we address all of those. Every comment that we receive, we address uh, in our final version of the state plan that we submit to the Department of Education. So, um, you know, again, please uh, take the time to visit that, comb through the information. And uh, with that, I am happy to stand for any questions. Uh, uh, brilliant presentation, Jackie. Thank you. Um, do you, any questions, comments from the regents? Uh, this Sergeant is pretty practical. So it gets submitted in May, and when will the decision be rendered? Um, so Mr. Chair, Regent Dabrowski, typically, I think last time it took maybe about a month, um, and that's, you know, assuming that they don't have any, um, you know, edits or changes for us. And the dollars would flow? The dollars, so the Board of Regents is our uh, eligible entity, and then OCHI administers on behalf of the board. And that, the, the new dollars would come like July? Regent Dabrowski, it, it, it is largely a, a formula grant, so the dollars are going to be Not ongoing. But it's, it's more, are we setting out a plan that fits with how, how those dollars are meant to be used? And so there's an opportunity for Octay, the group that administers Perkins, to work with Jackie and team on what that state plan looks like. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, reflecting on the, the survey yesterday that was presented uh, to the board, the uh, perceptions of the value of higher education. One of the barriers um, that was identified was people living in rural Montana having access to high-quality um, education options. Just wondering if you can speak a little bit to sort of this year's plan and how we may be able to address that known barrier. Sure, absolutely, Mr. Chair, Regent Lozart. So, um, you know, as far as Perkins specifically, we do um, fund quite a bit at the post-secondary that level that technology that helps deliver uh, quality CTE at a distance. We see a lot of that technology happening. Um, we have equipped classrooms at the both the secondary and post-secondary level so that there can be um, synchronous learning opportunities for students from rural communities in Montana. They can essentially take classes at a school that is 300 miles away. Um, and so we've used the money to equip uh, those classrooms. At the secondary side, there's a lot of work being done. Um, you know, one of those, the, one of the ways to do that is through CTE dual enrollment. Um, and of course, that can be challenging with getting these CTE instructors, especially, you know, you just heard that they can make such a great living um, outside of the classroom. But there's been a lot of ways to incentivize those students to come back. And, and sometimes it's just a lot of, you know, they, they enjoy serving their community. And so they enjoy being back in the classroom. 
Um, and so, uh, and then we're also seeing that secondary schools, along with the Digital Academy as well, um, they're figuring out ways to share resources, um, you know, share teachers that have the expertise that can teach those courses, whether they're CTE dual enrollment or just straight secondary CTE. Um, so there's a lot of innovation happening. Am I missing anything, Joe, that should be Just the out? one thing that I might add that's related to this plan in particular. Um, so cur historically in Montana, the way that Perkins dollars have typically flown secondary and post-secondary is to the bulk of the money goes to individual institutions to support CTE equipment and programming. On the secondary level, that individual institution, that can be a small pot of funding. And so this is creating some of the groundwork to consider how do we have those conversations on a more regional or consortial level of small institutions so that where, you know, a few thousand dollars going to one small high school might not get you the strategy to offer multiple programs, but can we think about that on a larger aggregate level to build out you know, tools, resources that can serve multiple districts, multiple schools? That hasn't historically been the way that Perkins operated in Montana, but it is how it operates in many, many other states where there are smaller rural institutions that are thinking about how do we use a finite pool of funding to structure programs that can serve a broader set of of secondary schools, of high schools. And, and Joe, Regent Lozar, it's also becoming a lot more common for these groups of high schools to work together, um, but then also partner with a post-secondary institution just to expand those resources available. Um, and so, you know, we're, I think we're hoping to be pushing that model in the next few years in Montana. Um, luckily, because of technology, uh, geographically, it's not as much of a challenge as it used to be. So you know, a, a school on the, the western side can partner with a school that's, you know, a few hundred miles away and, and still get the benefit. Great. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, really appreciate all the work. Uh, Montana is fortunate to have access to your mind, so thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll roll into our uh, number two on the agenda, I'd uh, like to welcome Dr. Angela McLean to the podium. Regent uh, Southworth, wait, one item before that, apologies. Oh. It's the board policy item. Oh, sorry, sorry. Angela, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll get you up here in just a second. This one will be swift, and, and apologies to, to jump in. There is one draft policy on the Regent's agenda. It's policy 301.12. Uh, Similar to yesterday's discussion, this is coming to you for information at this meeting. We're still, I think, having good discussions with campuses, feedback on, on the language of this policy revision. So this would come to the Regents in May, uh, potentially with some alterations from this draft text. But these changes really are aiming to do two things. The first is that in our current definitions of two-year degrees and credentials and shorter certificates, um, we realized that there were some classes of degrees and certificate offerings that our institutions uh, wanted to offer that had purpose and usefulness for students, but that were not captured in our policy. So a key example is a certificate of general studies. So this is capturing when a student has completed a general education curriculum. Most of our students who transfer, transfer before they finish a full associate's degree. So trying to get and capture on that transcript the fact that they're due that completion of their gen ed. Um, that was a useful certificate. Some campuses offered it. It wasn't clearly reflected in kind of our taxonomy here. Uh, the second piece is aligning some of this with uh, the definitions that we use for data tracking and have used for data tracking in our system, trying to make sure that those are aligned and clean and have some shared and common definitions around them. Uh, we're having, a, I think, some good discussion in particular around certificates of completion that hasn't existed in this policy before. They have existed historically in the university system and trying to understand what's, what's the most purposeful definition, what are some of the use cases there. Uh, is, is that something that we want to, to add to this policy? But uh, here for your consideration and, and knowing that you will see it in May. Great, sorry to skip you there. Um, any questions for the Deputy Commissioner? Uh, 
this time for real, Angela, please come up to the podium. Thank you so much, Regent Southworth. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, great to join you once again here at the podium. Uh, this Regent meeting, I promise this is my last time this meeting coming to the podium, but I do look forward to having a great visit with you in May about some promising workforce development outcomes that we're seeing with some of the work that we're doing. Uh, for this presentation, though, I get to visit with you about the landscape that is ever changing around Montana, Montana's charter schools. Um, so the legislature last session approved two bills. One was House Bill 562, and that was dubbed the Community Choice Schools Act, and that one is tied up in litigation. The second one that was approved is House Bill 549, and that one is labeled the Public Charters School Act. And that bill specifically provided for Board of Public Education approval. And we do have one of the BPE members in our midst with Dr. Ron Slinger, who you will be hearing from momentarily on a, another item. And when they put out the call for the charter school proposals, I think the Board of Public Ed, as well as the bill sponsor, and certainly other lawmakers anticipated maybe a handful of charter school applications. Uh, interestingly enough, they got uh, close to five handfuls of applications, and uh, 19 of them were ultimately approved by the Board of Public Education and they approved MOUs uh, for those approved charter schools on February 28th. And when they did that, they unlocked the funding mechanism to go forth for these charter schools to kick off. And it's my understanding as I stand here today that all but one of the charter schools will be launched this July. So as we move into this conversation, one of the things that uh, we did was we took a good look at all of the proposals to see where there were linkages between the proposals and our Montana University system campuses. And as we did, and as we had conversations with our campuses about those proposals, as well as with board member Slinger, we discovered that the charter school proposals that engage our campuses fall into one of three categories. Uh, there are those that provide flexibilities for homeschool students, and we have a significant opportunity, especially on the west side of the state, to bring more homeschoolers back into our K-12 systems through the charter school mechanisms. And I think there's some promising models out there that will do just that. Second, we saw charter schools that had work-based learning opportunities built right into them. And then finally, there were pathways around dual enrollment. And there are a lot of conversations already underway, some further along than others, around a multitude of, of these three categories. And I want to thank our campuses for their leadership. So a couple of things that we've done to make sure that we are supporting from the system level each of the charter schools and the conversations as they roll out is we convened our campus team members uh, as prescribed in some of the proposals around uh, a conversation on Fe February 15th. And we had, I think, over 30 folks from the MUS campuses uh, who signed into that very important conversation. Some of the emerging themes you see up here, a lot of conversation around funding models, uh, a lot of conversation around uh, what the student support uh, system might look like as we design the pathways for these students from high school into the MUS through these charter schools. And then finally, the ultimate theme of the day that emerged was there are extraordinary opportunities for not only our K-12 partners, but for our MUS campuses in these charter schools as they roll out and that we need to be ready. So with that, uh, we decided that another convening was important. Uh, we reached out to the Digital Academy and we have set a meeting coming up this week uh, where we will vet the proposals a little more thoroughly with our K-12 partners. They've been invited to the table along with each of our post-secondary campuses where we anticipate some partnerships and some engagement. And so we want to make sure that we are ready at every level to plug in and support uh, this initiative uh, and make sure that there's uh, thoughtful efforts uh, as much as there can be uh, at the system level with this ever-changing 
uh, landscape uh, that is the Montana Charter School conversation right now. And so with that, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, I would turn it over to, to you to see if there are any questions. Uh, thanks, Angela. I, just one, I, I'll try to make this into a question and not a statement, but the, um, the, the funding models, the, specifically the agreements between school districts and our campuses, um, you know, when we're talking about, you know, the, the local tax money, K-12, like, um, you know, 19 coming online at the same time, just concerns there, like, I just, you know, the, the, it, what would be, I guess, in my mind, helpful and where I'm hopeful is that there's kind of a one size that fits all. There, there is a template that can work um, for everybody in, in lieu of, you know, um, you being handed off 19 chainsaws to, to juggle. Um, so, th yeah, I didn't do a good job with the question. That was a, definitely a statement. But um, I'll leave it at that and open it up for questions, comments from the regents. Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was going to ask about the funding models as well. Just, in, just curious what we need to be thinking about or knowing about in the university system with regard to, to funding, knowing this is primarily a, a K-12 uh, initiative. So what, what are the implications for us from a funding perspective? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Lozar, um, I think that uh, I am picking up what you're putting down. And, and first of all, I would tell you that uh, uh, one of the th reasons that we decided to engage very early on, as soon as we saw these proposals uh, and the conversation at the Board of Public Education, was we saw a need for us at the system level to engage in a way that would support streamlining of as much of the efforts around all of the 14 that would connect uh, with our MUS campuses as possible. And so that is exactly why we are plugging into these conversations and seeing what kind of uh, efforts we can establish at the system level to make sure that we're not uh, duplicating efforts or reinventing the wheel uh, as each of these charter schools come online. So I, I think I, I heard a little bit of a, of a question about streamlining efforts. And then uh, second to that, um, one of the first themes that emerged during our conversation with our campuses was the conversation around what does uh, the funding model look like for things like uh, uh, an early college system. And, and I think that you're absolutely right in that the funding model uh, certainly is built around the K-12 funding model. Um, but I think that it's certainly something that we need to be thinking about uh, in this room and around this table, especially out ahead of the next legislative session. And these are conversations that uh, Deputy Commissioner Teal and I have had. Um, I have had with the Executive Director of the Board of Public Education. Um, but it might involve other folks, uh, including lawmakers. I mean, we, we've talked about a, a number of things that, that could ultimately uh, be conversations that we have around streamlining uh, further, uh, what opportunities could mean not only for our K-12 partners with the funding, but potentially with us and, and a recognition of who are our K-12 students. And um, when they earn enough uh, credits towards their high school diploma, uh, when could other opportunities for funding post-secondary efforts kick in? And so I just think that there's a lot of things that we don't know around these models right now, but I think that a lot of those conversations could and most likely will take shape over the course of the next seven to eight months. Um, and, I, and I do anticipate some real conversations about it, certainly at the legislative front. Um, it was uh, at top of mind for the Ed Interim Committee earlier this week. Um, Dr. McLean, could you, are the, of the 19, how, how many intend to have uh, high school students? Like how many intend to be full K-12? All of them or some of them? Or? Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, what I would tell you is uh, in my review of all 19 of them, I would tell you that there's 14 where I think there could be strong connections with the Montana University System campuses. And so one of the things I want to point you to in your packet is uh, I worked uh, with the Board of Public Ed uh, and where the executive summaries were not made available to me through that. I actually uh, crafted the executive summaries and they are attached in your packet. And so I would invite you to take a look at those and see what questions might emerge. And uh, by all means, if you're interested uh, in joining our meeting on the 20th, we can get you the Zoom link. Um, because this is really a time of discovery around these charter schools. And um, one of the 
uh, phrases that I continue to hear is we don't know what we don't know, but we are going to be ready uh, to support our campuses as this effort rolls out. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. McLean, and thanks for being ahead of the curve on this. Um, look forward to future updates on it. I think this is exciting. Uh, moving along in the agenda, we're going to uh, uh, we'll introduce our two-year panel. Uh, I'd like to welcome up uh, Dean Gallagher, Dean Erdman, and President Slinger, uh, and then uh, Deputy Commissioner, if you'd like to set this up, please do. Glad to, and perhaps actually if we could pull up, we, we have a few slides, and I, I'd love to uh, give the Regents uh, some sense of what this esteemed group is going to share today, uh, set the stage a bit for them. And if we move to the next slide, you know, one thing that I think we forget often is how broad the charge that we've given our two-year institutions is. Um, this, what you see on this slide, is the mission that you set for your MUS two-year colleges in board policy. See. Lifelong learning opportunities, community development, adult basic education, certificates in applied science degree, workforce development, transfer associates degrees. Uh, these institutions are meant to be the way that Montanans access the breadth of education uh, and access for all Montanans to that breadth. And uh, that's a lot, particularly for uh, campuses that serve rural communities, are small in size. Uh, to say there are people wearing multiple hats is a dramatic understatement. And we, uh, visiting with Regent Southworth, uh, want, wanted to provide uh, over the next four meetings an opportunity to kind of survey the breadth of that uh, through the voice of uh, the deans, the CEOs, the presidents of these institutions in, and highlight some of the innovative work that they're doing in different areas of that mission. We also highlight where there's some opportunities or where there are some barriers. And uh, I, given the presentation we just heard from Dr. McLean, I think it's very appropriate that we're talking about dual enrollment and secondary pathways today as our highlight. Um, dual enrollment is has grown dramatically and is also changing dramatically in the state of Montana. And so I think it's a really good time to both highlight some of the directions it seems to be going that we think are innovative and exciting and also talk about where perhaps that changes some of our concepts around policy, supporting students, funding models, et cetera. If we can move to the next. And just why that matters a little bit is that nationwide, nationwide dual enrollment has grown and it's grown for a reason. It's because we see that uh, when it is evaluated well, and that's challenging to do, it seems to be associated with all sorts of things that we care about. Uh, if you participate in dual enrollment, controlling for your academic background, your school's uh, delivery models, college matriculation increases, on-time graduation increases, you have higher earnings, you don't necessarily graduate from college faster, but you oftentimes uh, graduate with more opportunity to take uh, further credits and build your skill set so that you are more employable. And uh, certainly in Montana, like the nation, we've seen dramatic growth. Just to remind you, uh, a decade ago, one in 10 Montana high school students earned a college credential before, a college, college credit before they graduated. Uh, last year, it was one in three. And just thinking what that also means for these institutions, a decade ago, Typically in spring is when you see higher dual enrollment. Uh, decade ago, spring headcount, dual enrollment count, uh, was 14% of these institutions' spring headcount. Uh, 2023, in spring, it was 46% of their headcount. So we're seeing a substantial shift in terms of the students that they're serving, the staff that they need to serve those students, the staff that they need to help those students understand how the courses that they are taking relate to their aspirations in future college career. And so um, nationwide, and I want to recognize Tom Gallagher, Missoula College have participated in, in some of this work, uh, but there's a lot of focus on where do we take dual enrollment next. It's at greater scale. We're seeing a tighter interconnection between 
high school and college. Um, but also some challenges in terms of how do we reach that next mile in terms of access? Uh, how do we make it so that there is clearer alignment between college degrees and careers and what students are taking as part of dual enrollment? Uh, how do we leverage dual enrollment for career exploration? Uh, and how, when it's reaching this level of scale, do we ensure that it's high quality? Uh, and so I'm gonna stop talking because that was quite a monologue uh, and turn it over to our three two-year leaders here, uh, starting with President Slinger, just to, to share a bit of their perspectives and some of what's happening on their campuses in this realm. Thank you so much, and I'll back that microphone up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Southworth, uh, members of the board, uh, and Commissioner, it is an honor for me to be here today representing our faculty and staff who are doing outstanding work at Montana's oldest, and dare I say, President Kerr's best uh, community college in the state, Miles Community College. Uh, the Montana Chamber of Commerce a few years ago did a survey of over 1,000 businesses in this state and that survey came back with workforce as their number one concern. They did not mention technical skills. What they mentioned was soft skills. We at the time were looking to redesign our career development course. I took that survey, handed it to our team and said, I want to be able to tell the business community we heard them and we have responded. I want to be able to say that every graduate of Miles Community College, whether their pathway is directly in the workforce or to continue on to the emergency system is job ready. That's the exact skills that they want. They did a fantastic job. What you see in front of you is College Studies 111. It is a, has, it's only a one credit course. This course does your typical career exploration, also does resume and does mock interviews, but you'll see on the course topics on the right, it also touches the soft skills they talked about, emotional intelligence, time management, effective communication, conflict resolution. We launched this with our own students in fall 22, and the feedback we received from them was phenomenal. They kept telling us, no one's ever told us these things before. They also told us that they felt so much better prepared to enter the workforce and understood better what the expectations of their employer will be. We realized pretty quickly that if they're telling us that no one's ever taught them this before, we need to get this into the high schools. So we created a vehicle to do that, that we call the Opportunity Realized Program. We piloted that in spring of 23 with two local school districts. Um, Terry Public Schools and Jordan Public Schools. They agreed to enroll their entire senior class, both school districts, um, it, with this course with us for free. They, we had the exact same feedback from them. Those students had a phenomenal experience and um, really gave us inclination that we were on the right track. So we continued recruiting school districts. I am excited to tell you that as of today, we are now partnered with 31 school districts and two nonprofits. What that has resulted to us is this. In FY21, our annualized headcount at Miles Community College was 943. This year, our annualized headcount is 1,343. So there's a 42% increase. And when you dive in and Montana resident headcount, it actually is even higher. It's 45% increase. Two years ago, I was at this very regent's meeting and I, Regent Bow and I had a cover, he's smiling because he remembers that conversation. And he asked me, uh, how are things going at Miles Community College? And of course I assured him it's always sunshine and daisies at Miles, but I'm excited about several initiatives we have going and I actually believe that if we do these correctly, that within three to four to five years, we actually will be able to double in size. And he looked at me and said, I'm gonna hold you to that. Well, Regent Bao, I'm gonna tell you this. I firmly believe that if we don't accomplish that goal by fiscal year 25, we will by fiscal 26. We will more than double the size of our college without adding one square foot of facilities. So we believe in this. Um, I, I fully understand that I'm blighted by the clarity of my vision on this, and our college is fully committed to this. Um, and this, uh, we are literally just in the first phase. There's several other phases of the Opportunity Realize program that allows us to capitalize on this recruitment. But when you really think about it, we've basically, through this program, we've taken our recruiting funnel from a 55 gallon pail to an Olympic sized swimming pool. Because we have school districts that are enrolling their entire 
junior class, their entire sophomore class, and they're doing that every year, which means in Montana, we know 50% of high school graduates don't go to college. Through this program, our vision is that in eastern Montana, every kid goes to college. I'm not saying to get a degree or certificate, but I do want them to have at least this course. That is a game changer for them. It's a game changer for the community. And quite frankly, I think it's a game changer for the MUS because this will be a pathway for those students as they continue on. At this time, I will just uh, leave you with two words, go pioneers. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to discuss some of the great things that we have going on at Missoula College and in Missoula at the University of Montana. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit back some more. A little bit about uh, opportunity and, and value proposition. So we, we have high school students who have completed nearly all requirements for their high school diploma before their senior year and are left with part-time schedules as 12th graders. And we have an opportunity here to blur the 12th and 13th grade and support the many well-qualified students who are ready to accept the rigor and challenge of college coursework during their junior and senior years in high school. And a value proposition is to help more individuals choose pathways to earn college degrees and certificates that improve their social and economic mobility. So what do we know? We know that dual enrollment students are more likely to finish high school, persist in post-secondary education, and accumulate college credits than their non-dually enrolled peers. Uh, we also, at Missoula College, we're an institution that is fully engaged in guided pathways as our continuous strategy for college reform. And as other colleges across the country advance their guided pathways reforms, we've found the opportunity to reach into high schools to help high school students start exploring their interests and program options and developing a college and career plan um, is, is an opportunity that we really would like to take advantage of. Uh, researchers from across the country right now and primarily at the Community College Research Center are studying these. These are cross-sector partnerships, understand how community colleges can support their students at an earlier stage in their educational journey. The other thing we find is that earning college credit in high school enables more students, especially those historically underrepresented in higher education, to pursue college after high school. Opportunities to earn college credit in high school are unevenly distributed currently, leaving many students who stand to benefit the most with little access to them. And these are the things that we're trying to change. So up on the, on the screen here, you'll, you'll see uh, the DEEP framework which is uh, dual enrollment equity pathways. And uh, what we're finding is that the greatest impact of uh, institutions who have, have implemented DEEP um, have had the greatest impact on, on serving students from low income communities. So the model that's been created with DEEP is early outreach to students, aligning pathways and dual enrollment offerings, advising in the use of individualized learning plans, and high quality education and academic support. So I'm gonna describe a pilot program that was initiated here in 2021 in partnership with um, Frenchtown High School, one of our class A schools in the Missoula region. And uh, I wanna recognize as we go through this, these collaborations, uh, don't take place without some really, really wonderful people. And we have an amazing team at Missoula College, Jordan Patterson, Grace Gardner, and Ben Nelson leading these efforts. But we also have an equally amazing team at Frenchtown High School with their principal, Jay Keynes, Counselor Beth Terzo, and Robin Richardson. So the key to this program was building those relationships and those people coming together to look at how we can help our students and we created a pilot program where students are gonna earn their general education certificate by the time they graduate for high school. So this started with outreach to students and that outreach actually took place during their freshman year in high school. So freshman orientation session took place during spring semester 2022. Students, parents, teachers, and representatives from the college gathered 
to form this, this new pilot program. Second step in this was aligning. So our general education was selected as a pathway that is, is very general and could serve the most students. Um, doesn't mean it's the only pathway we can create, but it, it provided a, a really great launch point to, to start this, this uh, collaboration. So dual enrollment and early college coursework were aligned to form a learning pathway for these incoming high school freshmen. And it started with their sophomore year where they took one dual enrollment course. And then through their, their junior and senior years, they will continue on and, and finish off the re remainder of their general education. Um, advising students in this program all have an individualized learning plan. And that individualized learning plan has started their freshman year in high school. And then support. I mentioned those, those folks that, that do a really wonderful job on both sides. That cross-sector team um, was put together to ensure that, that there's progress checks, advising continues, and there's coordination between course scheduling at both institutions. Because some of these courses are taken at Missoula College. Um, they don't necessarily have to come onto campus. There's a little bit of a distance. It's about 30 miles to Frenchtown from Missoula. Um, but there's, uh, there's opportunity with, with uh, different modalities of learning for them. So here's our early results. From that academic year 21-22 freshman cohort, we have 28 students enrolled in that right now. They will be finishing their junior year of high school later in June. These individuals will graduate as part of the class of 2025 and are on track to be graduates of Frenchtown High School and also graduates from the University of Montana with a certificate of general studies and will be on well poised to complete three-year baccalaureate degrees or continue forward into a CTE credential or associate degree. We also have a second cohort of 30 students which formed during spring of 2023 and there will be the class of 2026. So right now we have 58 students in this program so and we anticipate a third cohort will be forming later in the spring of 2024 with graduation in the class of 2027. So what have we learned? We learned that embracing, and we're early still, we don't have our first graduates, we'll see them soon. I would look forward to, to uh, having them do something that, that's pretty rare, graduate high school and also graduate with a college credential. At Frenchtown, we find that because of the localized approach, we have student scholarship funding that's available through the PTA and their local organizations. Um, we've also found that Frenchtown has utilized this program to develop a charter school to help provide greater support. We're also working with Big Sky High School in Missoula. They have already established their own pathways and our work right now continues in aligning these pathways with college courses and then credentials, so that students graduate with certificates and degrees, and it might happen before they finish high school, it might have after they finish high school. And then lastly, in Ravalli County, we've uh, developed through UM Bitterroot College uh, partnerships with existing high schools in Corvallis and, and uh, again in Hamilton. Again, very localized approach. Um, Corvallis has a pathways approach. Hamilton is constructing a polytechnic institute and again, it is serving as a uh, charter school. And uh, Christina Berger, who's with us, you'll hear from her a little bit later uh, this morning. Tom Course, Pete Joseph, and Cami Edgar have all been really, really uh, key uh, players in this. Lastly here, what's next? And I, I think probably our, our, uh, our next steps need to be really looking at how we might be able to scale these programs. And we have two, uh, I think, two challenges in this one building capacity, like having enough capacity as we start looking at, and, and a simple example with Frenchtown, at, when we're at, at um, full capacity there, we ha we'll have three cohorts of approximately 25 students. They'll be taking 30 credits and, um, and three different cohorts, and we're anticipating about 2,250 student credit hours for you, those of you that wanna do some arithmetic on that. And so building that capacity is, is going to be one of our challenges. And the second one is a business model. You know, we, we haven't, we've, we've stepped into this. It's a wonderful program. It's, it's definitely going to um, benefit students, but we, we have to figure out how we're going to conduct business. So 
I'll stop there. Thank you. Chair Southworth, Deputy Commissioner Teal, thank you for putting this together for us this morning to share about dual enrollment opportunities across the state of Montana. As you heard from President Slinger and Dean Gallagher, the two-year colleges across the state have developed unique approaches to providing dual enrollment opportunities to secondary students in our regions. Like Flathead Valley Community Colleges and other two-year campuses across the state, Great Falls College is proud to have offered dual enrollment opportunities for a very long time. In fact, we've been doing this for 20 years, since 2004. High school students in our regional service areas can take classes in three different ways. They can take them online, they can take them on site, and they can do it through concurrent enrollment <coughs> offerings. I'll first talk about the on-site and the online courses open for dual enrollment. And basically, all of the on-site and the online courses we offer at Great Falls Colleges are available in this manner. This is because all of our faculty and our adjunct faculty at Great Falls are at Great Falls College are required to obtain their class eight licensure. And as a result, all of our classes can be taught through dual enrollment. We often have homeschooled students take advantage of this opportunity by filling in curriculum requirements and at other times even more intentional by earning their AA or their AS degree. In addition, we also have students from the Paris Gibson Alternative High School take on-site classes that count simultaneously toward high school graduation and college credit. More intentional approaches are also available for students to take full program offerings on site in high school. In a unique partnership with Great Falls Public Schools, eight to 12 high school students each year come to our campus every day during the school year to attend classes and complete their CAS in welding. In this long-standing partnership that's been around since 2013, we've had 88 students graduate with their CAS in welding over the years. So the courses and programs in the examples provided are about our on-campus and online offerings taught by Great Falls College faculty and adjunct faculty. And the concurrent course offerings I'll cover next are instructed by high school faculty who have the necessary credentials to teach the subject matter, who have similar responsibilities as all of our adjuncts do. We require them to teach the approved student learning outcomes. They take part in all of our onboarding efforts and they are involved every year in a performance review process. With eight school districts, 41 partner schools, 61 classes, and 34 concurrent instructors, we are pleased with our progress in providing access and opportunity through these concurrent offerings. While they have tended to be in more traditional general education disciplines like history, English, and math, our next step with concurrent offerings is to make these credits count. We are launching a campaign targeted to the dual enrollment students and our partner school districts to make sure the classes that the students choose count toward their future goal, goals. And in addition, we are providing more CTE-based credit opportunities, dual credit opportunities for our students. A newest, very intentional approach in CTE dual enrollment is the option for Great Falls Public Schools and rural students in other school districts to earn their EMT basic certification while they're still in high school. Great Falls Public Schools offers the EMT basic course at CM Russell High School and students from Great Falls High School CMR and the Paris Gibson Education Center attend or participate. Also in Fergus High School in Lewistown, we offer the same course with students from Fergus, Harleton, Hobson, Winnet, Winifred High Schools, and we have one homeschool student in it as well. So basically this EMT course has 25 participants from six schools across five different Montana counties. 
we offered the first EMT basic dual enrollment course for dual credit in 22-23 with 19 students completing that credential. And we're hopeful that all of the participants this year in these, in these two cohorts complete as well. Because the EMT credential is a great career path start that can lead to a paramedic degree or launch students into other healthcare fields. How do we define our success in dual enrollment? And at Great Falls College, the metric that we monitor most closely is this. The percentage of first time freshmen who take dual enrollment courses through Great Falls College and then enroll after high school at Great Falls. That's what we monitor. And our goal is to increase this percentage each year for the next several years. Intentionality with our offering should help us to reach this goal and continue to provide access to higher education opportunities in Montana. So with that, I'll transition back to you, Chair Southworth, Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner Peel. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and apologies, Chair Southworth. I just wanted to provide just one last thanks and also for the Regents, maybe a quick summary of some themes that speaking with these three and other two-year leaders, you know, kind of emerge and lots of innovation going on. I think also some, some real barriers to continued high quality expansion. Um, you know, Dean Gallagher mentioned capacity when we're thinking about expanding access to dual enrollment offerings. There are creative things going on. The Montana Digital Academy has been a great help in uh, partnering with our campuses to offer dual enrollment courses online to more distant high schools. Um, but we often still need and have challenges finding faculty at the high schools with the credentials that are needed to teach dual enrollment. We have some frictions in terms of getting more of our faculty appropriately licensed to offer dual enrollment. You know, thinking about clear pathways and credential attainment, uh, helping students to fund the credits beyond one, two, free, helping them to overcome some of those financial hurdles. And then these are some new models around dual enrollment that are emerging. In the charter school discussion, I think perfectly uh, a, a really important question, Regent Lozar, as to how that will work. Many of those are thinking about using more college faculty and college services, uh, which changes some of the models, the financial models, the business models around dual enrollment uh, in a period where we're also, I think, uh, struggling to think how we sustain one, two, free, where those funding sources come from when dual enrollment is at, at the scale that it is today. So uh, thank you three for sharing. I hope that there's some questions and times for discussion with, with the board, but I, I appreciate you representing all the two-year leaders today. So when, um, you know, Joe just mentioned barriers and, and you know, some of the funding um, issues in the future, but where, where some of the excitement exists in my mind is, I don't want to overuse the word <clears throat> innovation, but I don't know if there's a, a better word for it. <clears throat> I liken, uh, you know, your your panel today, and there's a few others that aren't sitting up, up here uh, on our two-year and community college side that, um, you know, I, I guess as a as I'll just be a self-appointed ambassador from industry for uh, for a second, and and, and kind of some of the some of the advantage I see to to the great work that's going on is that we are shining a light collectively on opportunities for K twelve, but simultaneously, what's happening and what what needs to continue to be talked about is that. There's, there's this pathway from K-12 into the two-year in community colleges, then back to industry. You know, the Department of Labor has, has created uh, apprenticeship programs. So it used to be for like a company like mine, you know, if you weren't 18 years old, you, I, you couldn't come and, and work for me. And, and now that's changing to where um, you can come, we, you know, you can, you can apprentice, you know, um, and then... And then if you like this, or not you, but the, you know, the student likes this, then there's opportunities, and, and the specific opportunities that, like, for, for how we're doing it, I think many more business leaders in the state are going to start picking up on this, and, and it's going to help a lot of the funding models, because 
where, where the juice is here and, and where I think this needs to go for Montana is that industry needs to step up to the table and meet you where you're at, right? So um, very athletic group, you, 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 you hear the needs of our state, you know, very uniquely. Um, you know, the, I'm, I'm proud to be affiliated with you. The, but um, industry participation, I, I believe, is going to look like this in the future, and it's going it's to grow, that we're going to take on youth, we're going to apprentice them, they're going to like what we have to do, and they're going to go from K-12, and then, and then industry is going to send them to you. And a, lot of, and a lot of the programs are already built. It's not like, okay, hey, reinvent the wheel on this. And then we're to, with the offer of bringing, bringing jobs back into our communities, not jobs, um, but the promise of careers, right? I think that there's lots of jobs in the U.S. right now, and I think this is a, a really good opportunity for, for Gen X to create the next generation via you, and it's really easy to justify the investment, um, but I, I just want to communicate that here in this room out loud, and, and, you know, and I want to hear that conversation where it's a lot more people other than me that are talking about it, like, how are we going to sponsor, how is the private sector going to sponsor youth in our communities to go to you, to become educated, to come back home for breadwinning careers? So um, really appreciate all the work um, and just ha hats off. And I'm excited to continue this over the next four meetings. And I know that there's a lot that you didn't talk about at your, at your respective schools that, you know, that I, I hope that, you know, we can shine a light on here at this table. But Thank you for sharing what you did share. Uh, and with that, any any comments, questions, Regent Bell? Um, Chair Southworth, thank you. Uh, panel, thank you. I mean, I think we should take a moment and reflect that that um, this is a pretty staggering amount of innovation we've heard about this morning from the secondary, you know, system and and in combination with us, and that many of these conversations would have been non-starters, you know, two years ago as a result of, and it's been a result of legislative changes um, and innovation on our, on, 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 on a, across the system. So, you know, just the idea that we can have charter schools and be trying to, and, and have so many different ideas. I mean, take a moment and read all the charter school, um, I guess, statements uh, of where they're going, and you can see that we're, we're going to experiment and, and we'll figure out uh, wh what's really working. And, and I have a couple uh, questions. I guess, um, President Slinger, it's, I guess we've extended our bet a year, it sounds like. You've extended yourself a year this morning. Is that what we accomplished? Uh, Chairman Southwood, so region, I'm still holding the F1 oh, okay, okay, okay. Just wanted to check. Yes, sir. Um, and, and how do you, I just have a question about how you're doing your count. Like, so if, you, if, you, if you're offering one credit across to 31 different schools, all seniors take them. And, and is that, I mean, I think about account as an FTE, but, it, but if you get participation, you're, that's what your account looks like, right? Chairman Southwoods, Regent Bowles. So 20% of our FTE is now uh, high school um, students. Okay. So um, with the one credit, obviously it takes 30 of these to equal one FTE. Okay. So on an annualized basis. So um, our program basically is the engagement opportunity, the um, access and opportunity that provides. There is, we are just in the first year of the build out. There, there's several other phases. The next phase is what I call the multiplier. First phase is just the capture of new partners. Um, the next phase is the multiplier phase where you take that individual student and you get them to enroll into the next class and then the next class, okay? Ideally, we'd like this class to be embedded as a junior level first semester. That way, they can take advantage of the one, two, three. They can take advantage. As an independent community college, we have the same type of program as one, two, three, but it's not one, two, three. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, a savvy high school student or a savvy guidance counselor in high school literally could grab two free classes from our college, two free classes from Flathead. And also two free from the <coughs> one, two, three from the MUS school, and really put together an entire semester, okay, of free college for them. And some of them are doing that. Um, so the multiplier effect is trying to enhance their experience where they now take that second course and they get 
I'm more focused to take a third. Um, then it's actually a conversion rate, which will be our next step. So and the easiest way for me to say this is this. Let's say there's a high school, there's 100 seniors, and typically that high school we get after uh, graduation, six of them to matriculate to us full time, right? So it was 6% penetration rate for the high school. Um, but currently in the existing model, we maybe are only seeing out of those 100 kids in that high school, we're only seeing maybe 30 to 35 of them through dual enrollment because those are the kids that are naturally looking to go to college, okay? Through our program, regardless of socioeconomic background, regardless of who your parents are, regardless of where you live, you have taken a college course. You are an MCC student with an MCC ID and you are establishing the MCC transcript. If we can keep that same 6% <laughs> conversion rate, but the N is 100, we do much better. <laughs> we, we have that many more enrolled. So if there were 60 of them when we got six, that's 10%. Actually in our model, we're hoping to increase that conversion rate for that high school to 10 FTE. That is how that will grow um, on our FTE side. Thank you. Um, no, and, and, and you're filling a, a, a need across school districts that are short teachers, so thank you. Dean Gallagher, a question on the, on the Bronx fast track. Um, where do we, so I have a couple of questions about how, uh, the, are, are, we, are you using teachers in that program that are, are certified both at the high school level and and for the, the college courses so that they can earn their certificate? What, what, what does that process look like? Well, that's a, and, and thank you so much, uh, Regent Powell, for that question. That's a, um, a, a good one to have, too. Um, I, I guess it might be best described as a hybrid model where we have, and if you think about dual enrollment, and um, I always think academics, you compare catalogs. And so the academic catalog for high school and college don't always align. You know, there's areas where they, they align very well, math, writing, nice clear alignment, history. There's other areas like psychology, um, anthropology, that we, we just don't teach those in the high schools. So, so we have a, a mixture or that hybrid environment where we do have dual enrollment courses where we have certified teachers that also um, that, that have the appropriate credentials to teach at the college level. And we also have uh, folks that are, are totally college professors that are offering some of these other courses that there is no, there's, there's no equivalent credit at the high school for that, so that's done completely at the college. So it's an early college course. So we have a, we have a mixture. There's not, a, there's not like one, uh, one methodology that works for everyone. Super, thank you. And, and so when, if, you, if they earn their general education certificate, what, what, what status does that give them if, you know, within the university system? I mean, it's not, it's not a degree. What, I, I don't understand what the certificate is. I, I could speak to that, Joe. Um, so it's, a, it's an indicator that a student, in, and so a student can complete the general education core and then trans, or transfer. Sounds a little odd when we start talking about high school students, but can enroll at any of our MUS institutions and have all their general education completed at that time. And so they start off as really sophomore level status and, um, and ready to pursue the last three years of their college career. So, I, I mean, are we saving families money then if they do this and are they entering as sophomores? Is that? That's, at, that's absolutely the, the idea. In fact, that's one of our promotional flyers that we have is that we, we put together the cost of this. And, and I don't have the figure off the top of my head here, but it's substantial. Mm -hmm. And it does save fam families money. The other, the other piece as we start engaging in these pathways that we're looking at, too, is that we find um, our capture rate at, at UM for students that are in dual enrollment, it's maybe like 11 to 13%. And it doesn't sound very high. It doesn't sound like it. And part of that reason is because the, the folks that are, are seeking dual enrollment are going other places. And what's really exciting to me with the DEEP program is that we're, we have an opportunity to bring students in who right now wouldn't be going on to college. And we're, we're really 
penetrating a different market in our local um, in, our, in our local areas that that provide individuals opportunities to improve their <coughs> socioeconomic status through education, and we're bringing them into um, the university. Yeah, no, I, I think we're super excited about the idea of, of reigniting the the idea across all uh, demographics and economic socioeconomic groups that that uh, secondary ed is achievable. So thank you for your work on that. Um, my final question, I'm sorry to get into the details, but so the, the, the college courses that are offered by college professors um, and that are I evidently do not meet, you know, they don't, they don't even fit in with the high school requirements. Are they offered in person or, on, or online? They, they have opportunity for both. And if you think about rural Montana, and I'll, I'll go ahead and loop Frenchtown High School into rural Montana, they're not in the Missoula proper area, and it's a, it's a half an hour drive. So the, the majority of those students are not driving that half hour, they're doing um, online learning. So they've chosen that, that modality. Thank you. Gallagher, <coughs> thanks, Chairman. Uh, any other questions, comments? Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I just concur with all of the other regions have talked talked about the innovations and about um, sort of the growth in dual enrollment. Uh, obviously, for years we've been looking at the, the impressive outcomes um, across a wide uh, spectrum of metrics. So, certainly something that this board supports and really appreciate all the work that you guys are doing in that space. Uh, just thinking from a the barriers place in a policy place. You know, one of the barriers that we hear often for dual enrollment is around um, teachers, having sufficient teachers, and barriers around uh, class eight, um, I know is a real barrier, and I know there's been discussions to s see how we can sort of fix some of those issues. But um, Dean Erdman, one of the things that you mentioned that I don't think I've ever heard is that you were requiring all of your faculty to get class eight um, certified, and that to me is a policy decision at Great Falls College. And I'm just curious if there's, if that is unique in the system that we're requiring that that we're requiring that as a part of employment. And so that's one. And I think a policy thing that we should be discussing is that a best practice? Is that something we should be doing across all of the two years? And then two, uh, and dipping into a little bit of the, the K-12 side, um, knowing they, they are the ones that do the, the licensure, but is there a way by which um, you know, our teacher ed programs in the university systems can also sort of require as a part of their training um, class eight, so when they leave that they have that as well. So it's on sort of both sides of our, our educational system that when they leave we know that we're gonna have sufficient numbers of, of class eight. I know it's class eight, there's some aspects to that that make it a little bit challenging, but I don't know, Dean Erdman, if you can speak to sort of how you develop that policy and if there are others that have any perspective on doing that at the colleges and then how we might be able to embed that class eight and teacher ed programs in the system. Regent Lozar, I appreciate the question about class eight licensure and I will stumble through my response. The policy was put in place before I came to Great Falls College. This has been a longstanding uh, commitment on the part of, of the institution to provide access and opportunity to rural high schoolers to engage in dual enrollment opportunities. So I don't know the answer on how long it's been placed or how that policy was put together. I do know that I am a proponent of continuing with it. Even as we're working through uh, hiring new faculty, as we review the, their background, we ask and look at whether or not they would be eligible for a Class 8 licensure, and it's a decision in our hiring process as well. So it's part of who we are right now. As far as um, teacher ed requirements for Class 8, I believe once a, an individual um, graduates with their teacher education program training. I'm looking over at Angela to see if she's going to help me out here, phone a friend. Um, through the teacher education training programs, they're eligible for their class eight licensure already as a result of that degree, correct? They don't even need it. <coughs> Thank you. Did that, did I answer your question then? Okay. Sure. 
Chair Southworth, uh, Mr. Mosley, I, I would just like to say, I, one, I think that's a great policy. Um, I will just let you know that the Opportunity Realized Program was only taught by Miles Community College faculty and staff. I want us to have that direct connection with the student. In fact, uh, quite frankly, the, there's such a disparity of qualified, and, and I want to be careful, at the high school level, they have to, if they're going to teach a college class, right, they have to have meet our requirements. It's such disparity. At this school, this has one teacher that could qualify for French. This school, it's art. This school, it's math. It is just not an even playing field for all those students. We're taking that equation out at Miles. We're teaching it. And so that way they're enrolled with us, and they get to build a relationship with our faculty and staff right from day one which I also think will help with recruitment and retention. Uh, President, can I respond to President Slinger here? I'm sitting right next yep, to you. Yep, yep. No. <laughs> so our, our instructors have the Class 8 license so that then we can offer all of the classes mm -hmm. available so they are the direct contact with the student then. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dean Karras. Um, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Regent Lozar. Yeah, coming up to the podium. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, Regents and uh, Regent Lozar, just if I could say a few things about the Class 8 license. I know it's been in place for at least 15 or 20 years, and I know Angela McLean and I worked on it many years ago and have had some different uh, opinions on it. I just want to share with you that I think the Class 8 license is very important when we have college faculty teaching at the high school, teaching concurrent enrollment classes. I think the Class 8 license was designed to help faculty teach high school students. However, when we have high school students on the college campus in college classes, they're not identified as high school students. They're one or two high school students in a college class, and we all should be and are, I think, making sure those students are qualified to be in a college class because otherwise we're doing a disservice to students. But when those students are in a college class on a college campus being taught as a college student, I'm not sure it's necessary for our faculty to have to go through the Class A licensing process to be able to teach at a high school. And I think that's something that's been an issue ever since Class A licenses were put in place. And I know there were some reasons for agreeing to that, but I still think uh, for many of our faculty it's a challenge, it's expensive for the colleges, and it really doesn't provide any benefit to the high school students who are being taught at a college class uh, on a college campus. So I have a little bit of a different opinion from some of the other, the deans you've heard, but as president of FECC, and this is my 23rd year doing this, I think that if we could move away from the class eight license requirement, especially at the colleges, that would be a much better opportunity to provide better education for the students we serve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Kerr. Sorry, uh, I agree. Um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Thiel, can you update us on where we stand on this issue? Uh, Regent Bow, thank you. Uh, so for those who, who uh, don't know, Class 8 licensure has changed over time. Uh, recently, Class 8 licensure changed to be upon recommendation of a campus academic officer, but there's an annual fee and an annual relicensure requirement. And that I think is part of what President Karras is, is referencing is that in some of our collective bargaining agreements at the two year level, there are requirements for class eight licensure that does, is sometimes covered by the college, sometimes covered by the individual, uh, is a barrier in terms of the paperwork and the cost. Uh, so while it has gotten much easier, it is not easy. Um, with that said, there are models in, in other states that do not have a similar requirement 
for college qualified faculty to uh, obtain such a license. Uh, we haven't yet gotten too far down the road of mapping out those models in a way that we can make, make a recommendation or start having discussions with, uh, with the Board of Public Ed and others who, who govern some of those spaces. Uh, what we might propose to simplify that process so that we don't have, you know, one of those throttling points in terms of our ability to have our faculty teach at the high school level. Could I, could I join in on that conversation too, just real briefly here? Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but the, one, of the, one of the things that we find that is, seems to be a greater barrier is the high school teacher having the appropriate credentials to teach at the college level. And all high school teachers, there's such great um, and, and motivational tools for moving across the salary matrix to have master's degrees and to, to uh, enhance their education. But that usually takes time, and that usually is later in a teacher's career. And so having that, one of the barriers we continue to, to kind of struggle with is having qualified teachers in the high school who are able to teach college level classes. And if we're gonna continue that model, that's something that, that maybe we need to examine. How can we help those teachers get the master's degree that they need so that they can teach um, college level classes while in the high school environment? So thank you for that. Well, I think you heard me say this before, but I, I agree with that, I'll, I'll, you know, both past speakers. I think what we need to do is is uh, take some leadership between ourselves and the, and the, and the and the um, education committee and, and streamline and, and form a, a process to clarify all this for both sides so that we can avoid these extended discussions about licensure. Because ob it's obvious that the integration between uh, high school and, and secondary ed is, is, is happening without, you know, with, you know all around us. And, and we, you know, if, if it's not exactly our uh, remit to, to resolve that issue, but I think by showing leadership on clarifying those class eight rules, um, we can really um, make it easier for everybody to do what they're actually already starting to do. Uh, thanks, Regent Bao. Uh, any other questions, comments? Um, Dean Erdman, President Slinger, uh, Dean Gallagher, thank you very much. Uh, this is a great conversation. Uh, Tom, you can, I'll save you a walk because you'll, you'll be right there next. So uh, thank you. Um, also like to call up for our, our last agenda item, Director Christina Berger. We're going to have an update on Bitterick College. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Teal. Thank you so much, Chair Southworth. And excited to have Dean Gallagher, Director Berger here. Uh, many of you know uh, the University of Montana has had uh, a college in Hamilton for more than a decade. Uh, for a time, it was capably led by our, our own Dr. Angela McLean, uh, and it's at an important turning point. So there's, for the past few years, been an approved community college district without a levy. Um, that community college district, their trustees are, again, pursuing a levy. We're, we're uncertain of the outcome of that, but in the meantime, I think that uh, Dean Gallagher, Director Berger, Angela of the University of Montana have done some excellent work uh, that deserves being highlighted and discussed. And that's also, I think, importantly, leading to an evolution of the vision and mission of that, that uh, campus location in the Bitterroot, that at future meetings we're hoping uh, we can bring to you uh, an item that would formalize some of what that is. It, it hasn't been officially established in terms of its, its mission, its remit. Uh, there's parts of board policy that have pathways for that, and, and we want to uh, work with Dean Gallagher and the University of Montana to kind of say, Here, here's what this institution is, its relationship to the University of Montana, its mission and vision. So with that, I'll turn it over to these two. Thank you, Commissioner Teal, um, Regent Southworth, um, Madam Chair, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to provide an update on the University of Montana's work at Bitterer College. I will start by taking a moment to introduce Bitterroot College's director, Christina Berger. Ms. Berger joined the University of Montana leadership team in May of 2023, following 14 years of service as a K-12 teacher and administrator at Corvallis School District. She holds a bachelor's degree 
from the Oregon State University, a master's degree in education from Southern Oregon, Oregon University, excuse me, and an administrative certificate from the University of Montana. It's been my sincere pleasure to work alongside Christina during the past 10 months. I found her to be an innovative leader, an amazing teammate, and a staunch advocate for higher education at Bitterroot College. So I'm gonna turn this over to Director Berger and let her lead this uh, presentation. Interesting challenges um, that not every community um, has. We have students that uh, have challenges with transportation, so we have innovative ways for them to zoom into our classes. We have uh, individuals that uh, have lack access to internet. Uh, while it's improving in Ravalli County, uh, it is not equitable or always reliable, so we have in-person classes that they can attend. Uh, and the cost of living is a challenge in many places in Montana and, again, uh, in western Montana in the Bitterroot Valley. Um, so having a local uh, college that students can attend is really important to accessing education. A little bit about us. Uh, we've got the backing of the University of Montana, and we are, offer, we are able to offer students resources of the flagship university while still maintaining autonomy as an extension campus. We are uniquely positioned to meet the needs of our local community and provide innovative programs and opportunities tailored to our specific needs of students and industry. Our high flex hub and spoke model, for example, allows us to expand and offer a wider range of courses and programs while maintaining a personalized and supportive environment and student success uh, services. Most of our courses allow students to attend in person or online, both synchronous and asynchronously. This format extends the walls of our classrooms with strategic use of technology and tools like the OWL split screen, screen projectors, tablets, and auto track cameras that allow our instructors to provide high quality education to students simultaneously online and in classrooms. Courses have been redesigned with high impact practices and include activities that build interactivity, interactivity into our lessons, invigorate discussion sections, and create dynamic learning experiences. We are committed to providing our community with the best possible education, preparing them for success locally. Our focus is on the improvement of our citizens in Hamilton and the Bitterroot Valley, accessing affordable and relevant education. Our vision to enhance our community, and this is the way that we're doing it. We're catering to local industry needs. Since starting in May, I have met with a number of industry leaders to help identify areas where our campus can help provide tailored solutions to each industry's unique needs. Our focus has been on being responsive to that feedback. The development of strategic partnerships with organizations and stakeholders in the community is essential. I believe that by working together, we can achieve greater outcomes and make a more significant impact on the local economy. As previously mentioned, I think the key here is an emphasis on strategic. Bringing the community together requires give and take from both sides. It is equally important that not only the college respond to the feedback from employers, but that industry leaders seek ways to enhance pipelines with creative solutions to assist in things like the recruitment of students, the support of, to employees seeking advancement, and the funding of both the cost of training and equipment and materials to do so. We have a responsibility as an institution to offer training and programs that lead to sustainable living wage jobs, and this requires assistance from industry and strategic partners. We have multiple on and off ramps for advancement, and it is essential that we offer these. Our campus has both credit and non-credit options for students. This allows for our expanded program to improve access for individuals seeking advancement. The new majority learner engaging on our campus has a different set of expectations. We continue to evaluate our programs to serve our community more efficiently and effectively. Examples of this work include our work with education design labs and micro pathways, 
our implementation of guided pathways from Missoula College, dual enrollment equity pathways or DEEP, prior for credit, lear credit for prior learning, and our hub and spoke model. Our overall vision is that the University of Montana Bitterroot College campus <coughs> provides education to enhance the economic and social mobility of our citizens. Being involved in our community and positively contributing to the su success of our entire ecosystem. Our pillars of success for our campus include um, the implementation of a few of these strategies. We have developed degree maps for all of our academic programs at both Missoula College and UM Bitterroot. This includes linking them on our web pages and identifying career and job opportunities, highlighting actual wage data for Western Montana in the various career paths. We've also worked through micropathway mapping to help show non-credit to academic program bridges and career ladders complete with correlations between educational attainment and increases in wages. Our co-rec model, the new majority learner needs a different experience than what was traditionally provided. Lauren Fern has revolutionized the co-rec model and we find it to be wildly successful on our campus. We offer both writing and math course courses in co-rec as well as our anatomy and physiology classes one and two. Ensuring that every student that walks in our door has a way to enter our academic programs regardless of their preparedness for college courses. Our third pillar is student choice and access. We have made very strategic changes to ensure that learning is happening with intentional outcomes. We are working with instructors on the Bitterroot campus to create, strengthen, or repair relationships with faculty at both Missoula College and the University of Montana for collaborative opportunities, professional development, and to ensure the education students receive on campus is the same on any other. We have worked to improve delivery of our high flex model to improve learning in remote and asynchronous modalities. We've been working with Missoula's career coach, OPI's career coach for our region, and local industry partners to uh, provide more career connected learning opportunities to our students. And we're working with industry to ensure that degrees, certificates, and trainings produce students that are ready to thrive in the workforce. <clears throat> Lastly, I believe that UM Bitterroot College's strongest asset is the fact that we have always had a comprehensive wraparound student support model. While this was done because of our small size, it has been reinforced through research that having one point person to contact with questions and support leads to student learning and persistence. We continue to strengthen our support measures with integrations from Missoula College and the main campus to help students make informed choices, strengthen clarity around ease of transfer, and intervene if students go off track. Lastly, I'd like to highlight some of the partnerships with many people have already spoke about today. We have partnerships with K-12 districts in Ravalli County. Ravalli County serves 40,000 plus residents from six different high schools ranging from class A to class C. In partnership with Missoula College, we have recently applied for seed funding to further expand our efforts in dual enrollment. Dual Enrollment Equity Pathways, or DEEP, is a framework that complements the guided pathways work to strategically target underserved populations and help to provide more equitable access to all students. With the passing of legislation for public charter schools, UM Bitterroot College has partnered with both Hamilton School District and their Bitterroot Polytech Charter and Corvallis School District and their RISE Academy. Collaboratively, we are navigating best practices for early college high schools, implementation of DEEP, and individualized learning plans for dual enrollment based on research from the Community College Research Center. Other partners that we have include higher education institutions. Most of our courses on Hamilton campus are taught in that high flex modality, making them accessible not only to our rural students in Ravalli, but across the state of Montana. We also have developed a number of online courses to provide accessibility and innovative ways to facilitate courses like science labs. To highlight more of the Guided Pathways work, I've been working with the University of Montana's College of Education to create a two plus two degree pathway in early childhood and elementary education. We are also working with the College of Forestry to get a two plus two degree pathway there. To provide access to more health science programs, we have partnered with Helena College and offer a licensed practical nurse certificate and Flathead Community College with a Medical Laboratory Technology Associate of Arts in Science. We've had eight total graduates from our LPN program with an additional seven students that will graduate in December. 
We also have one student in our first cohort for the MLT degree. Lastly, we partner with local industry. Our system outcomes and goals for our non-credit programs include financial sustainability and aligned career pathway systems to increase the number of skilled workers with credentials of value to the labor market. Bitteru Health is one of our largest employers in Hamilton, and health science industry is seeing a shortage of trained employees and continued growth and openings across the state. Bitteru Health has been a true partner and engaged employer with us throughout our recent work on the Year to Career Initiative with Education Design Labs and OCHI. Facilitated collaboration between the college and employer has allowed us to make improvements to our clinical certified medical assisting non-credit training to provide more focus on the skills that Bitterroot Health needs medical assistance to have upon entry. That cohort is going to launch April 1st. To further the value of our non-credit training, we've begun to map that non-credit training to academic programs to build crosswalks and career ladders. This past year, we've trained 25 medical assistants, nine phlebotomists, 25 truck drivers with their commercial driver's license and piloted a cohort of six Hamilton High School students to become certified nurses aides. This fall, we will have cohorts of up to 10 students at an additional three area high schools. Accelerate Montana has continued to help market these programs and provide financial assistance to keep these trainings at a reasonable cost to participants as their non-credit versus credit trainings. Lastly, in conjunction with Hamilton High School and the Bitterroot Polytech Charter, we have combined our efforts to engage the community. A shared advisory board allows us to comprehensively gather input and build programs starting as early as possible. Industries represented on our advisory board include GSK and RML in the biotech industry, the Bitterroot Valley Chamber of Commerce, Hamilton Downtown Association, Bitterroot Early Learning Network, Dick Anderson Construction, the Forest Service, Greater River Valley Foundation, and Farmer State Bank. Thank you for the opportunity to share some updates and initiatives that is happening on our campus in Hamilton. I will stand for any questions. Uh, thank you, Director Berger. Uh, questions, comments from the Regents? Regent Dombrowski. So is there a levy in May? Another? Okay, that's what I thought. So uh, if the levy passes, how is that? how might that change things? Maybe that's way too long of a question, but or big of a question or wild of a question? Yeah, I don't. I heard you <laughs> over here, so no, no one has to say anything. Okay. If the levy doesn't pass, it will be this continued great work. I mean, if I could, Chair Southworth and, and Regent yeah. Nebraska, I mean, our, yeah. our uh, <clears throat> I mean, our job right now is to to serve the, the learning needs of the Bitterroot. What Bitterroot voters decide and, and the, the progress or not of a, of, a, of a Bitterroot Community College is the, the purview of the, the voters, and, and our job is to carry out our mission as best we can right yeah, very, now. Very well stated. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, our agenda for the two-year community college, uh, Chair Dombrowski. Thank you, that was excellent. Really appreciate the time it took and the presentations. I think we can, um, we've learned and continue to learn a lot and really have sort of a call to action on a couple of items in the future. Um, I, I um, am going to muster on, unless I get the sense that anyone wants a break, I think generally at this point in time, mustering on feels like the right, the right thing to do. All right, we're now at public comment. Since this is a public meeting, I will now call for any public comment. Public comment may be offered on items on this meeting's agenda or on any matter, not on the agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the Board of Regents. Written public comment may also be sent to Jasmine Casanovas at jcasanovas at montana.edu. To allow us to give everyone a chance to comment, please limit your comments to three minutes. Is there any in-person public comment? Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Melissa Ramirez and I'm the ASMSU Vice President and also President of the Montana Associated Students this year. 
Um, first, I want to start off with a huge thank you to the University of Montana Western and my colleagues over at ASUMW for hosting us. They've been excellent, excellent hosts, and I felt more than welcomed, and I've fallen in love with Dylan. Um, to come to you today, I just want to kind of give a quick mass update. We met last night um, after the reception alongside a ton of representatives from across the state and our lovely advisor, Christine Miller, and then uh, as well as Regent Jaeger. We had a ton of really, really awesome action items. To start off, we talked about the student regent process and how that's moving along. We have a couple of candidates currently, but to give the governor's office a various slate of students from uh, across various backgrounds, we are looking to, uh, towards the end of April, push that slate along after our process has concluded, but we are on track to have a student regent appointed on time. Um, next, we talked about a very fun project, and we're very excited about it, and that's restructuring of mass. Uh, we will have a ton of more details in the May meeting, but how we're going to go about that is through a bylaw audit. So student leaders from across the state will come together to work on our bylaws and improve them, to make them more readable, to make them more accurate to kind of the needs that we have currently. Um, and then with the help of the Ochi legal team, kind of put those in state at our final meeting for the year. Ultimately, we want to align mass with state initiatives and meeting students where they're at, as well as making it more representative, more accessible, and various students from all backgrounds serving on mass. And we're really excited for what that will look like and also have more long-term goals and uh, less turnover, ultimately. Uh, so we're excited to share what that will look like in the May meeting. But thank you for all that you do for this university system, and thank you for having student leaders here and always hearing what students have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, too, for the great work. Appreciate it. Good morning, Madam Chair, esteemed regents. Um, I'm Maggie Bell. I'm the ASUM president this year, and I'm also the Mass Treasurer. So along the same lines as Melissa just spoke about, last night, Mass also voted to transfer the Mass account from MSU Billings to UM. We're hoping that it will provide the account more stability and continual oversight to live directly under our student government. Um, rather than in business services. For a little bit of context, the account lived at MSUB for a while, um, and the accountant who saw the accounts and worked with Mass pretty closely on overseeing it and getting dues paid retired a year or two ago, and so dues have gone unpaid for the last two years, and the account's in a minor deficit, um, which is part of why we're working on all of this restructuring and just setting the groundwork up, um, ultimately leaving things better than we found it, hopefully. But the goal is to zero that account out, get it moved over to UM where we can have it housed um, more consistently and with a little bit more oversight. And then alongside that, setting up a timeline where dues will be paid by this date and we'll have the due structure set up by this date. So that's going to go in with our bylaws reform, setting up a calendar of events for mass so that there's just that continual structure and no question of what needs to happen when. So just a little update on that front. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Western for hosting, um, especially the ASEMW folks. They had us over for a pasta bar last night and it was amazing and it's so much fun it, to work with all the other student government kids and just across the state, it's just, this has genuinely been such a great meeting and um, I hope it's been the same for you. Thank you for all of your dedicated time and commitment to higher education. And I also would like to take a minute to wish um, Regent Yeager, a happy birthday in Dillon. Uh, <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, first of all, thank you, Maggie, for the update. Appreciate it. Uh, I can't carry a tune, but if someone would like to start, I think it seems appropriate. Thank you, everybody. I thought I was avoiding Chancellor Reed turning me red yesterday, but I guess I was wrong. <laughs> oh, that's really a wonderful way to end public comment. Is there any other public comment? Okay, come on up. <laughs> we didn't end it. That's no worries. Uh, Madam Chair, Board of uh, Members of the Board and Deputy Commissioner, thank you for um, this opportunity to speak. 
My name is Emma Jeske. Um, I'm a junior here at UM Western, and I currently serve on Student Senate. Uh, this is my second Board of Regents meeting. Um, I attended, um, today attending, I heard several discussions and yesterday of accessibility, affordability, and success. With that in mind, I wanted, to, I am compelled to speak about my journey that I had through higher education. Um, I, I graduated um, from high school, uh, Glacier High School in 2020 at the height of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, fortunately for me though, uh, my journey in higher education started sooner than that. Um, my journey began, began in my sophomore year. I joined the summer experience program at um, Flathead Valley Community College. This allowed me to take a three credit class and a college 101 course at no cost to me. This experience helped me get my feet wet in college. Uh, I continued to take college courses during my junior and senior years of high school through the Running Start program. These programs allowed me to access higher education at little cost to me. As a first generation college student, this was a huge benefit. It made college affordable and very accessible to me. College or FECC provided a safe space for me to learn, try new things, join student organizations, and grow as a leader. The small student to faculty ratio granted me a strong relationship with my professors and the ability to dive deeper into the subjects. All of this combined bestowed a sense of belonging and success to me. After graduating from FECC with my associate's degree, I seamlessly transferred to UM Western. I sought a continuation of my education at, at an institution with block scheduling and small class sizes. The faculty and staff have been extremely supportive and I've been able to develop many professional relationships. My experience here has been nothing short of amazing. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the Montana University system for, for providing me with the opportunity to attend a great community college and the ability to seamlessly transfer to the amazing campus of UMW. My higher education journey has been done on excess, has been one of accessibility, affordability, and success. Thank you for the work that you, you do and your time. Also, go Bulldogs. <laughs> Thank you, Emmett. I think that did top happy birthday. Thank you for that. Are there any other public comment? Is there any online public comment? All right, thank you. We are uh, concluded our public comment. Now we're gonna move on to our action items. Okay, so first we have the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee. I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items A through G. So moved. Thank you, Regent Yeager. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Any discussion from the campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes. Okay, moving to our action items from the ARSA committee. I will entertain a motion to approve action item A, honorary doctorate from UM. So moved. Thank you, Regent Lozar. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Any discussion from campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes, and thank you, we heard you, Regent Buchanan. Okay, well, I move to action item B, honorary doctorate from UM Missoula. I will entertain a motion to approve that item. So moved. Thank you, Regent Lozar. Is there any discussion from members of the board? 
Any discussion from campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes. I will entertain a motion to approve action item C, honorary doctorate MSU Bozeman. So moved. Thank you, Regent Bao. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Is there any discussion from campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. I will entertain a motion to approve action item D, honorary doctorate MSU Bozeman. So moved. Thank you, Regent Bao. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Is there any discussion from the campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion on action item D passes. I will entertain a motion to approve action item E, request to plan proposals. So moved. Thank you, Regent Yeager. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Any discussion from campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. All right. Um, Go to the, the items for the budget committee. I would like to entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items from the budget committee A through G. So moved. Thank you, Regent Southworth. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Any discussion from campuses? <coughs> any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes. All right, now on to the action items. Action item A, request for authorization to construct main campus parking UM. I will entertain a motion to approve that item. So moved. Thank you, Regent Yeager. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Any discussion from campuses? Any public comment? <coughs> Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion <coughs> passes. I will entertain a motion to approve action item B, request for authorization to plan and design the Clatt Building renovations at UM. So moved. Thank you, Regent Bao. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Any discussion from campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes. I will entertain a motion to approve item C, request for authorization to plan and design the Flathead Lake Biologic Station water and sewer systems at UM. So moved. Thank you, Regent Lozar. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Is there any discussion from campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. I will entertain a motion to approve action item D, request for authorization to construct campus storage building at UM. So moved. Thank you, Regent Yeager. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Any discussion from campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. I will entertain a motion to approve action item A, request for authorization to design the renovations of Main Hall at Montana Tech. So moved. Thank you, Regent Bow. Is there any discussion from the members of the board? Any discussion from campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes. I will entertain a motion to approve action item F, request for authorization to design the renovations of Engineering Hall at Montana Tech. So moved. Thank you, Regent Southworth. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Is there any discussion from campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. I will entertain a motion to approve action item G, request for authorization to design infrastructure improvements, safety improvements, and research facilities, MSU Agri Agricultural Experiment Station. So moved. Thanks, Regent Lozar. Is there any discussion from members of the board? Discussion from the campuses? or any public comment. Seeing no comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. And finally, I will entertain a motion to approve action item H, request for authorization to design the Agricultural Research Labs, MSU Agricultural Experiment Station. So moved. Thank you, Regent Yeager. Is there any discussion from members of the board? From the campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes. All right, so on behalf of the Board of Regents, I will adjourn We have one meeting. more. I do? Uh, oh, I do. Look, I was trying to get it done mm -hmm. quickly. <laughs> Good job. This is a, Jackie Treaster, sorry. <laughs> I'll, give you my, I'll give you my personal apology. This is on it. All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve action item A, a very important action item from our committee this morning, request for approval for Perkins 5 state plan. So moved. Thank you, Regent Southworth. Is there any discussion from members of the board other than please accept my apology? Is there any discussion from campuses? Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. All right, now I think I'm done mm -hmm. with the action items. Um, any comments from the board? And I would just express again our appreciation, Chancellor Reed, for the wonderful hospitality and acknowledge all the work that goes into this. Uh, it, was, it was certainly very great to be here. Regent Christian? Awesome. All right, with Thanks, that, everyone. we stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Thanks,